curve um, of uh, 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 becoming an interstellar civilization. Something I think is very exciting, um, commercialization of space, mining of the asteroids. Um, so the session chairs for today, as yesterday, we're going to have uh, two session chairs, one for the morning uh, and one for the afternoon. Um, Dr. Gerald Cleaver, who was my PhD supervisor um, from Baylor University, um, and Dr. Donna Dulo is going to be the uh, afternoon uh, session chair. Uh, we've got uh, three uh, incredibly accomplished keynote speakers. Um, they're going to be introduced more formally um, by the appropriate chairs, but we've got Dr. Uh, Michael, uh, 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 Michael Minovich, um, who I was thrilled to meet for the first time last year. I flew out to um, Los Angeles. Uh, we had a wonderful evening. I had a, a good dinner. Uh, Doctor, uh, uh, we had a, a good Chinese uh, dinner, talked talk till late. Uh, Dr. Winneberg, uh, who's responsible for the uh, Daedalus uh, engine, the fusion engine. He was the, the mastermind, the architect behind that, am among many other things. And uh, uh, Mr. Kelvin Long, who's um, um, uh, director of the I4IS, Institute for Interstellar Studies. Um, he was also a co-founder of Project Icarus, uh, a former director um, of Icarus Interstellar. Um, he's, he's, he's written a book. He's He's just finished his second uh, uh, editor of a second book. So very well accomplished um, uh, man. Um, the evening event, we oh, and we're also going to have the uh, uh, general assembly uh, day two. Uh, so we had that yesterday for an hour and a half. We're going to continue with that today. Um, in the evening, um, we have two incredibly uh, in talented, uh, talented ladies, Dr. Rachel Armstrong, who's going to be talking a little bit about the uh, Black Sky Thinking Prize that I t uh, talked briefly about yesterday, and Dr. Uh, Sarah Jane Pell, who's uh, engaged in some incredibly fascinating work. Her work intersects uh, science research um, and the performing arts. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to uh, Dr. Jerry Cleaver, who's going to be our session chair for the morning. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. Well, today's a very special day for me, and it's an important one, because you're about to hear a presentation from my good friend, Dr. Michael Minovich, that will go against many of the things that you have been taught, heard, and seen. In 1959, Arthur C. Clarke, in his book, The Challenge of the Spaceship, said, we will have spaceships which can t attain speeds of about 10 miles a second. The moon will be reached in two to three days and nearer planets in about a half a year. Remote planets such as Jupiter, Saturn, after many years of travel. And so the trio, Moon, Mars, Venus, marks the practical limits of exploration of chemically prepared, propelled spaceships. That was then, and this is now. The reason any and all of our solar system is able to be explored by any space program in the world is a result of Dr. Michael Minovich's 1961 invention of gravity-propelled interplanetary space travel, commonly known as gravity assist trajectories. Today, you will be introduced to a disruptive innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michael Minovich. Got to get the technical stuff working here, right? Here, I'm going to say hello, testing, one, two, three, four. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction, Bill. I'm not a professional speaker. I like to do research alone. But um, I'm excited about this particular problem, and I will very briefly describe how I became involved in this very hard problem. I don't tackle problems that's easy. I tackle them when they're viewed as impossible problems. That's where I get my enjoyment. It's a challenge. Now, what I want to say as to how I became involved in this, I got a phone call about, oh, 
two years ago, one and a half years ago, from my friend Bill, who was staying at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, and he asked me to meet with him in the morning the next day, and I did, and we went and we had some French toast. <laughs> it was very enjoyable. And then he, he made a proposal to me, which was right out of the blue. He said, I have essentially read a lot of your published papers in JBIS, and I'm involved in a, an organization called Stellar Inter uh, Icarus Interstellar, and I believe out of all the people in the world, you are the one <clears throat> that will make this a realizable vehicle. And of course, I was flattered when he said that. Uh, and I didn't want to embarrass myself by saying, I can't really improve what the professionals that have been working on this problem for 50 years uh, have concluded. But like I said, it was an interesting problem. And I decided to put my teeth in it or throw my two cents published papers in JBI. After I, and then I agreed <laughs> reluctantly, yes, I will accept this assignment. So I started to read the literature. And I came across a paper by Buzzard published in 1960 called Fusion, a fusion ramjet. I th forgot the title, but it's uh, involving a, a vehicle. Well, first he devoted quite a bit of the beginning of the paper showing analytically that uh, using traditional reaction propulsion with uh, onboard stored propellant, um, driving that basic concept to maybe 0.1 C, or one point, uh, 0.1 U, which is the um, ratio of the vehicle velocity divided by the velocity of light, is a practical impossibility. So he said that, not me. But he was the expert in the field, and all the people after him essentially said the same thing. Because if you don't go above like 0.5 or something like that, the, flight, the trip times are the round trip, trip, time, trip times to manned vehicles uh, become excessive. And of course, you add a, a certain percentage of that time to, to the total time to the uh, time on Earth. So as the vehicle is moving at very high velocity, uh, the time on Earth is passing faster. So uh, it's, a, it's a mathematical impossibility. Uh, you use the equations that are well known. That's the reality of the thing. So um, when I said I would um, indulge in this problem, I was really taking on a hard problem. When I, when I solved or when I got into the, um, the 1961 work, I, I really was going up against a harder problem. It was called the three-body problem of celestial mechanics. Uh, but I, I was hiding that work from my supervisor, so he never really knew I was working on that and not a, on his assignment. Now, let me get into the, with that uh, prefix, let me get into the, um, the meat of this here paper. I'm going to just skip the first part of this because it's just a rehash of the well-known problems of uh, celestial uh, relativistic mechanics. Uh, this table is just uh, to show you that the trip times for um, um, point 0.3 C, that's pretty high, uh, conventional reaction propulsion, nuclear uh, energy, or nuclear uh, propulsion system is not going to make it because you've got um, the, one of the most closest sun-like stars at a distance of 20 astron um, light years. So that's um, a, a fair, that's, if that's the closest star, it's going to take um, 127 years on board the vehicle. And uh, when you get back to Earth, it's 133 years. So that's um, unrealistic. Uh, these are the first 20 years, uh, 20 stars closest to the sun with a maximum distance of 20 light years. So I can make my conclusion here that this is not going to work. 
Now, we would like it to work, but it won't work. Uh, so the only possible alternative is to, is to revolutionize the basic uh, concept of vehicle propulsion. Now, when Buzzard wrote his paper, he said, uh, I'm not going to argue with the, with the mathematics, and I do essentially agree that we've got to introduce another concept. And he, that was the preface of his 1960 paper. And he introduced his solution by making an, drawing an analogy between uh, conventional ramjets uh, through Earth's atmosphere and um, interstellar, natural interstellar gas clouds ionized. Well, that won't work too well either because the um, Earth-type stars or the sun-like stars are, don't have the luminosity to ionize the gas cloud you're traversing. So right off the bat, uh, he's not even discussing that problem. But anyway, he had the vision to identify a solution, a real elegant solution that is one of the most beautiful concepts I have ever came across in, in flight. So this is really not my paper, it's Buzzard's paper. But what I'm doing is when he was advised by analytical observations, not analytical, um, astronomical observations of uh, novas and gas clouds, uh, he was informed that the real density of gas clouds is not a thousand atoms per cubic, centi uh, per, per cubic centimeter, but one. And that essentially, uh, he, when he made the analysis, he found that based on a thousand atoms per cubic centimeter, the diameter of his inlet scoop right here, um, the diameter of this, either electrostatic or magnetic, had to be 120 kilometers. That's based on a thousand uh, particles per cubic centimeter. Now, when you use the real density, and that's one, then you have to multiply uh, 120 kilometers by uh, the square root of 1,000 to get to the real density. To use this concept with the real density and keep the same acceleration. When he described this concept, he knew it would take um, a matter of years for the crew. So you have to have a, an environment for the habitat of an, an Earth-like environment of 1G. So that's why he, uh, cons he used as the basis of the uh, acceleration of the vehicle 1G. So we had that as the ground rules. Unfortunately, this 1,000 um, particles per cubic centimeter would not work because it, it wasn't the fact that it wasn't the density of the real gas cloud. And when it went down to uh, one atom per cubic centimeter, uh, it essentially, because of other uh, considerations, made this concept fundamentally impossible. With that, when he made the preface, there's no other way to do it. Essentially, when this became impossible, the only other way is antimatter or warping space, or space drives, you know, very exotic concepts, which uh, I don't believe is going to work too well. But anyway, uh, that's the alternative. So I got my teeth in Bussard's concept and focused on what can be done to make the Bussard concept a realizable concept. So the first thing I did was to translate Buzzard's concept into a mathematical equation. And that mathematical equation, um, well, this is the viral theorem. The viral theorem is very, very important because it gives the minimum mass of a dipole that has a tensile strength of sigma and a density rho. And this is extremely important because uh, most high field superconductors have very low tensile strength and very high density. So 
uh, it's another very serious problem in realizing the um, interstellar ramjet. Now, the self-inductance of a dipole coil, L here, as I describe it mathematically, is this. And when you do the 1 1 half um, L I square, I is the current density, you get the self-inductance energy, the inductive, inductive energy of a uh, coil. This uh, formula up here, the um, viral theorem, is based on a self-supporting dipole coil. Now, there's another engineer, very uh, powerful, very elementary, basic uh, uh, phenomena that occurs when you charge a dipole, and that is called hoop stress. There's two components of the total stress. The hoop stress is what will pull the dipole apart. If you have a, a self-sustaining, um, self-supporting dipole, if you've got uh, over a kilometer in diameter, the hoop stress becomes enormous. Now that means the diameter of the, of the coil, not the uh, coil, but the, the radius of the, um, the, the coil, of the, the, um, the conductor has to be very large. And when it's large, when it's a kilometer in diameter, we're talking 100 kilometers in diameter, the mass becomes unrealizable. And of course, that is just the mass of the coil, one coil system, and we need more than one. And now, this other equation is very important because it describes the, uh, the uh, relationship between the inductive energy and the, uh, the density and um, tensile strength. Uh, and so if you plug in the fact that the density is high and the tensile strength is low, you get this factor 10 to the minus 4 in front of the uh, inductive uh, term. And that is the basic minimum mass of, bul of, of Bussard's um, first dipole coil. Electrically uh, scooping it will not work too well. So it's all based on magnetic dipoles. And what I did after thinking about this and getting ready to call my friend Bill on a phone and throwing in the towel, I made one last attempt to look at this uh, viral theorem and how to support a dipole coil uh, without violating the basic laws of physics and decided, well, maybe uh, it can be done by separating the, the, the rho term from the sigma term. The sigma is the uh, tensile strength and the rho is the density. How can that be separated? Well, the way I came up with separating these two important terms that are supposed to describe the superconductor is by uh, designing the, the dipole as composing two components. The first component is the superconductor itself, and the second component is a flexible, inflatable tube. A small diameter, small radius tube, and in the middle of that tube is the dipole coil, the conductor, the superconductor. So the rho uh, and the sigma is is completely wiped out by the the matter that is uh, supporting the tensile strength and the hoop strength, the compressive uh, strength. Well, no, the compressive force of the superconductor is supported by the superconductor, but the tensile strength, the hoop stress, is supported by the, the hoop, by the, um, the tube, the inner tube. And another beautiful thing about this is you can, you can mount this tube inflate, deflated in the form of a roll that is very similar to what you find in electric power plants. So to transport um, a two a hundred uh, or a 50 kilometer diameter or a radius superconducting dipole into Earth orbit, you mount it, you roll it up on a tube, and you put it in a, the cargo bay of an Earth shuttle type vehicle and just bring it up. So that's how you can construct this enormous uh, vehicle in a, a very simple way, very direct way, uh, with, of course, a low, a small amount of money, relative speaking. This is the cross-section of the inflatable dipole coil. This outer circle is the tube, 
The inner circle represents the conductor, and this is a, I think I have a longitudinal, yeah, there's the longitudinal um, illustration. Now, here's where I get into the mathematics. I wanted to, uh, in order to factor in this new innovation into the, the basic mathematical foundation of the um, fusion ramjet, I had to develop an equation that gives the um, uh, acceleration of any uh, fusion ramjet uh, in terms of the uh, mass of the vehicle, uh, the density of the cloud it's passing through, and the effective radius of the, super, of the, um, the first dipole coil. I call that uh, R E F F, the effective radius. And when I put it together, I get this equation right here. So this here is a general equation for all uh, superconducting dipole ramjet vehicles. And uh, you can take the, uh, the sub Bs are referring to buzzards uh, um, parameters. Now, uh, I must um, emphasize this very important fact. I am not a nuclear physicist or an engineer, but when Buzzard put this idea together, he was. So he knows a lot about fusion energy, a lot about the physics of this concept. So what I did was I based this factor beta, that is the interpretation of those um, buzzard uh, components there, um, unchanged. So if Buzzard was wrong, then I'm wrong. If he was right, theoretically, when he did the physics, then I'm right. And I want to emphasize that because the numbers that I'm going to present to this audience might be very shocking and um, more um, familiar in um, science fiction shows like Star Trek or something like that. Now I'm getting into the basic acceleration formulas for relativistic flight. There's a U term, and, and here's the acceleration. So um, in order to find out, well, what is the acceleration of this uh, application of the new, or the use of the new low um, mass dipole? So when I plug in the figures, I get a, uh, oh, let me backtrack. It's very important to also make the observation when Buzzard presented his paper, he presented it by uh, abstractly assuming that the diameter of the front of the vehicle, the, the, either the dipole or the um, electric uh, scoop phenomena, represented the diameter of the gas cloud being in, scooped up. Uh, what uh, is very important is the effect of the uh, magnetic field on the scooping process. And when you, in fact, you, you have to put down the equations of representing a dipole and the fact that, um, and if the dipole is at a, if, a, if you have a point relative to the center of the dipole that's sufficiently far away from the center of that point, uh, which is called R in these equations, from the radius of the dipole, which is R sub D, then these are the equations that represent the magnetic field uh, very far from the actual physical dipole. And this is the equation that gives you the uh, magnetic acceleration of, a, of the incoming ion, which is a proton. Um, and this is the cross product, the vector cross product. Now here is the picture or an illustration of the B vector and the hoop, and this is the, the way I did this analysis was I kept the vehicle, the hoop uh, constant, uh, non-moving, and the particles are coming in here at the vehicle velocity, so they're coming in uh, parallel to the x-axis, and at the b, -ax b vector is 
uh, has an um, angle relative to the x-axis less than 90 degrees, all the gas that comes in up here will be captured eventually. It goes into a spiral, but it, it, with increasing magnetic field, that spiral gets uh, smaller and smaller radii and eventually gets, it goes past through the front dipole. That's the mechanics, the electrodynamics of this uh, system. And uh, the, the other important factor is the radius or the, uh, the curve that represents the, uh, the equality between the ambient magnetic field of the galactic region and the magnetic field generated by the coil itself. And that I call C, this curve represents that boundary. All incoming ions that are above the curve do not experience the magnetic field of the dipole. So it has a magnetic field weaker than the ambient magnetic field, so the, the ions just keep coming through. Now if the ion is a little bit, if, if it intersects the top of this curve here, it will be accelerated by the magnetic field, which, is, which has an angle relative to the x-axis greater than 90 degrees. And if you do that um, vector uh, cross product, the effect is to throw the particle away from the x-axis, so it will not be ingested. So if, now if you do the mathematics, you'll find that this angle here, uh, theta c, is six, about 63 degrees. So that, so if, it, if a proton comes in and hits the peak of this curve right up here, then it will be ingested. If it goes a little bit higher, it won't be ingested. So this is the effective radius of the first dipole. Now let's get back to this table. This is the physical radius of the, of the dipole, whatever the, these, these numbers are, and this turns out to be the effective radius. Well, notice it's a factor of 20. So when you factor in this, these numbers, you're getting real happy because you think, by golly, with that effective, uh, uh, those effective numbers plugged into the acceleration equation, you're getting not 0 .0001 acceleration, well, you're gonna get uh, a factor 20 times higher than what you might expect. So you get, when you're doing the research, if you're, um, if you like these numbers, if you're a number cruncher person, I'm really not, I'm a theoretical person, uh, but I know what these numbers mean because I know what that equation is. You get kind of excited. So I thought that perhaps I'm coming into a breakthrough innovation. And in my conversations with Bill, he was kind of like saying, well, what are you, what are, what, you've been working on it for two months, you know, what are your numbers? And I said, no, Bill, I want to be very, exact in my numbers, and I prefer not to disclose what this represents, what effect this, these numbers have. And, of course, I kept the, the two-component dipole very secret because that's a patentable concept, and I'd like to get the, um, the original patent on that. Now, anyway, coming back or going further here, here's a diagram of the B vector. This is at that interception point when the angle is 63 degrees. That angle here is about 63 degrees. So uh, all of the particles coming in here below P and above the x-axis are, are, are gonna be ingested into the first dipole. But it's gonna be taking more than one dipole to get it to the fusion reactor, and it's gotta be an interface with an electric generator because you gotta have generate quite a bit of power to ionize the incoming or the gas, gas cloud so that it will be uh, ingested into the uh, dipole situation. Now, another thing that has to be very important is the li living conditions of the crew. And the crew might be 50 uh, human beings um, and, and they're going to be enclosed in this vehicle for two, three, four, five, maybe 20 people are talking uh, 100 years, so uh, you gotta provide um, a living quarters that's enjoyable. <laughs> and that, again, I'm not looking at this 2001 Space Odyssey 
uh, solution where you go into hibernation, into coffin-like things, and uh, that's not uh, the way I'm looking at it. I want a, uh, a happy crew that's in uh, playing uh, games and reading uh, books in a library. Now, here's the rotation. Oh, so we're looking at now a toroidal living quarters. Uh, now, when you're looking at a, a toroidal enclosed pressurized tube, um, you have, um, if the radius of the rotation is not sufficiently large, you get side effects called Coriolis forces. And those can be just as uh, sickening to the uh, inhabitants as uh, weightless condition. So it, I designed the, um, the habitat to have a radius of 100 meters. And when you do the math here, the circumference, it comes out to 0.4 miles. So we've got uh, quite a bit of uh, circumference there to deal with. And I s divided that up into 36 pressurized compartments where you've got libraries, vegetable gardens, swimming pools. You've got the whole nine yards that you would find in a nice um, hotel like this on a smaller scale. So that's the way I envision the crew of the Starship to um, live. Now these uh, spokes are spoke cylinders, pressurized, that give crew access to the actual reactor. Now I'm not um, familiar with the radioactive uh, particles or emissions of an onboard reactor, but this is fusion, it's not a fission reactor, so I think the danger of a radioactivity is smaller. I, I haven't really gone into the physics of the of a powerful reactor, uh, but anyway, this is another habitat down here. It's connected to the to these spoke cylinders, and that is connected to the rim of the actual torus. So, uh, without go, go getting into a pressure shoot, suit, you can maneuver yourself. And this is all now one G. So you're living one G, and the down the down floor is uh, radially away. Your head is facing towards the hub of the cylinder. Anyway, if uh, you have problems, <coughs> mechanical problems with anything, you will have direct access. Now, this is not to scale because this is only the ending part of the solenoid. No, it's not solenoid, but dipole coils. This is a frame of the structure, and uh, the material that I use to construct this is a pure fused silica glass uh, whiskers that have very high tensile strength and very low density. So this is like a spider web. Also, um, because the velocity is going to be so high, and I'll present the uh, graphs to show you, you might go through a gas cloud fairly rapidly. That might change the acceleration and flex the thing, the whole structure here. So all of these connections and the connections themselves uh, spa at spacing are all mounted on movable um, solenoidal control um, actuators. And it's all, sen there's sensors, uh, inertial sensors mounted everywhere. So that if you have any change in acceleration, just the slightest change, um, it goes through a computer and it adjusts the, uh, uh, all of these actuators that needs to be adjust adjusted to keep this thing in a pr proper alignment because the, the forces uh, with, a, with a high acceleration, I'm gonna keep that acceleration secret right now, but it's gonna be um, parallel to the structure here. So we got compressive loads under uh, deceleration and um, um, uh, tension loads under acceleration. Uh, no, just to reverse. Anyway, this is what a torus looks like, and uh, I envision this being constructed also because I'm looking at a practical vehicle. This is not a thing that uh, will have to be studied for 100 years. Um, matter of fact, you can write your proposal to NASA and get a NASA contract to start work on this. I'd love to do that, but I just don't have the time. So we, in, we bring in orbit in a collapsed form, a flexible like, inner tube-like, and then we mount a wrapping wheel around that, and that will be the device that actually constructs 
a 100 meter or 200 meter diameter, beautiful torus, pressurized with everything. That's the longitudinal view, schematic diagram. This is the uh, transverse view. These are the um, rolls of Kevlar and aluminum that are brought up by, by and I'll just say, we've got the shuttle here working with the construction of this vehicle. So if that can be taken out of mothballs, you can construct the whole vehicle with a shuttle type vehicle, the whole uh, ramjet with a shuttle type vehicle. Now this other picture, longitudinal view down below, is a um, longitudinal view. This is a leading dipole. The diameter here is 100 kilometers, radius of 50, but this, this uh, scoop, the scoop is 25 times this diameter. So now we're able to scoop up quite a bit of ions. And the actual um, uh, ionization, um, optical uh, frequency laser is mounted on the first cycle. There's a platform <coughs> just a few centimeters above that. And that is where the uh, ionization transmitter is located. And now if you go to the apex of this, you'll find small little things like dots. Those things represent the torus, the crew quarters, the fusion engine, and the uh, MHD electric uh, magnetic uh, generator, electric generator, and the uh, identification. Oh, before I forget, there's a table out there that has this report. It's 90 pages long. Uh, but it describes uh, all of these figures, and there's, it's in two formats. There's one, the hard copy, and a uh, CD. So uh, please, if you're going to take something, either take the hard copy or the CD. Don't take both. So uh, there's 50 of each, so you should be able to uh, have enough uh, to look at. <coughs> Excuse me. And all the mathematics and the equations and the technical stuff is in the report. This is a picture of one dipole, I mean one ion being scooped up, and it shows you that it's not going to be scooped up like water coming in. It's going to be scooped up in spiral. So as the spiral gets closer and closer, as it passes through the first dipole, the di that passing through the center is where the, the magnetic field is greatest. But there's a dipole up here that uh, has parallel almost parallel to the x-axis, it's a coaxially mounted collection of dipoles, smaller and smaller diameters, so uh, giving a smaller, a, a greater and greater intensity of the magnetic field. So this effect is how this plasma is going to be compressed with, through 31 di uh, coaxially mounted dipole coils. And if we come down here, this is another new innovation. And I didn't want to tell Bill Kress how I designed the fusion reactor. But if you're looking at a fusion reactor here that is not out of Star Trek. It's a pre-computed, pre-designed based on hard mathematics. It's a solenoid, um, a tapered solenoid. doesn't exist in the literature. I had to develop the formulas. It gives the magnetic field at any point along the x-axis uh, to be able to compute the density the, uh, of how this, the incoming uh, plasma is, is being compressed. Because there's one thing about a PP fusion phenomenon, different from a, a TP, B, a TB, no, a TD and a TT and a B, that DD and all of the other fusion is that the required um, plasma density to achieve a PP is like three orders of magnitude greater than the other types. So uh, we have to have uh, the, the, um, the proper plasma density. Now I design this, ordinarily if you look at the literature talking about fusion, the plasma density is 10 to the 20 particles per cubic meter. Well, I want to present my paper, because it's based on PP, with a particle density of 1,000 times greater. So we're looking at a particle density here of 10 to the 23. Now you might say, oh, it won't work. You need 10 to the 24. Well, you just increase this 
This that's here by a half a centimeter, and you got 10 to the 24. You want 10 to the 25? Just go out a, a, mil a millimeter further, so you get all these fantastically high plasma densities that's not even discussed in the literature. Now, how do you provide the ignition temperature? Because it's got to be very high. What I did is I, I, I based this on the sun, so I know what the sun is. And so um, uh, anyway, now the next question is, after you get through with that, is uh, how do you decelerate the vehicle? You're already going pretty fast. So uh, you decelerate it by uh, making it uh, detachable, the, making the accelerating uh, reactor detachable from the income from, now there's a MHD uh, reactor uh, generator, electric generator up here. So you separate the electric generator from this, uh, the accelerating part, and then you mount, physically mount, so it's not automated, you don't push a button, you have to go in there like a mechanic and take apart the actual fusion reactor, and then you install a, 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 a beam splitter, and they're going out in two oppositely uh, separate parts, and then you attach new reactors on each one, and this angle is 48 degrees, so you don't encounter the um, structure of the uh, dipole coil. So the vehicle is moving this way, and you're going against the, the uh, velocity of the, the uh, of the vehicle velocity vector, so you're thrusting against that, that's how you generate your deceleration. So it's all really very simple, it's like a Tinker Toy set. This is a diagram of the decelerating thrust vector you got on each side, then you do the result and then you get close to the original. Now if you can't get um, close to the original, you just solve that problem by accelerating uh, before you reach the halfway point. And then after you reach that, point what's before the halfway point, you s stop the power going to the ionization uh, transmitters and just manually install the decelerating reactors. And now you can calculate the mass breakout of all these components and you'll find after you add 10% uh, total, 60, um, uh, 658,500 kilometers. Uh, kilograms, that's total vehicle mass. And now we're at a very important point because we can feed in these numbers into the acceleration equation and for the first time calculate what the real acceleration of this vehicle is. Here's the formula we use right there. There's the beta constant and you su substitute these numbers, three numbers in here. Effective radius, the vehicle mass, and the particle density, one atom per cubic centimeter. So we're looking at realistic gas clouds, and the acceleration is 0.7 g's. With 0.7 g's on this type of vehicle, you can explore the entire universe. And that's not Star Trek, that's, that's arithmetic. <laughs> uh, but of course, we're not interested in going out of the galaxy right now. We've got to concentrate on realistic targets. And this first graph, graph is a, um, a graph of, um, of vehicle velocity versus vehicle trip time. So the first year, you're going at, um, at a velocity of about 0.4. The second year, you're at 0.5. And then you start at the shape of this curve. It doesn't take long before you get up very close to the velocity of light. And that's why I entitled this paper um, the possibility of getting very close to the velocity of light because that's exactly what I intended to do. And I kept all this secret from Bill. He didn't know. And I was getting very excited giving him some hints as to what the, the capability of this vehicle is, uh, not mentioning intergalactic, intergalactic space travel at all. But anyway, just keeping it simple to uh, ex exploration region within 20 light years of the Earth. You got a few stars in that. Now this table is a breakout of the time. This is vehicle time and Earth time. And I want to get down to uh, Alpha Centauri. I miss, probably don't have it on that. Uh oh, I went through this table. Oh, there it is, Alpha Centauri, uh, right there. And that trip time 
of vehicle years, well, right down here, is 8.8 .8 years. So you want to go to Alpha Centauri? Well, it's less than the Voyager trip time. So we're looking at very low, reasonable numbers. And this is round trip. It's not just one way trip time. This is round trip. And this is the Earth time corresponding to the 8.3 um, years. No, 8.8 .8 years. It's 13 years for the Earth crew. And that's so, totally realistic. And if you want to go 20, uh, to visit um, 82 Etron star, that's uh, the most similar star uh, to the sun, but then that um, um, is going to take uh, 15 years with a total Earth time of 45. So uh, those, are, those numbers are quite realistic for um, becoming very serious about interstellar space travel. Now, because the velocity is so high, you can go very deep into exploration of the Milky Way. And this is a list of the Milky Way uh, targets and the trip time. And you see that the trip times are very reasonable. At 14 years, you can go out to uh, 25,000 um, light years. And of course, um, that's a, a fair amount of uh, travel time, and you can go to the center of the universe in uh, 32 years. Uh, however, the Earth time, if you want to turn the vehicle around and come back to Earth, it will be many, many hundreds of thousands of years in the future. Now, what does this mean? It means the vehicle is a time machine. So if you, do, if you want to use the vehicle as a time machine, then you just find a, a nebula close to the Earth and start a circular trajectory where you accelerate to the halfway point and then you decelerate uh, after the halfway point. So you come back to Earth at zero velocity. You have a little module to get back on the Earth's surface. And the, the amount of uh, time travel is this delta V. So for the first one there, 54 years, the vehicle trip time, total trip time is 10 years. But that will, when you return to Earth, you're 54 years into the future. Now, if you want to go deep, uh, many years in the future, you can find a nice nova or gas cloud, <coughs> excuse me, that has a uh, radius of uh, 10,000 as the light years. And uh, remember, the diameter of the Milky Way is like 50,000 light years. I think it is something like that. Uh, also, you can visit a Andromeda. All of these things are now doable. Uh, now, the last column here is the velocity of light. So when you this 54-year um, delta t, uh, it, you're going at uh, the maximum velocity is 0.999, uh, 1040. You could check this with your computer. All these numbers are based on the actual equations that represent this uh, situation. And this one down here has four nines. You got 0.999999 times. And that's the maximum velocity. Of course, that's at the halfway point, and you've got to decelerate. Now, what are my conclusion, concluding remarks here to terminate this introduction? Interstellar space travel is possible. It is technically possible. It's not a 100-year thing. It's not even a 50-year thing. With this kind of starting point, you can you get a NASA contract, and I'll try to help you get a NASA contract if I can. But this paper may be of interest to the NASA people in getting a NASA contract, serious one, not something that's based on some warp drive or anything like that, not that I'm putting it down. That has to be done, investigated seriously. Um, so also, um, I want to dedicate this paper. I have a dedication paragraph, and like I said, these, the hard copy and the the, um, the, the CD is on the table back there. I dedicate this paper to President John F. Kennedy that affected the history of interplanetary space travel by implementing my invention of gravity propulsion. And that's, uh, I hopefully ended the presentation within my <laughs> allotted time. So I'll answer questions if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Benavides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh,
Rabinovich. We have about three minutes for questions, so let's make the questions short, Q&A, and then we can get a couple in. Yes. Yes, would you like to give your name? Hello? Yeah, here. My name is Winter, I'm sorry, Winterberg, University of Nevada. The problem, I'm a physics professor, is the proton-proton reaction has a cross-section. Oh, we're going to shut this off. 20 orders of magnitude smaller than for deuterium tritium. Now, the only way it could might work is if you have only not scooping up hydrogen, but also boron. There's a reaction between boron and hydrogen. But, uh, Professor, I didn't really uh, get your entire comment. Could you repeat it with the microphone, please? I'm sure we could do that, and that would be a NASA contract. But then you need, of course, you must scoop up boron as much as you must scoop up hydrogen. Otherwise, it, no, it won't work. Well, we have to key this whole thing to what is available in the gas cloud. I'm getting support from uh, Dr. Benford. Who is a Pardon me? Okay, you agree with me? I mean, proton, proton doesn't work. You see? He agrees with me. Proton, proton, the cross-section is 20 orders, it goes over what we call weak interaction. It's 20 orders of magnitude smaller than for the strong interaction, which goes typically with a bound or 10 to the minus 24 square centimeter. Such reaction, boron, boron, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen, or proton, proton, goes with a typical cross-section of 10 to the minus 44 square centimeter, like in the sun. Otherwise, the sun would explode if it would go over the strong interaction. So sure you speak in direction, you must wait a billion years before you get energy out, this typically. Like a good discussion, but I think we need to yeah, cut okay. this one and continue your discussion afterwards here. Let's go on to the next question. Thank you. Yeah, but that's a very important point. I think that should be considered, uh, and, and I don't really have the technical background to answer the detail on that question. Uh, there was a very important paper in 1968 by uh, John Ford Fishback that was published in Astronautica Acta. And it, he was one of uh, Philip Morrison's students, and what he showed was that uh, the Bussard ram that general magnetic fields have to support a, a tremendous amount of stress before they break, and so they stress. are material limited. Right. So they are gamma limited. That so, was the showstopper of that whole concept. Hoop yeah. stress. Well, at least you can achieve good gammas, but uh, I've got to say that that problem still needs to be revisited. Exactly, sure. It does. All of these, uh, uh, this whole area uh, requires a very serious uh, uh, investigation. But that's going to be done by NASA contracts. It's not going to be done by an amateur like me. And with that, we're going to need to give Dr. Minovich a final round of applause. Thank you very much. The next speaker on the schedule is Dr. Jason Castlebury. However, he was not able to come uh, today. So in his place, Dr. Joe Ritter will be speaking. Dr. Joe Ritter is from the Maui Institute for Astronomy and Icarus Interstellar. And we're uh, having to load uh, his uh, uh, talk right now. Uh, Dr. Ritter will be speaking on how to perform image, imaging of exoplanets at one million times current resolution. And it'll take a couple of minutes as we're setting up.
Gee, I could use a coffee break, too. Good morning. I'm Joe Ritter. I'm from the University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, today's a, a holiday in Hawaii, and there's nowhere I'd rather be spending my vacation than, than with all of you. I'm going to give you a very quick background on remote sensing as applied to interstellar travel and destinations without feedback. Can you hear me now? Great. I'm going to try to convince you we have the technology right now or in the very near future to perform nano arc second imaging. You'll uh, either think it's one of those science fiction talks, or, or I was up too late last night making this talk. And I'll start once we have the feedback in con under control here. Are we good? Great, thank you. Okay, I'll start. So, why should we study exoplanets? Why do you care about imaging if you want to build starships? Uh, as Dr. Winterberg told me the other day, and as, as Kelvin tells me every time I see him, we need to know where we're going. Think of a blind man reaching around. So exoplanets also, uh, from my perspective, are interesting because they tell us about our own solar system. Uh, life might be found on exoplanets, and I'm working with a couple of teams who are actively trying to do that. Uh, there is good basic science and understanding our origins, and then, of course, we'd like to know what a destination is for a starship. Currently, stars are not resolved. We're talking about going to a planet, and we can't even resolve a star. They're less than a single pixel. Here is a, a model from a, a two-meter telescope, and I had a, a picture I was going to show you with just a single pixel, but it's not very entertaining. We uh, uh, have uh, uh, many telescopes out in Maui. We have one that has a, a small uh, pixel size like this. It's a two meter telescope, it's not that small. And a star is not even this big. This is uh, uh, from diffraction limits and, and things like that from telescopes. And the orbit at 1 AU around a star like this, this is a typical M star at 10 light years, uh, is still within a pixel. It might cross over to another pixel. So we can't even come close to resolving the things where we want to go. We have a long way to go just in remote sensing. So first, a, a brief survey of the current technology and some near future technology before I tell you what the next generation will be like. Uh, I won't go into this in detail. All of you, can, can we do something about the feedback? Maybe I'll move this. There's always technical difficulty when you build instruments, and I, I guess talks are the same way. Uh, so all of you are familiar with Kepler. I won't go into the details, but it's been just a huge boon to our community and awareness uh, on, on what exoplanets are out there. I'm just going to do one view graph here. Uh, Kepler 47, a double star system containing multiple planets, one of which is in this Goldilocks zone. I'm sure all of you have heard about these. Uh, brief history of other things. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope. It's still, maybe we could turn it down. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is still state of the art right now in space. A little history on that. It's not a very big telescope. It has a, a 7.9, it's a 2.4 meter diameter mirror. So it's not very big. It's, it's basically from me to Jerry. Uh, there's perhaps uh, the JWST telescope. Uh, when I worked on it at NASA, it was supposedly a $500 million mission, including launch. Now it's uh, possibly $9 billion. Um, uh, I, I'm not saying we don't have money for great projects like this, but, uh, well, you can draw your own conclusions. And its resolution at one micron uh, is uh, a little under a tenth of an, or about a tenth of an arc second. 
So there are fundamental limits to imaging. The resolution of optical systems goes inversely proportionally with the diameter of a telescope. Uh, so you want wide telescopes, or at least long baselines. Uh, where, and so uh, uh, people, for that reason, look at interferometry uh, so that you can at least get a long baseline even if you don't have a large aperture. Here's an old JPL graph from a uh, scrapped mission called SIM, Space Interferometry Mission, that has a number of, of collectors and then a beam combiner and an interferometer. Uh, that was scrapped. Right now there's TPF Darwin, which is the modern incarnation of this with uh, a couple meter apertures and it's estimated to cost maybe five billion. Uh, enormously difficult, uh, great tech if they could do it. Uh, of course, there are these futuristic designs where you have large arrays uh, combining starlight, et cetera, to get the long baseline. So this is great. Um, let's talk about problems in designing these things. What really limits us? How do we push the boundaries? Uh, there are some of us on Earth building things for space that want to push the boundaries. I, I think a couple of you know who you are. So many instrument effects limit our ability to see. All right, this is a, a very famous picture of the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Anyone? Wait. It's, it's really hard to hear you, but, but there are a lot of things wrong. But uh, the one I'm really thinking of is this right here. And it turns out that stars are not shaped like this. Stars are round. Um, or maybe they're oblate spheroids if they're spinning, things like that. And so this is typical, and you see this in a lot of images. Uh, it's diffraction from a spider. Uh, in the Hubble, uh, the design looks something like this. It's a normal on-axis telescope. The light goes to a primary, to a secondary, and down to some instrument. And something has to support the secondary mirror. And I didn't have a picture with me of the, uh, the Hubble spider, which is the support, but here's just a little telescope. You can see there's a little cross that is supporting the secondary mirror. And so you get diffraction. There are ways to get rid of that. And, and why do you want to get rid of it? And, and I have this in a later view graph, but if you want to look at a planet near another star, the star is anywhere from a million to a billion times brighter, depending on the color you're looking at, the type of the star, the distance of the planet from the star. And so if you have these wings from this diffraction spike, you completely swamp out the signal for your planet. And, and some of us would like to do spectroscopy and see if there's variable methane and oxygen or chlorophyll or things like that in the atmosphere of these planets and, and therefore life. Right? So there's a way around this. Uh, again, so here's a normal telescope. The beam comes in. It goes up to a secondary, comes down, something holds this, you get tremendous amount of diffraction. That's not the right way to build a telescope. <coughs> That's the, the way they've been doing it for 300 years, is it's very practical. Uh, the right way is to make an off-axis paraboloid, the light comes in, focuses off-axis to the side, and then down to an instrument, and the only diffraction you have is the aperture diffraction, which is substantially lower. Uh, an example of that design, we, we have a, a small experimental solar telescope on Maui that was built like that, at where people at my institute uh, made the first measurements of the solar corona magnetic field. It was a prototype for a new telescope we're building there that's a solar telescope. It's a $350 million project funded by the NSF called the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope. And it's basically a much bigger version of our little prototype. It's a 4.2 meter off axis. Uh, also for looking at planets and things like that, well, there are other big telescopes. The currently planned world's largest telescope, which will be over on the big island, is called TMT, 30 meter telescope. And if you look at its design, it's uh, 30 meters in diameter, so lambda over d tells you uh, about seven milli arc seconds at one micron, if I did my numbers right at five in the morning. And uh, you'll note right away, it's got a whole lot of mirrors, something under 500 of them, so each edge gives you diffraction. This is essentially a keck on steroids. It's not the way to build a large telescope. We'll have a terrible diffraction pattern. On top of that, you know, if you're concerned about a spider, look at all this uh, stuff here holding the secondary. So we'll have tremendous uh, diffraction from the supports and things like that. Uh, projected cost for that is something like $2 billion. Well, it depends who you talk to. I think it's $2 billion for the glass alone. 
Okay, so that ruins your contrast. Contrast matters. Um, I'm going to real quickly throw in another technique, and I'm going to show you how you build them all together. All of you remember the, the wonderful Institute Resource Utilization Experiment NASA did a few years ago, LCROSS, where they uh, verified there was water in the South Pole of the Moon. And so uh, I did a, a, we did in two months from concept to the night of uh, impact, an instrument that was based on this idea that here's the sunlight, you would have impact at the South Pole, uh, there would be a plume, light would hit this, uh, it would be scattered at near right angle, and then from Thompson scattering, you can figure that the light has to be linearly polarized out of the plane of the screen here. And so if you look at two different polarizations and you modulate your polarization, you subtract them, the randomly polarized signal goes away and you leave this little enhanced polarization. So this gives you a drastically better signal and noise ratio. This is a technique that uh, chemists have known for decades that's called uh, polarization modulation infrared reflection absorption spectroscopy. And so we've... <laughs> Okay, so, so you know, we, we buy uh, things like, like uh, chemical detectors and, and stuff and, and put them in telescopes or in our lab we have, we have some weird gadgets. We, we, we don't do any standard things. So, what do you do with all these technologies? You combine them with everything else. Here's a telescope we're working on called PLANETS. PLANETS uh, stands for Polarized Light from Atmospheres of Nearby Extraterrestrial Systems. This is a, a project where we are partnered with uh, Tohoku University, uh, the Kiepenhauer Institute for Solar Physics in Germany, um, UNAM in Mexico, and uh, it's essentially an off-axis telescope where we'll do spectropolarimetry and spectroastrometry and look at scattered light as well as other uh, optical, quantum optical pumping phenomena that will polarize light. We'll exploit the signal noise ratio technique that I showed you from LCROSS. It'll be off axis, uh, low diffraction design, very smooth mirrors, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we're about two years away and we'll be able to determine the atmosphere composition of exoplanets. Uh, this is LEAP. So for those of you interested in finding life, I know some of you want to travel places, but uh, if we can find it, that's a great start. I'm going to skip this next view graph. Uh, I'm part of a, a consortium uh, that is called the Colossus Consortium, and we have a design and some new technology we've been working on for a telescope that is 74 meters across. It's a filled aperture interferometric telescope, and uh, you will actually be able to resolve a star with something like this. And so if you ever come by my lab, you can see the tech we're developing for this. Uh, and it, is really designed for optical SETI and, and uh, infrared optical SETI. And essentially it works like this. If you have a planet going around a star, uh, and if you have a civilization and it's uh, giving off heat, which even if you're a, a civilization doesn't want to be discovered, you're going to have waste heat, right? So if you have something like 1% of your incoming power from the sun being used for civilization, uh, then there's a, a, even if you have a Dyson sphere covering your, your, your planet, there's no way to mask this. And so there's an infrared signal, there's a modulated optical signal as it, as it uh, rotates. If you're interested in this, talk to me or uh, see my colleague uh, Jeff Kuhn from our team uh, had an article, How to Find ET with Infrared Light in uh, June's Astronomy Magazine. And basically you get a modulated signal like this and you go, wow, you know, there's, there's something there. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, for other Things that some of you last night have seen or uh, other times have seen my work on towards 100 meter space telescopes, great. So this is not what this talk is about. This is the background uh, for how you get there. Uh, yes, maybe this is a little bit in the future, but hopefully not too far. Uh, this is a, a technology I've been developing where we've made ultra thin materials where you can control the shape with a beam of light and to achieve optical figure. Uh, I heard the word, term aerial density at least five times yesterday. And, and so, of course, this is not the aerial density of, uh, you know, carbon or a graphene uh, nanocell. Uh, this is more like 100 grams per square meter, but that's still a factor of 2,000 lower in aerial density than the Hubble. Uh, this stuff it literally is, is uh, the density, so you can make a Hubble-sized mirror that weighs one pound. And I, I will skip this, but we're actually building these things. So, the future. How much time do I have? Oh, including the interruptions. Okay, great. Great.
great. So uh, the future, how do you actually do nanosecond imaging? Uh, this will be one of those talks where you either go, Joe was up all night, or it's science fiction, but I'm hoping by the end I can convince you that you can do nanosecond, nano arc second imaging with technology we have now. And uh, I apologize, lots of words in here. I, I didn't have time to make all the pictures last night. But uh, interferometers are a way to get long baselines to have high spatial resolution. They correlate radiation fields that have taken different paths through space. Stellar interferometers uh, in use today are Michelson interferometers. These are optical amplitude interferometers. With amplitude interferometry, like, like the spacecraft I showed earlier, you have to correlate the phase of light. And so this takes nanometer maintenance of your baselines. Very expensive, very difficult, doable if you have billions of dollars in space. Uh, but there's another technique, and it's an old technique, but I've been re-examining it. It's called optical intensity interferometry. So uh, there is this phenomenon when you have a warm spot on the surface of a star or any thermal source, and two photons will be emitted, and there will be a second-order quantum correlation in their noise. And so uh, we can't... So the, the, the idea is to actually measure this correlation and pick up individual photons that are temporally correlated, not spatially correlated, that come from the same source. And so we, we can't directly measure the time of all of the individual pulses, because that takes terahertz electronics. Okay. Um, but uh, there, there's an envelope that is fairly slow, and we have electronics that can, can uh, perform these correlations. Uh, this was done in the 1950s by Hanbury Brown and Twiss. They built a, a device with light buckets down in Australia. They measured the diameters of stars. This is an old experiment. Uh, they published it in 71. They developed the technology in the 50s. We have very fast correlator electronics now. So it's very easy to pick up photons and time tag them. Uh, spectroscopy experts use these all the time. You can buy them for 20 or 30K and, and put them in your lab. Something with a few picosecond uh, uh, jitter and 50 picosecond windows for these correlators. And so, how do you get nano arc second? Well, I'm going to take my last couple minutes and, and tell you how to do this. Uh, I'm sorry I had to put up one equation here. The signal noise ratio for an instrument like this was uh, uh, worked out and published by Klein in 2007. And the signal noise is a function of the photon flux, the area of your detectors, the optical system efficiency, and uh, the speed of your detectors. And so the path for progress is to increase bandwidth and efficiency with modern electronics. We already have a, a factor of a, a thousand faster electronics and much more efficient detectors. So you can get a factor of a few hundred in signal noise from that. And we've done simulations on this. And you can increase area easily because you do this with light buckets. This doesn't take a mirror that takes a millionth of an inch uh, mid low or mid-spatial frequency. This is just a light bucket where you collect the photons and you put them in your detector. So those are cheap. Those are very cheap. Uh, you can increase the baseline by putting them on separate spacecraft. And the signal noise goes as number of photons times the contrast squared. And so I, I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, but you don't need to know your baselines or maintain them to a nanometer. You just need to roughly know your baselines to a centimeter. You can do this with LiDAR, with a corner cube. Uh, I could do it in my lab with a, a measuring tape. Okay, this is not fancy electronics. So I propose this, uh, a system with three satellites so that you can do phase closure of the UV plane, so you can build up images from the interferometric data, uh, small apertures, existing electronics, time-tagged photons, optical intensity interferometry. Uh, if you have the satellites at 6,000 kilometers, your resolution ends up being 10 nano arc seconds. So, in summary, the, the concept is, is very simple. It's uh, ultra baseline temporal interferometry, and you exploit a, uh, a second order quantum temporal correlation in the photon emission. And we have all the technology now to do this. The question becomes is there any limit to the baselines? Can you have light year long baselines? This is really interesting physics. Uh, I won't go into it now, uh, I'll skip that. But uh, ultimately, this is very good for hot, dense, compact objects. And so this is a really interesting physics regime to probe. 
So I, I hope I've convinced you briefly, in brief, that NanoArc second imaging is potentially inexpensive and doable right now. Thank you. Absolutely. A lot of people talk about signatures, right? And so if you have an advanced civilization, uh, there's, there's certainly thermodynamic waste, right? And, and if they have information capabilities like we do, then we're generating tremendous amounts of, of, uh, of heat. So, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, but you won't have it modulated where maybe they turn on lights at night. Um, I, I think you can't mask it if, if you have a rotating planet. A volcano is isolated. We're, if you're looking at the photons from a large object, th that's a lot, right? It's not, not just from a volcano. That'd be an isolated thing. I, I think there are a lot of potential signatures. Name another? Um, well, so I, I, I did before, uh, looking at variable methane and oxygen. Uh, looking, you know, chlorophyll A absorbs at 442 nanometers, so if, if you say, gee, we're, we're missing the upwelling radiance at 442 nanometers, there's chlorophyll A, maybe there's plant life. There are a lot of potential signatures that people want to look for. Is there another question for Joe? Yes. So what would, what would an image from this system look like? Well, it would look like any other image. But you have to get the angular coverage as the system rotates to fill in the UV plane. So you don't get a snapshot at once. So it's well known how to build up a picture from an interferometric array. In, and you basically have to uh, have rotation and ideally do phase closure with all of them. So there's no reason you can't build up a normal image. It's not as fast. But you, know, you have an amazing baseline. Uh, next, back there. And then we'll answer. The, then we'll have these two up here, and I think that'll probably end our time. Uh, Joe, just quick, quick question. Um, since you are separated, you have extremely sparse array in, in what I imagine you're imagining. Um, it's going to take quite a while to close the UV plane. And have you done simulations of? how long it will take to build up a, a decent image? Uh, I haven't with this configuration, but a lot of people have. And people do fill in the UV plane and make these pictures. So I mean, that's, that's a trivial calculation. And, and it's not an instant picture. Well, but you know, you get nano arc second resolution. What do you want, right? <laughs> okay, hey Joe, on. Um, have you considered using this for communication from, say, Alpha Centauri back to Earth and vice versa? I haven't. Um, but I guess we should talk about it. I'm not sure how that would work. I mean, it's big, but you don't get a lot of photons. Right, right. Um, if you had a thermal source where you had correlated photons, let's talk about it. That's just the kind of reason why I brought up this stuff. And then this will be the last question. Well, okay, when, when is the uh, planet's telescope, if it's going to be completed, going to be launched? Planets is, is a ground-based telescope. I'm sorry I wasn't clear on that. We're, we're building it now, and completion is estimated at two years. It's normally something like this would cost maybe 20 million. We're trying to do it for a couple million. We're polishing the mirrors ourselves. We're building the instruments ourselves on, on our team. We have a lot of great people. So uh, it's always a function of time. Uh, it's a function of money, I mean. But uh, we are uh, about two years away from doing this. Come, come to Maui and visit, and we'll show it to you. Thank you very much. Let's give Dr. Ritter a final round. Thank you. Sorry about all the hiccups. And next we have uh, Dr. Uh, Shrikanth Reddy from the Icarus Interstellar. He will be uh, uh, giving the next talk. He will be speaking on structural analysis of the Daedalus reaction chamber and thrust structure. Thank you. Spacecraft 
reaction chamber and thrust structure was uh, the topic of my master's thesis. I'm a mechanical engineer, and on the civilian side, I do um, design and structural engineering for general dynamics. So my outline, I'm going to outline what uh, Project Icarus's goals are. And Project Icarus is uh, separate from Icarus and Interstellar. It's part of the umbrella, but there's many different projects, Hyperion, Project X, Project Tintin, Project Icarus is one of the subsets of Icarus Interstellar. So I'll go through some of the dimensions of spacecraft from Bayless, what my philosophy into the study was, um, some of the assets of the reaction chamber building up the, the model, some of uh, the novel ideas to support the structure, and some of uh, the future work that can go into this. This is uh, this was based at Rutgers, so there was also another team working on this. So this is going into the future. This is not ending here. So the mission of Project Icarus is the redesign of a fusion-powered spacecraft using present or near-term future technology. And Project Atlas uh, linearly, linearly extrapolated the technology, and it was a 1978 trade study. So as you all, as you all know, there's uh, many challenging areas, including propulsion systems, as many speakers here are talking about uh, the structural and assembly analysis, which is my focus. The propulsion system they proposed was uh, inertial confinement fusion. So I'm taking that at face value that those are the loads I'm using. I'm not, I'm not debating the validity of the different propulsion methods. Communications and data relay, uh, fuel and material procurement, control systems and navigation, these are all valid areas of research, but I'm focusing on the structural analysis. So this illustration by Adrian Mann, who's a wonderful artist, shows a great, great view of the Daylist spacecraft. So I'm analyzing basically in this area here with the reaction chamber, the pellet injector, the field coils, up into the parabolic interface. And the second stage is similar to the first stage, but the first stage loads are uh, more severe. So I analyzed the, the first stage here. So these are the relative dimensions, and this is a good, good view graph to show kind of what the scale of Daedalus is. So we're, we're, we're talking on a massive scale, and Daedalus was never meant to be built in Earth's atmosphere. This was meant to be built, uh, they had proposed the Jovian moons. Um, I proposed something a little different, a little closer to home, home the lunar orbit, but this was never meant to withstand our, our gravitational forces. And I'm interested, uh, borrowing a reference from uh, Avatar and not making this from unobtainium and real world materials that we have today and where we can extrapolate those materials and where we need to focus research on those materials. So see, these are some of the dimensions of the first stage reaction chamber. Uh, it's uh, 328 feet in diameter, 100 meters in diameter, and it's uh, 43 thousandths inch thickness. So this classifies the material as foil and to give you some scale on it, uh, 43 thousandths is if you take 10, 10 US dollar bills and stack it up, that's the thickness you're talking about. So the research philosophy I took into this thesis study was a design build methodology. And th this stems off my experience in industry where we take uh, conceptual designs and we call them proto-flights where we only make one of a kind items, but we take it from design to concept to production to testing to qualification and fielding. So that's that's the method I took into this to kind of uh, be specific into a, a specific element of the structure. And after a, I used a finite element method, which is a very powerful analysis tool in complex structures. And basically it's a numerical analysis tool and it takes a continuous model and uh, discretizes it in a process called meshing where you can um, derive stresses, reactions, uh, displacements. So mainly it derives the displacement and you can derive stresses and yield stresses, tensile stresses, the stuff we look for in structures when we're trying to build it in, in actuality. Then the next thing I look into is the manufacturing, assembly, and testing of the structure. So joining techniques, welding, fasteners, assembly environment resources, NDT, non-destructive testing, and qualifi qualification testing. These are all very important aspects of any spacecraft because you're not going to build one spacecraft as a view graph uh, 3D model on your computer. It's going to be many different pieces and many different facets to putting it together. This uh, view graph also by Adrian Mann shows a great depiction of what the, the pulse propulsion was where the fuel pellet drops through the center axis, ignites in the center by electron beam ignition and that's what 
Propulse's uh, aircraft. And like I said before, I'm not, I'm not here to to analyze the inertial confinement fusion, just the structure of this. So th this this um, relies on symmetrical loading, amongst a lot of other things, which is, goes into the control systems module of trying to uh, keep this where it is. So my method I took is, if we were to build this tomorrow, if Icarus Interstellar gave me a grant and said, go build this, or what do we need to refine, what material would we make it from? So we need a low density for weight savings and fuel consumption, high temperature capability. We're operating about 1600 Kelvin at the operating temperatures, about 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, and about near absolute zero in deep space. And you need a very high electrical conductivity for the reaction chamber material to transmit the reactions to the, the field coils. So you need a very, very robust material. And uh, in the list, they had proposed TZ, TZM, which is uh, titanium, zirconium, molybdenum alloy. So I, I specified out looking at what, what type of uh, commercial materials we have today. And this is, this is the material I, I came at for a starting point. So this is the ACM spec that governs that material. So when you go into building materials for, for contracts, you try and govern, govern the specs that list all the requirements for manufacturing, for chemical composition, tensile strength. Type, type 363 refers to it being a coil as opposed to bar, solid, round, so this is classified as foil. Vacuum r is a manufacturing method which uh, reduces impurities in the material and is well suited for our space environment. And the four-step internal nitriding is current research being done after commercial procurement. And this is to basically um, help with the tensile and yield strength um, factors and improve that for our safety factors. So given that this material is suitable for our reaction chamber, the next step is to use FEM or finite element method with these uh, mechanical and material properties, considering our operational, our tensile loads, is, which was uh, derived from Daedalus. So this shows, this view graph shows um, the finite element model. And this isn't to trivialize the model at all. These, these models took me close to, this is where I started, but these models all told and done took about a year to build. So this is this is the reaction chamber and the 1.6 uh, million pound force distributed load was derived from Daedalus. So this is distributed load over over the reaction chamber. And as, as this is a, a base point of a study, I'm assuming that this is distributed evenly. But when you were to refine analysis, you want to look at worst case scenarios when a pellet fails to ignite. And if it was uneven, uneven loading, off angle loading, off axis loading. So this model shows the discretization, the meshing method basically, which breaks it up into the finite elements. So some of, uh, some of the technical aspects of, of this model is we were at 207,000 degrees of freedom. And um, we're using shell, shell elements at very small thickness over a very, very large diameter. So these are second order triangular shell with six nodes and uh, 60 degrees of freedom per element. So these show the operational uh, stress calculations. And in the industry a lot, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, safety factors based off von Mises stress. So I took that, that principle into this. So the von Mises stress is based off the principal stresses, tensile and compressive. For shells is uh, bending and membrane stresses we're looking at. So this, this view graph looks very favorable, but we got to keep in mind my, my fixture conditions so that I, I fix it around the bottom of the reaction chamber as a base point, as an artificial constraint. So we're looking at about 5,000 PSI for um, maximum, 3,000 for average stress. And um, the yield strength of TZM is 100 KSI or 100,000 PSI at room temperature. To qualify this, I started at room temperature. We're not operating at room temperature. We're op operating at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And also, we're not fixed at the bottom. We're, we're fixed the rest of the spacecraft for analysis. But this is just a starting point, and this, this is, um, falls well with what they initially calculated with Daedalus. And then, inverse to that, you'd want to look at a failure mode, which is compressive loading on the reaction chamber. So the same, same loading, uh, different loading direction, and here you can still see the, the structure is still pretty benign. This is a static loading, and I'm assuming linear conditions. And as I said, this is a base point. 
when you uh, further refine this analysis, you go into dynamic loading and uh, look for resonance modes and all, all sort of stuff like that. So I do a modal analysis on, on this reaction chamber, basically to make sure we don't have any resonance uh, interactions between our operating frequency and our natural, natural mode. So I extrapolate out to 30 frequencies, and we can see we're uh, in pretty low frequency modes here at uh, about 7.8 for the fundamental frequency. And uh, the interaction or the, the operation rate was proposed at 250 hertz over uh, 4.5 years, which is about 30 billion cycles. And fatigue's another area of analysis, which is a little separate from this. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to find the modal shapes and make sure there's no interaction between that operating frequency and what we're seeing in the structure. Especially there's research now trying to bring that operating, operating frequency, frequency down further. So that, that, was, that was my starting point. So from there, you want to build onto the structure. And this, this is where structure starts to become more complicated. So at this point, I add on the, the pellet injector interface here. And what I'm looking for as, as a structural engineer is stress concentrations and the stability of the structure now that you're assuming different fixture conditions. And I'm assuming, I'm assuming that this, this pellet injector is interfacing with the rest of the spacecraft. So I'm fixing it at the top of this pellet injector as an artificial constraint there that it, it interfaces to the rest of the spacecraft. So at, at the dimensions originally proposed in, in Daedalus, and Daedalus was a, is a trade study to prove feasibility, so they, they didn't look into very specific detailed design. They're just trying to prove that we can, we can do this. These are the dimensions from, from Daedalus, and you can see very, very high stress concentrations and yield stresses uh, well over the yield strength of the material. You're looking at a million, a piece, million psi for uh, the von Nisi stresses here. So from here, you have to modify the structure to get under our, our bogey for 100 KSI. So this is where I modify the structure. And you can see that the model starts to become more and more complex. You have about 220,000 degrees of freedom here. So now, from now on, I'm, I'm assuming the structure is fixed at the at top, more resemblant to what the structure is actually doing. Same, same loading configuration. Um, the model becomes more complex with different types of elements because you're looking at a mix between solids and structurals in, uh, in the CAD model now. So here, with this modified pellet injector interface, you have uh, a maximum stress at about 78,000 PSI. So this is, this is under our bogey of 100 KSI for the material. This is not qualifying any safety factors, and this is not qualifying um, operating temperatures. At operating temperatures, you're looking at about 30 KSI for yield strength is what the current research says for TZM. So into here, you go into uh, a modal analysis, and you, you uh, change your fixture condition, so you change the model. And now we're looking at very, very, very low frequency range for natural frequencies. And um, for finite element models, you're limited to as many degrees of freedom as about how many modes you can extract. but I was, work, I was running this on my, on my work computer, so they're not going to let me run an analysis for two weeks on this. So, so this is uh, the proposed bracing structure, or thrust structure, as I call it, to kind of help with uh, the loading. And the reason for this spider-type lattice structure is to help with the displacement loading. The, the stresses here maintain under, under a safety factor of 100 mm -hmm. KSI for TZM. We're looking at an average about maybe 40, 47,000 PSI, but we're starting to climb in complexity for a mile. We're at about 550,000 degrees of freedom now. This shows uh, isometric view. This is an exploded view, so you can see the components of the bracing structure. Uh, the, this is a finite element model with the loading constraints, and this is the uh, von Mises stress results. So uh, we're looking at the displacement patterns here, so this is without the thrust structure, you're looking at about 42 and a half inches maximum deflection. And with the thrust structure, you bring that down substantially to about 9.7 9 inches. So that's, what, that's a derivation of why this th thrust structure was needed to help with uh, the reaction chamber. And this reaction chamber is, is analyzed as a single wall structure first. So as you can tell now, this model becomes increasingly complex. Now we're at the order of uh, 1.2 million degrees of freedom. So I add into the structure, the induction loop, the, the field coils, the, the supporting structures, all per, per the Daedalus study, a little modified for the model. 
this is an exploded view. You can see the different components making up the structure. And as you add these components to the structure, and th these components are made of uh, titanium alloy is what, what I had modeled. So this is uh, stiffening the structure here, and you can see it's bringing the stresses down too. So you're looking at about 40,000 PSI for, for stresses. So this is kind of a component mass summary, and this was keeping in the, the Daedalus tradition. And all, all, all told and done here, we're looking about just shy of a million pounds for the, the first stage reaction chamber. So this is some of the, the future work coming up for, uh, for the Daedalus study that we're working on at Rutgers. Um, it's kind of a conceptual study of parabolic interface. Uh, these are the actuator mechanisms that you can see a little clearer here. So we're looking at about one degree course correction. So we need, we need an interface that will be able to do this. So we have a jacking system uh, supported by bellows and pressurized that will be able to gimbal, gimbal the reaction chamber here. So after all the models are run, uh, if we were to build this, what would we need? So we use mechanical joints. We have to consider fatigue. 30 billion cycles is not trivial. That's uh, orders of magnitude higher than traditional fatigue studies. Um, brazing and welding. Joining, we have to consider heat affected zone, chemical composition, uh, fusion zones, weld efficiencies. These are all very important. Uh, materials are never manufactured perfectly. So you all always have material variances when you buy materials. So we have to evaluate these very carefully for this for the spacecraft. And also, you want to make this design very modular. So if you have a failure at one point, it won't compromise the whole starship. So I propose a, a lunar based staging area, which is kind of more. Uh, tangible for us and the reason is presence of helium-3 for fuel considerations and also it's not, not as far as Jupiter, Jupiter as Daedalus proposed to go to. So from here you want to test worst case, you want to build scale models, uh, non-destructive testing, of electron beam welding, um, you need to establish accepted methods of NDT, also if you want to fix this robotically you have to establish methods there. So this is the 30 billion cycles I was talking about. It's a very important design criteria mechanically for this system. And this is uh, some not so distant capabilities uh, they were talking about yesterday. This is uh, the J2X manifold for uh, NASA Space Launch System. So 3D printing would, would be very beneficial if you can miniaturize it enough for the spacecraft. Put this on the second stage, you can make parts in situ and reduce your O&M maintenance. But in the 3D printing of metals, this is a nickel copper alloy, you have to uh, it's a different physical metallurgy. It's a different material makeup microstru microstructure. So this has to be qualified very well before use. So I'll leave you, as I'm running over my time allotment here, um, we'll quote from Robert Goddard. It is difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Thank you. time for some discussion, but first I'd also like to uh, congratulate you on completing your master's degree on Daedalus study, and you were the first person to, <laughs> and he was also the first person to, uh, that was able to focus solely on Daedalus Starship for a master's degree. And questions. All right, before, before I entertain any questions, just remember I'm a mechanical engineer. If things don't work, I hit it with a hammer, okay, so. Well, well that's funny because my question was about an impulse, so. Um, so I'm always impressed by uh, modern engineering tools, but that you guys, all the stuff you guys do, but I'm just a physicist, so can you explain why you originally used the boundary condition fixing the equator of the re reaction chamber? It seems the constraint, thus the resultant modes, are, are not consistent with the mounting points, and then, what, what's the actual pulse rate uh, for, for the engine? And so do you, do you model the power spectrum that that induces? So originally when I, when I started, you're talking about at the very beginning when I was fixing it around uh, basically the, the hemisphere, the bottom of the hemisphere. I was, uh, they list in their study had extracted uh, a natural frequency of about 20 hertz. So I was trying to uh, try and recreate where, where this, this frequency was coming from. So that's where, and in the beginning, it was just an artificial constraint. As you know, as you build up the structure, you have to assume in any model, you have to make assumptions or any calculations, you have to make assumptions. So that's, that's just where I was assuming from the beginning. So you could do uh, force vibration. You could do uh, with the loading, different types of calculations, studies. Uh, you can impart the operational loading and do frequency studies there. Um, these are 
preliminary models. I wasn't solely focused on that, so you can refine analysis to really do what modal shapes are. And, and final element models around restraints is always a very tricky area because those restraints are artificial in any, any aspect. So if you look at stresses, boundary conditions around restraints, it's always a it's always a very very difficult area to kind of focus in on. So if we were if that was really what the spacecraft was doing and that's really how it was fixed, you would really refine the analysis around that that area. Um, you also talked about the pulsing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But at, at that point, I was trying to trying to validate what what they were doing in Dayless, and my my models later later on are more more um, resemblant of what the actual structure is fixed to the rest of the structure. So that was just a starting point, just to kind of get the design space, as we, we call it, defined. So the, so the pulses. Um, this is future analysis, future refinement. So with the pulses, what I'd be looking for is. Uh, the radiation, the thermal radiation, um, the pulses it was looking at um, 250 cycles a second and 4.5 years I think was the acceleration period. So the pulses you have to model, um, I look at the radiation of the material, the thermal properties which was, uh, which is future analysis being done this year at Rutgers but this is something I didn't have time to get, get to in my study. We have time for about one more short question. Uh, yes, uh, have you taken into account and mitigation methods uh, for micrometeorite damage in that very thin shelled tanks. So in, in Daedalus, um, I try to specify in on, on the structural and if you go off, as you know, if you go off too many tangents, studies can take years if not decades to do, but in Daedalus they had proposed in the second stage there was kind of a, almost a reflector shield and they have different mechanisms in the second stage to to shield from micrometeorites. So that, that's something that was proposed and that's still something that Icarus and Icarus Interstellar are looking into, shielding mechanisms that you can have this perfect structure but if, if you get hit by cosmic dust or a micrometeorite then, then you'll fail, fail the starship. And this also goes to the compartmentalization that I was talking about, that you don't want to make this into sheets that you can't replace. If you do get hit by a micrometeorite, something that you don't want it to fail the whole structure, you want to be able to replace it in situ. Thank you very much, uh, Trian. Well, let's give him a final round of applause. Okay. Uh, everybody, before we break, I don't think the speaker's on. Uh, Here, this one is. Uh, basically, tomorrow there's a mistake in the schedule. Uh, we show that at noon, there's a missing talk that didn't get listed. And it turns out that uh, after Gerald Cleaver gives his talk at 11.35. Tomorrow morning at 12 o'clock noon will be Dr. Lance Williams of Confluence. He will be giving a talk and somehow his talk got left out of the schedule. So I want everybody to know that there's a 12 o'clock noon talk for 25 minutes. Then lunch begins at 12.25 p.m. as is shown in the schedule. So I apologize for that error. So, and right now we'll take a 10 minute break. and We'll come back and start at 10.46.
I sure will. We'll try to start within a minute or so. It's not, sorry, I was looking at the beginning. No, it should be. Uh the second half of our morning session now with Dr. Friedrich Winterberg. He will be presenting Cheating the Death of the Sun by Relativistic Interstellar Space Flight. And this will be a 45-minute talk. Welcome, Dr. Winterberg. Thank you very much. Do we have a microphone here? Okay. First, I would like to express my sincere, sincere thanks to Dr. Obusi for having invited me in a very generous way to give said lecture here and also to Dr. Ciolas for having given away his time to speak for me instead of him. Thank you so very much, both of you. <clears throat> I would like to begin with a quote by Werner von Braun. The quote is, thank you so much, <clears throat> the importance of the space program is to build a bridge to the stars, so, so, so that when the sun dies, humanity will not die. The sun is a star that's burning up, and with, when it finally burns up, there will be no Earth, no Mars, no Jupiter. You have to find a way, because humans are the only thinking creatures that we know of in the entire universe, and we have to build a bridge to save this particular species, Werner von Braun. Now, when contemplating interstellar spaceflight, we should always keep in mind that we can only disturb the universe using a phrase by Freeman Dyson. We will never be able to play God, like in this slide here, where, for example, a black hole, in a sense, can propel an entire galaxy, provided we can shield the, the opposite jet somehow by absorption in, in interstellar gas, for example. <clears throat> However, in disturbing the universe, we have come quite already a very nice way. We have made very nice progress. We have landed a man on the moon and we have a robot walking on Mars. Now I would like to say the following thing, to contemplate what the future will hold, it is very useful to contemplate the past. So let me suppose I could make a trip back and meet, visit Newton. I, I'm convinced I could Newton, in, I could persuade or convince Newton in less than a half hour that a flight to the moon is possible. 
She had, she had the correct law of gravity and the correct law of mechanics, you know, we need 11 kilometers per second. The only invention he still needed was a multi-stage rocket. Gunpowder, you know, can produce a velocity of typically a kilometer, maybe two kilometers per second, so if in a few stages he could reach the escape velocity. Of course, it would have been obvious to him that the technology at that time would be unsuitable to, to keep out such an experiment, to uh, perform such an experiment. Now, as much as Newton could have predicted, a flight to the moon is possible. So we can predict with nuclear energy that we can reach 10% of the velocity of light. To reach relativistic velocities, close to the velocity of light, is much, much, much more difficult. Now, how do I can say 10% of the velocity of light? Well, in chemical reaction, typically the velocity of the particles which burn up after the order of kilometers per second. But in a nuclear reaction, typically the velocity is 10% the velocity of light. Of course, it is not as simple as chemical propulsion. In a chemical rocket, we must cool the reaction chamber by the propellant and oxidizer, otherwise it wouldn't work. In a nuclear rocket, where the temperatures are much more higher than the thousand degrees of a chemical reaction, rather 100 million degrees, such cooling of the reaction chamber wouldn't work. So there, but we, are, there we have another possibility, we can use a magnetic field, in particular if we have a pure fusion explosion. Now, let me see. I will take now the next one. Here's one particular interesting thing which I would like now to bring here. If we take now here, there's another very important problem we face in interstellar spaceflight or, or even interplanetary spaceflight, but interstellar. <coughs> Here, the Saturn rocket is placed side by the Daedalus interstellar <coughs> rocket. Okay, then you see the enormous difference in size. But the problem is here, in order to build such an object in space, in low Earth orbit, we need many, many, we would need an enormous number of chemical rockets to bring it up into low Earth orbit. So one very, very serious problem we have, we, a chemical, lift, space lift, is very inefficient and would require, well, in the case in um, Werner von Braun's Mars project, he envisioned only to build not a big as, uh, thing as big as that one, he would need several hundred chemical uh, launches into low Earth orbit. <coughs> Here, of course, we would, would run into thousands. So we must look for a different way how to launch very uh, large objects into low Earth orbit. I come to that towards the end of my talk. <coughs> now, let's see. <coughs> Coming back to the Daedalus propulsion system, as this previous speaker has pointed out, it is, uses inertial confinement fusion. Now, inertial confinement fusion had one very serious setback recently because of the overselling of laser fusion. As you may have heard, Livermore failed to ignite a thermonuclear micro-explosion using a pulsed laser because for the very simple reason that the energy requirement was grossly underestimated. They had a laser which could produce on target two megajoules. However, from experiments, classified experiments, which were done at the Nevada test site, using atomic bombs to check how much energy would be needed to ignite a pellet, the number was more like 50 megajoules. In a paper I had published in 1968, <coughs> Uh, I estimated 10 megajoules, so I still was low. But 2 megajoules definitely was, not, was too low. So that was a very interesting thing because it gives you an example how if a scientific community is overselling a particular project, it can cost a lot of money and the result is negative. Like it happened in the uh, NIF, laser, NIF National Ignition Facility laser fusion program. It think collapsed after five billion dollars were spent. Now we come here to the next, let's see what happened here, it doesn't work. No. Can help somebody help me? Oh, I'm sorry. Here, yeah, okay. Now here, I show you in a display my idea how we can replace the inefficient laser 
by electric pulse power for the ignition of a thermonuclear micro explosion. There are two concepts of interest. One concept, let me see, does, does it work here too well? I don't know. I said so. You know, two concepts. You know, the bad thing is I cannot step down here. Okay, but anyway, you can see it on the left side. I can say it in words. On the left side, you see what we call a Marx generator. In a Marx generator, yeah, is that better? Yeah, okay. Okay, let me see. Okay, in a Marx generator, yes, it's much better. A battery of capacitors is charged up in parallel and discharged in series. And with such a system, which has a very high <coughs> efficiency, you can get a very high voltage pulse, goes to a, over a transmission line to a field emission diode and bombards the target. That can be either an electron beam or an ion beam. <coughs> Now, a thing like that, which is built by Sandia, for example, to test this idea, cover, uh, occupies um, Athletic Hall, where as a laser in Livermore, which cannot nearly produce as much as this one here, uh, covers several uh, sports fields. So that definitely is a great improvement. First of all, it has a very high efficiency. The la a laser would need a little the power plant in addition to uh, the enormous size. <coughs> And of course, then with the power plant would go along with it a large radiator. Now here is another idea I proposed. And I have a, can tell you a little anecdote there involving Teller. I published also in my 1968 paper and then I presented that at a meeting where Edward Teller was sitting. And well, here's the idea. You have a superconducting ring and a large current flows through the ring. And then the ring, pro this current produces a magnetic field and the magnetic field can make, prevent electrons if I charge up the ring from leaving the ring. Vice versa, if I charge it up positively, it repels electrons. We call that magnetic insulation. And now if that ring has only meter-sized dimensions, then we can store certain energy of gigajoule. Here we can store easily many megajoules, maybe 10 megajoules. Here we can store a gigajoule. Okay, just think about it. Almost as much energy as in a ton of TNT. So then Teller told me, well, that's very interesting, but you must take your ring to the moon because there you have a high vacuum. You don't have it on Earth. Now at that time, of course, he, uh, vacuum technology has enormously made enormous advances so we can produce such vacuums and of course we have it in space for free. Now that we can do that of course suggests also already something very important. It suggests to us that our spacecraft, if it shall ignite a thermal micro explosion for propulsion, should have the architecture of a torus because then we can use uh, we can charge up the spacecraft and make the spacecraft a huge capacitor magnetically insulated capacitor which then stores energy to ignite a thermonuclear micro explosion. Before I go to set, I must make here some other, let me see, I may go to the next transparency, let <coughs> me see, and that is here, okay, that is uh, here grateful by NASA, and of course I should say, I never named it like that, because somebody asked me who was Mr. Daedalus, and I say, well, not a co-author, because he lived 2,000 years ago. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so anyway, so, but it's a very nice diagram, it explains it very well. We have here, the, let's see, Daedalus uh, micro-explosion uh, chamber, so to speak, and then, of course, we have a magnetic field, which we need a magnetic mirror to repel the hot plasma from the spacecraft. So we don't need a pusher plate, but we do not use a pusher plate, which may not work. We use a magnetic field. And then, of course, we have here, we need a current loop to pick up some part of that energy to recharge our capacitor bank or laser or whatever, not laser, here in that case, of the Daedalus project, the capacitor banks, use capacitor banks, or in my idea, to recharge that. <coughs> Uh, to recharge the torus. Okay, now how would such a spacecraft look? Here is shown, published in Astronautica Acta. First of all, <coughs> we make the spacecraft, that's not, not so scale, that is here's the target, you know, that's a very small thing, that maybe can, could be maybe as high as a kilometer or hundreds of meters, but now you see it, there is a pipe, it has the same 
topology as a torus, clear? And the currents going, going the azimuthal direction around, it's made from a superconductor, at least part of it. And then, of course, we have here some, then we charge it up positively. The thing, first we need a little reactor to charge it up positively, to up to a gigavolt. <coughs> and then, uh, from this positively charged spacecraft, we launch an ion beam. I will not go into the details. We must make a bridge service. We can make that with a laser on a little jet. And the ion beam will hit our target. But while the target in the, um, in the uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, experiment was a spherical shell, which was imploded, I don't like that. I like a cylindrical target. Now I remember I once told to some guy in Sandia, well, we make cylindrical targets. First thing he told me, cylindrical targets are classified. But of course, not this kind of target because such small targets are not of interest for nuclear weapons. Because here we use some other idea. We have here the iron beam, that's my target. I have a cylindrical target, deuterium. Okay, I would like to use only deuterium because tritium is very expensive. Of course, to ignite deuterium, I need much more energy than to ignite tritium deuterium. So anyway, I have here my beam coming in and it must be a beam of 10 million arms and of gigavolts. You see, the laser fusion idea by Livermore failed on what we call Rayleigh Taylor instability. Here it would fail if unless the beam has a current of, a ten, of typically 10 million amps and a voltage of gigavolts. We must be about, below a so-called current, which is called the Alphane limit. <coughs> Otherwise the thing is unstable. So anyway, then we get here, <coughs> the beam is stopped by collective instability and we have a magnetic field and the alpha particles of the fusion reaction are trapped and we get here a nice propagating burn down the cylinder. Okay, now here's the thing, of course, also produces neutrons to prevent the neutrons from heating the spacecraft and heating up the spacecraft. We make little here, not shown here in the picture, a shadow shield. Make a little <coughs> um, amount of boron around and that place here. And then, of course, that will prevent the neutrons from hitting the spacecraft. Otherwise, we would need also a considerably large radiator for the spacecraft. <coughs> now, let me see what is now the next thing I would like to talk about. <coughs> okay, let me see. <coughs> okay, now we have this here. Now, I would like to point out one thing. <coughs> to make to reach relative, now what kind of velocities we can reach with such a rocket? We can reach 10% <coughs> of the velocity of light, but not more, not much more, not 90% of the velocity of light. We need, so we need something much bigger and much more difficult. So I remember I had also a conversation with Teller, <coughs> and we came up to the idea of anti-matter rocket, matter, anti-matter rocket. Now here's the problem with matter, anti-matter is the following. Let's take anti-hydrogen and hydrogen. If you bring that together, then you get <coughs> gamma rays, neutrinos, and they go in all directions. You get also a few charged particles, but the large amount of energy goes into all directions and in gamma rays. So they will hit a spacecraft, and then of course you would need huge radiators to make such a rocket work. <coughs> so you could not utilize this energy. So <coughs> then I was listening there to a talk by Hawking, you know, said we need something to leave our solar system eventually. Well, same thing what Werner von Braun believes and said. So I was wondering maybe how can we ma maybe do it? And then came into my mind an idea I had published several years ago before in the physical review and that is this paper, and they had <coughs> found the following thing out, not thinking about rocket propulsion at all. If we make a plasma pinch, but not from an ordinary plasma, from a plasma made from electrons and positrons moving in opposite direction, because the electrons and positrons move in the opposite direction, but the current, of course, moves in the same direction. The calculation has shown that, that, first of all, this is a relativistic pinch, 
which unlike, unlike a non-relativistic pinch is stable. We have an experimental evidence that relativistic pinches are highly, very quite stable. Okay, now <coughs> the reason why they are stable is they get radiation cooling. Now here we have the following situation that we have here electrons, positrons, they come together, they attract each other, these uh, beams, let me see first beams of electrons and positrons, so we get an electron, positron, ambiplasma. The word ambiplasma was introduced by Hannes Alfen, one of the pioneers in fusion research. And then the thing what happens here, extremely interesting, that such a beam or such a plasma collapses down to radius determined by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In other words, we get nuclear densities. Now, here I recall, when Sanger came up with the idea of a photon rocket, he asked me and some other physicists, I need a mirror where I can reflect photons. He thought about using electrons, positrons as a propellant for his photon rocket. Then I told him, well, a mirror like that, you would need the densities of a white dwarf star. So, totally unrealistic. Now, but now here, we get such densities. Okay? Okay, now the next step is, of course, it would be much nicer if you don't have electrons and positrons. Mr. Chairman, how many time do we still have? <coughs> Can you tell me? Yeah. You have uh, about 18 minutes. 18 minutes, very good. Okay, <coughs> so the next idea is, <coughs> Here I published Sarah paper. Well, after I list, was listening to Hawkins' uh, call for look for something like that, then I said, "Okay, I make matter and a matter giga electron volt gamma ray laser." In other words, I do not only make this electrons and positrons with protons and antiprotons, which of course also need electrons and positrons. We use an matter antimatter ambiplasma. Again, the word by Alphen, ambiplasma. Hydrogen, 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 ambiplasma. Now, how we do that? It's explained here on the next slide. <coughs> and then, of course, very important, which is already stated here. Let me see if I get that here. That the reason why that may have a chance to work is, normally, if you bring matter and antimatter together, they re it produces radiation goes in all directions. But if you have it in a pinch and in form of a laser, you know, if you can get along the pinch a laser avalanche, then it will by the Mossbauer effect, you know, can you see here? Then the recoil of the beam can be absorbed by the Mossbauer effect, but which is similar like a perfect mirror. So the recoil of these highly energetic <coughs> um, uh, ele photons, which are GeV photons, just think about it, can be transmitted back to the re we call it the a uh, return current conductor, and the return conductor, of course, is connected with the spacecraft. We can bring that back, uh, um, and we can get the recoil transmitted to the spacecraft. And let me see, now comes here, now what can we do it? Experimentally, how can we, how would that be done? We must, to do that, we must start with four rings, electrons, positrons, and positrons, electrons. And of course, that we bring these two rings together, we must have the correct orientation, then we get here electron, positron, ambiplasma, and here too. But we must do it in such a way that the currents are going parallel, because then these rings attract each other. Now, I enlarge this region here, and then I get here a region where I have, if I inject then hydrogen and antihydrogen, of course I need antihydrogen somehow, we come to that too, that's one of the great problems here still, which is left. We inject, sec, inject that here, then we get here a hydrogen, antihydrogen, or proton, antiproton, ambiplasma. Now, then we can launch from this thing here, now I turn it here around, um 90 degrees, okay, we can launch by triggering it here, we can launch here a laser avalanche, which goes in that direction, shown here in this direction. But of course, this RGEV, uh, Photons and their recoil is absorbed by the most power effect to the return current conductor. Now, that idea solves two problems. Because one problem always was pointed out, also by von Braun, which all these ideas are, we cannot see how it can be solved. If you get a spacecraft 
moving close to the velocity of light, maybe 80-90% velocity of light, if it hits a tiny particle, then of course it will like an explosion. But okay, what we are doing simply here, once in a while we do not launch the avalanche in this direction, but in the opposite direction. So the laser makes a hole in space and wipes out all particles which might be, there be. And of course it, it goes here with the velocity of light, so it can make a tunnel which is very, very long. Okay, so it can solve, of course, once in a while, we direct it in the opposite direction to clear out the tunnel. So, that solves this problem. Okay, now of course the question is, how can we get this antimatter? You see, that is a very, very difficult question. Okay, now first of all, we need an enormous amount of energy. Now, now we are getting much, much more into the scientific, science fiction part of it. So, I, of course, it's, we can, it is conceivable. We have robotic factories on Mercury. Mercury is much closer to the sun, so we use solar energy because the amount of energy we need to produce appreciable amounts of antimatter is enormous. Okay, we go to Mercury and we make their huge solar collectors. We have no storms, no rain, nothing like that, vacuum. It's a beautiful condition. The solar constant is about 10 times higher than on Earth. Then with this energy, we drive certain machinery or lasers. So ideas to produce antimatter with lasers. Okay, and then the question is how can we handle that? We need robots with magnetic fingers because you cannot handle it directly. With magnetic fingers and they must put in magnetic containers. Okay, now, and then of course, I will leave it there and I will go now to the next thing. The next question is, I come back to this question which I brought, which I mentioned on the beginning of my talk, how can we <coughs> launch very large spacecraft into low Earth orbit? So <coughs> it's going back to, to our original uh, idea, ideas, Daedalus and so on, it's a huge spacecraft, okay. How can we bring that into low Earth orbit? So we shouldn't forget that problem. Okay, now here was an idea I had. I had, it was 1956, there was a um, meeting organized by von Weizsäcker, a fusion pioneer at Göttingen at the Max Planck Institute, and uh, they came up with the idea of magnetic fusion, and I came up with the idea there, we use a convergent shock wave to ignite a thermonuclear reaction. All right. And then of course, the calculation showed, in order to ignite a thermonuclear reaction, we have high explosive, in a shell, inside you have hydrogen, gas or hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, then you get a conversion shock wave. Then the theory we had was that the temperature goes as inverse, in inverse proportion to the radius, so in order to get um, 100 million degrees for ignition of the deuterium tritium, you would need a radius, initial radius of 10 meters. Okay, so that of course ruled it out quite well. But then when I came to America, then Freeman Dyson and Ted Taylor, who worked on the Ryan project, wanted to hire me, and he must have heard about my Ted Taylor in particular, about my idea to ignite a thermal nuclear action in that way, <coughs> because they got stuck with the Orion project to launch all the large payloads from the Earth orbit into uh, from from yeah into low low Earth orbit, stuck that they couldn't do it with sufficient a chain of fission micro with small explosions, because you get contamination of the Earth's atmosphere. But here I came up with an idea where we can reduce the radius substantially. And so the idea is, in chemical, in ordinary chemical reactions, you have CS atoms, and then if the chemical reaction takes place, for, for example, hydrogen into hydrogen 2, then and also the outer electrons, or any kind of chemical reactions, form a bridge, and you get here energy released in electron volts. But now suppose I compress some material to very high, then or to reasonably high density under very high pressure. Then, of course, inner electron orbits can make bridges, and we get what we call KEV, um, um, yeah, or KEV chemistry. And then with this kind of KEV chemistry, I published a paper about it, so we can reduce the radius of such a, for such a micro-explosion drastically. So maybe we could think about a uh, fusion bomb, which has a dimension, maybe that's a diameter of a meter, but not more than that. Then we have here 
uh, high explosives, in high explosive uh, so-called plane wave lenses, they create a conversion shock wave here. Then we have here the substance which is the super explosive, which must be of course compressed by this co conversion shock wave. Then this ignites and then produces an enormous amount of gamma ray burst. A gamma ray burst can ignite the deuterium tritium. Now, in the Livermore project, that only two megajoule here, we can get easily 100 megajoule of an X-ray pulse with this thing. So we can ignite here a deuterium tritium reaction. Now, to launch with such a concept, large payload into orbit, we need maybe 10 of such um, micro explosions, well, if you may call it micro explosions, simultaneously going off. And then, of course, you need more than one. You need a cluster of them, otherwise you cannot stabilize. A rocket. So then you could launch from the Earth's orbit a pay as a thousands of tons in one stage into low Earth's orbit. Okay, <coughs> next one. Get the next. Now I come towards the end of my talk, and I now come to a little bit more in more not science fiction, but almost like. Okay, let's go here. <coughs> okay, now one thing, of course, is very interesting. For us, we know now that from the composition of the universe. Only 4% is of uh, elements as we know it, up to uranium, from hydrogen up to uranium, about 5%, okay. Then about 27% is an unknown dark matter. And then here that's dark energy. Now let's ask the question, what could that be? All kind of experiments were made, which were not conclusive, but they suggest that this dark matter must consist of very heavy particles, much, much heavier than uranium, much heavier. Maybe a fraction, we still have 10 minutes time, wonderful, wonderful, I think I can, I can make it work, thank you very much. <laughs> so, we have there these particles, unknown particles, which are very heavy, maybe there are hundreds of a Planck mass, or thousands of a Planck mass. Planck mass is 10 to the minus 5 grams, so each particle would have a weight of 10 to the minus 8 grams, compare that to 10 to the minus 24 grams for, for a proton, so much, much, much heavier than a proton. Now the question is, suppose it is, uh, suppose it would be the case, and one such particle would be here, we know it exists, the other particle would be maybe a kilometer away from us, okay? We couldn't, if we could not mine such stuff if it exists, because it might be very, very interesting if such stuff exists, and we could find a, find a place where we could mine it. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Where could we perhaps mine that stuff? Okay, <coughs> here is it, here is it. I had published there a paper that we should, with uh, nuclear explosives, make a tunnel through the moon. Now, why is the moon of interest? First of all, we know from observation of rotation curves of galaxies that galactic matter breaks down this called dark matter, unknown matter, because the rotation curve of galaxies suggests there must be cold dark matter in space. And of course, a galaxy is a potential well, but so is the moon. And the moon is a potential well, a gravitational potential well, which in the center is not liquid lava, like in the Earth, okay? It's only hot rocks. <laughs> so, and so the moon is a relatively large potential well, which we can get to it. We can approach it by making a tunnel through the moon. Now suppose over a billion of years this stuff has accumulated there, then we could mine it from there. Another interesting place of course would be the planet Mercury. Now if such material exists, it may not react with hydrogen or antihydrogen to annihilate each other. So we could use maybe that stuff only in a very thin layer to make a container for antimatter. So I thought it's now more looks now what I say a little bit more science fiction. So I'm speculating, of course, very interesting. Now, in order, I would like to bring you to the end how, one, how wrong one can be in making predictions about the future, that thing I had published in, um, in Acta Astronautica, and somebody asked me, why did you want to do that? Well, of course, that's, here's the answer. Would like to know what's the center of the moon. Okay, now here, I show you, this was by an artist in Germany, his name was Greenberg. And he made pictures in the 1920s how a trip to the moon would look like. Now one thing is very funny there. 
These two guys are in a spacecraft, you know, and they approach the moon, why don't they need a chair there? You know, <laughs> pretty ridiculous. But of course, that, yeah. And then he says, this picture is here in the year 3000 on the moon, not 3000, not 2100. Okay, so this could be now. Now here the guys have here a solar power plant, and then they have beer barrels. Now wait, why couldn't they invent something better to drink beer? thousand years than having old-fashioned beer barrels is there, you see. <laughs> so you can see how wrong you can be. Now, I go even 100 years further back, and that's the last picture. And this picture is a very nice picture, uh, a painting made on the commis commission of Camille Flammarion. Camille Flammarion was the founder of popular astronomy in France. <coughs> and here, ask an artist, if you could, maybe in a far distant solar system, draw uh, a picture of a planet. Now, of course, what we see now with the Kepler telescope, are most, it's not something like that. We see, more, we see more like hell. We always told up there is heaven, but the Tepler, Kepler telescope has shown most the planets up there are hell. We, we have planets with supersonic storms and so on. Okay. But of course, but he didn't think about something like that. So he thought about a beautiful planet, of course, with flowing water, you know. And then, of course, there are several suns. Here is just an eclipse. One sun is settling. Now, that looks laughable, but it's not totally laughable. Well, uh, Poincaré had shown that there may be stable orbits in a multi, uh, in a, not in a binary planet, planet system, in, in systems, let me see, in a system where you have two suns, for example, okay? Or three suns, quite possible. You have their stable orbits. So it's not totally crazy, that. But of course, now, doesn't that whet your appetite to see if you could one day go to something like that and build a nice house? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. quantities, okay. How large? Well, kilograms, tons, okay? Think about it. All right, now we cannot do that on the earth. Well, it would require more than the entire civilization and all its existence has used up energy, okay? So we must go to some place where energy is available freely at large quantities, and that would be, for example, the planet Mercury. Maybe the other ideas people come up with bizarre ideas, but I mean, that will be a very difficult problem. I told you to reach 10% of the velocity of light, maybe 20%, with fusion, micro-explosions, is quite feasible. And we could even do that in this century. For example, I had presented a talk at Langley Research Center where I said we can go with nuclear bomb propulsion in one week, okay? So that's all very feasible. But to reach relativistic velocity is a totally different ballgame. It's much, much more difficult. I asked Teller about it. And Teller says maybe something like that is possible in 500 years. Then I asked him, Dr. Teller, how did you arrive at 500 years? And he told me, well, when Columbus sailed to America, then he maybe was wondering, can I ever sail to the moon? And he would have said, no, never. And Teller says, never means in 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I think with this kind of idea, we can make a laser, and if we can find a way 
to generate, to produce antimatter, and to store it, then we can make such a laser. It may be less than 500 years. Think about that picture I which I had before. Here it is again. Okay, things in the year 3000 on the moon, okay? So it was totally off by 1000 years, you see? But it will be very, very, very difficult to get relativistic space flight. Another question for yeah. Dr. Pinterberg. We have plenty of time, about uh, four minutes. Uh, in your, uh, one of your latter slides, you showed an, an implosion uh, device. And, and as I'm sure very well aware, there was quite a bit of work done on trying to produce uh, a pure fusion weapon, um, which was not successful. Um, which also, one, also which also one, which one is that? Uh, was your uh, your lens high explosive with your super explosive? You know, uh, no, forward. Which? Uh, uh, keep going forward. Back? No, no, forward. Oh, you mean this one? No. Uh, you mean that one? No, it was your explosive lens. It was a, c a compressor. Oh, oh, it's that one, okay. Yeah. Why do you think it's not possible? No, I didn't say it's not possible. I just said, it, 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 as I'm sure you're quite well aware, there was a lot of work done um, in trying to produce uh, pure fusion weapons by this approach. And so you need something which was, is new in terms of you know, your super explosive. I don't know what your super explosive is or intended to be, but just wondering if you have some thoughts on that. I don't understand your question at all. If I okay. compress material to very high density, then I may get this configuration which is super explosive because I get transitions into internal inner orbit, electron orbits. You no, know? And then I, I get here gamma ray emission. No, and I, I understand that part. Then. And even I would like to add one, one other thing. The thing is even experimentally verified by a man who in my paper I've named, and he, I forgot his name now. He, what he did is to determine, he found it independently of me. He found out the following thing. If you accelerated small pellets to a velocity of 100 kilometers per second and hit it on a metal plate, then he, uh, part of the energy was transformed into heat, as you, would you, as you would expect, but I think 30% or so was released in form of gamma rays, of soft gamma rays, not thermal gamma rays, okay? So there is experimental evidence for something like that. These calculations have been made uh, that the idea I was really was for me a triggering moment for this idea by a professor at the University of Arizona, his name is Rafelski. He did it when he was in Frankfurt and then he went to America. And because he made calculations of the Dirac uh, equation with the two center configuration, and there you can get this kind of configurations. And his data I used to determine my X ray pulses. I would get out of it. Yeah, no, the question is really more on, on the practical level. And as, as you know, in the, in the Ulam Teller configuration, you're, you're driven by soft X rays from the fission device, which then causes an implosion in the fusion device. So the question here is really more of a practical question. Uh, in order to initiate the, uh, the, the, both the compression and the temperatures required for fusion, um, you need to have extremely high compression. And as you, the, your numbers are about right, hundreds of kilometers no, no. per second. The, uh, my test to compression is 60. It's a mic test. Of course, we need always the condition density times radius. Now here we definitely would get the correct density and we need also radius, but we need some ignition energy which easily can provide it here by the X-ray pulse. X-ray pulse can be easily here let me see 50 megajoule, which has been determined to be needed by the Centurion Halide experiment. Okay, so that's, and of course, rumors were always going around with rumors there are some substance called the red mercury, where you could ignite a thermal nuclear reaction. Of course, that was fake. Of course, that thing has to be explored in further detail, but I think the physics basically is correct. When I first presented that at a meeting of the American Physical Society, then there was some guy from Livermore said, we have also a group working on KV chemistry. But he admitted they didn't think about that possibility, said you can make a super explosive. All right, that's it. We're right on time, so yeah. we need, let's give Dr. Vinterberg a final round of applause. I found a room key up here on the table. Uh, it's 
Michael Minovich, was, this could be your key, or uh, maybe Bill Crest, but I found it up here this morning while we were setting up. So, Our next speaker is Robert Freeland. He will be speaking on trading a mag sale versus fusion for full deceleration at Target, at, at target Star. opportunity to speak here. I'm going to be talking today about mag sale deceleration, um, specifically trading um, a mag sale equipped uh, vessel or comparing a mag sale equipped vessel to one that just uses the main uh, fusion drive for deceleration. Uh, this is all part of Project Icarus and I'm sure you're all well familiar with it by now. These are the terms of reference for this project. Um, I want to focus in specifically on numbers three, four, and six. Uh, in number three, we said that we have to reach our destination within a century. In number four, we said that the spacecraft must be designed for a variety of target stars. And then in number six, we said we have to allow for some deceleration uh, to allow for increased encounter time. We've made a couple decisions in Project Icarus over the last year. Um, one of them is to select Alpha Centauri as a target for the, the project. And uh, that's kind of a nod to number four uh, in that it's a binary system. So it's kind of some variety. Um, and then uh, we've also decided that we need to fully decelerate into the target system because that allows us to do in situ measurements and so forth uh, that some deceleration just won't get to us. So full deceleration Alpha Centauri is what we're looking at now. The uh, mag sail was first introduced by Robert Zubrin back in 1988. And um, this picture actually is from a later paper by Toivonen. But you basically see the way it works. You, um, I, and I should back up and say it's not a sail in the sense of the sails we talked about yesterday. It's not a big old uh, sheet of something. What you're talking about with a mag sail is just a loop of wire, um, much more akin to what uh, Minovich spoke about earlier today. And um, the instant uh, ion flow is directed around this thing, and uh, that creates drag to slow the vessel down. Now the mathematics of a mag, mag sail, how you calculate this drag, is you essentially calculate your field strength at some arbitrary point off in space, and uh, you can convert that into a magnetic pressure. Then you balance that against the uh, incoming uh, ram pressure over some uh, surface that you define where those two balance. And uh, then by summing up that drag across the surface, you can get the total drag on the vessel. So the mathematics for this are not easy even for just a, a simple wire loop. Uh, you start with the Biet-Savart law and um, you can start to expand that out. That's, that's a cross product now between an element of the wire and a vector to some arbitrary point in space. Um, and you can see down at the bottom here um, how that expands out fairly rapidly in the Cartesian uh, coordinate system. Uh, if we convert that over to a cylindrical coordinate system with the axis of the uh, wire loop through the middle, um, it gets a little bit simpler but you can still see there's no closed form solution to this integral, um, except for the theta uh, term, which actually goes to zero. So what uh, you can do here is actually replace uh, the elements of this integral with uh, elliptic integrals, which were defined back in the 1700s and actually have numerical solutions. Again, not a closed form solution, but you can actually get plugins for XL even that will give you the, uh, the values for these elliptic integrals as defined at the bottom of the slide. Skipping over a whole lot of math, uh, these at two formulae at the top here are the correct full uh, equations for the um, radial and uh, z-axis components of the magnetic field from that closed current loop. And you can see that they're not very pleasant formulae, but uh, those are completely correct. Uh, in the plane of the loop, uh, where z is zero, you can see it simplifies a little bit because you lose that uh, radial component. Um, but again, still you've got the elliptic integrals e of k and k of k in there, and those are 
difficult to work with, uh, particularly because we're going to talk about summing across a surface with these things. Um, there is a special case through the axis of the loop where uh, your row is zero, your theta is zero, and you're just dealing with the z, um, which is the second formula from the bottom. And you can see that that actually starts to approach the uh, formula for a point dipole. So usually when we start to deal with the mathematics of these closed current loops, we dispense with the whole closed current loop and we deal with the point dipole instead. Now the question I had is, if you're dealing with relatively uh, low magnetic fields, um, how defensible is that substitution? So what I've got here on the next slide, uh, I'm going to talk about the one in the upper right corner first, uh, is a comparison of the magnetic field strengths uh, using both the uh, proper formula for the uh, uh, closed current loop and also the ones for the uh, point dipole. The uh, blue line which starts out at some value over on the left and then slowly tapers off to zero at infinity, gives you the axial magnetic field. So that's through the middle of the closed current loop. Uh, the uh, pink line uh, shows you the strength of the magnetic field in the plane of the current loop. And you can see that it starts out the same value at the, the origin and it goes to infinity right at the, uh, the loop itself. And then it inverts and uh, goes back off to zero at infinity. The teal and yellow lines are the axial and radial components of the dipole magnetic field. And then I've added one more line here in the purple, uh, which is the average of the axial and radial uh, dipole magnetic fields. And what I was trying to do is figure out, is there a uh, representation for the magnetic field at some great distance from this uh, mag sail that we can use um, regardless of orientation? Because that saves a lot of trouble with the mathematics of all this. And if you look at the graph in the lower left corner, you can see uh, how the radial and axial uh, magnetic fields kind of converge on this average of the dipole. Um, components of the magnetic field. So the formula down at the bottom is my vastly simplified um, uh, magnetic field strength as a function of just R. So given that, we can go back to the uh, drag uh, calculation that we want to do, which is integrating the pressure over the area of this magnetic field, or uh, over the area of this uh, magnetic pause that we've created. And um, using the formula for the ram pressure and the magnetic pressure, we end up with this uh, boundary condition, which is r to the sixth equals all of that mess with the uh, cosine squared phi in the denominator. So this defines a geometry for the um, boundary between the, uh, the magnetic pressure and the ram pressure. So now we can just integrate over that, and we end up with this force equation, which is um, approximately 0.354 pi times c v to the fourth and all of that to the one third. Now the interesting thing about this result is that it's very similar to what Zubrin came up in his, with in his 1989 paper um, where he also used a similar approach to come up uh, with, with a formula. Um, but he came up with 1.175 pi and then same factors. And uh, in looking at kind of how this happened, um, you know, he's, he's got a drag coefficient about three times higher than I came up with. Um, and it seems to be because he used a numerical model to define a uh, planar geometry against which to apply the ram pressure, where I've actually used an integral here across the surface of the thing. But nevertheless, the uh, mag sail still works, and I'm going to talk about that next. Um, if we take that uh, drag uh, equation that I had on the previous slide, from that we can calculate an acceleration, and then from that you get a velocity, uh, integrate again, you can get the distance as a function of time. So these all describe the performance of the mag sail. Then the question becomes, how much does this thing weigh? Uh, Zubrin notes in his uh, NIAC report that uh, all of these superconducting materials have roughly the same uh, you know, kind of uh, material density. He quotes uh, values uh, in the range of 5 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter up to about 9. Um, I've used uh, middle of the road, uh, 6.5 here. Um, the big question is achievable critical current density. Um, he noted at the time, and again, uh, this graph on the right was one from his paper published in 2000. He was trying to predict critical current densities as a function of uh, time over the next 20 years. 
And we're, of course, midway through that right now, and I wanted to see how well we're doing in terms of keeping up with the, the growth here. I found a uh, paper that came out in January of this year by the Brookhaven uh, Institute where they were working with an iron uh, selenium and tellurium uh, alloy that was achieving uh, critical current densities of uh, uh, 10 to the 10th amps per square meter. So that's getting pretty close to where we need uh, to make a, a really good mag sale. Uh, for my analysis, I'm going to assume that we can actually hit this 10 to the 11th um, as an engineering current density. So another big component of the mass of this uh, thing is the shielding for the wire because you've got this giant loop of wire that's being uh, dragged through interstellar space and you need to protect it from uh, collisions with the non-ionized hydrogen and also dust. Now, when Zubrin did his report, he had a uh, square wire, which is basically a bundle of little square wires. And this enabled him to put his uh, radiation shielding on one side of the wire, leaving the other three unprotected. Um, his design was for a, a mag cell used for acceleration within the solar system. Um, there was a, another member of uh, the Icarus group, uh, Matthias Reibel, who did a paper uh, earlier this year looking at specifically mag cell deceleration. Um, and he used the same square wire cross-section and then put uh, his uh, ablative shielding on one side of it. Now, my concern is that if you have a mag sail of very large radius, and I mean, we're talking here hundreds of kilometers, um, it's going to be very difficult to keep it from twisting. And uh, if it twists, then you're going to expose a side of the wire that's not shielded, and it's going to tear your wire apart, and that's not going to be good. So it seems to me you've got to put your shielding all the way around the wire. Now, I ran the numbers on that initially, and it wasn't that encouraging because what ends up happening is you're carrying away around a lot of shielding that you don't need because uh, the side that's exposed to the interstellar medium is going to get ablated and then the rest of it's just going to sit there. So what I realized is if you actually take this wire and slowly turn it, kind of like a hot dog on a hot dog stand, right, you can actually expose all of the surfaces of that wire to the interstellar medium over some extended period of time. And that allows you to actually shield it evenly and thinly around the entire wire. Uh, I worked out the mathematics for how thick that layer needs to be, and that's that second formula from the bottom. Uh, it uses uh, what I've called an ex effective exposure time, uh, TE, uh, which takes into account the fact that this vessel is decelerating. Um, that was another uh, mistake that uh, some previous authors have made in terms of calculating the shield mass as you use the initial velocity to calculate it, but you can see that the, uh, the flux of energy is proportional to the velocity cubed, so you really want to take into account the fact that this thing is actually slowing down. The uh, last big component of mass are the spools to roll all this thing up. Um, one of the things that uh, Matthias Reibel pointed out was that you need rather relatively big spools because the superconductors tend to be a bit uh, brittle. Um, we're talking uh, spools with a radius of about 10 meters. Uh, I've worked out kind of a minimum radius here and also uh, how many uh, wraps you end up having to put on these spools in order to wind the whole things up. Fortunately, they don't, tend, don't come out all that big. So, where does all this leave us if we attach this to an actual vessel? This is the interesting slide. Um, as a baseline, I used what we call our Dirty Icarus Mark I, which was a uh, version of Icarus that we came up with by simply turning around the second stage of Daedalus and adjusting it in another couple parameters so that we can fully decelerate into Alpha Centauri. Now, uh, that was, of course, an ICF fusion vessel. I'm not saying that's what we would use. I'm just saying that's our baseline. Um, it came out to uh, 4,310 tons total, and you can see that the lion's share of that uh, is propellants and gases. So I took that very same vessel um, and kept this, this is all the second stage, by the way, this doesn't count the giant first stage of this thing, I'm going to assume that's the same. Um, so on the second stage, though, I kept it exactly the same, same structural mass. The only thing I got rid of was tankage that we didn't need. Um, and you can see I've got us down to 350 tons of propellants and then I'm adding in 1,370 tons of mag sail. Total mass comes out almost exactly half of what I was getting with the baseline model. So does the mag sail work? Absolutely, and that's on a, a real model. It's not just with some math. Um, what would a, a mission look like with this? Uh, 
same, first stage is the same as it was in our Dirty Icarus. You get up to 5% C in four and a quarter years, um, but then the vessel cruises along at 5% C for about 75 years. You reach about 3.835 light years from Earth. Deploy this mag sail with a radius of 260 kilometers. So that would pretty much cover Florida. Um, the superconducting wire is 10 millimeters in diameter uh, with about 0.6 millimeters of beryllium shielding on it. Uh, the spools are 10 meters in radius. You deploy this thing for 20 years and it slows you from 5% C down to 1.3% C. So you've lost three quarters of your velocity right there. Um, and I would say the mag sail becomes less effective the slower you go. So you kick it off, just discard it, and then you ignite your second stage for uh, about 190 days, burn 75 hertz to slow you down to nine kilometers per second within two astronomical units of Alpha Centauri. So you're there. Total elapsed time with that model, 99.9 .9 years. <laughs> <laughs> two big caveats to making this a reality. Um, number one, we have to be able to manufacture superconducting wire hundreds of kilometers long with an engineering current density of 10 to the 11th amps per square meter. It needs a yield strength of 150 uh, megapascals unless we use Minovich's suggestion of uh, divorcing the uh, current density from the uh, material strength might be a good idea because that would allow you to make the, uh, the loop bigger um, but with thinner wire, uh, which does help you tremendously because the uh, effectiveness of the mag sail depends on the radius of the loop to the fourth, um, but current density only squared, so that helps a lot. Um, I think that these uh, engineering current densities should be achievable within the next decade or so, um, primarily thanks to all of the research in the medical field for MRIs because they're trying to figure out how to make a superconducting wire that they can make giant MRIs out of. Um, the second big caveat is that the, uh, the interstellar medium between here and Alpha Centauri must be substantially as we believe it to be. Um, we believe that the G cloud starts about a quarter of the way from here to Alpha Centauri and then that it extends pretty much all the way to Alpha Centauri. Some models actually have Alpha Centauri sitting within the G cloud. Some of it, some models have it just beyond. Um, we need it to extend to about 240 AU from uh, Alpha Centauri. If it stops a little short of that, we can still make the model work, but if it uh, stops way short of Alpha Centauri, then we have a problem. Thank you. Uh, the G cloud must have at least uh, 0.1 ions per cubic centimeter. Um, the uh, estimates that uh, my colleague Ian Crawford has come up with point, put that at the low end. Um, could possibly be as high as 0.21 ions per cubic centimeter. Um, and then the hydrogen density needs to be no more than 0.45 atoms per cubic centimeter. Um, otherwise, we're going to increase our shielding mass. And that is at the high end of Ian Crawford's estimates. So I uh, did put a final note here uh, about what happens if the ion density turns out to be a lot higher. We probably won't even know that until the vessel's on its way. Um, you start encountering 0.21 ions per cubic centimeters, you're going to start slowing down a lot faster than you intended. Um, that's actually a problem because you risk falling short of your destination. So what you'd actually have to do is dynamically decrease the uh, current in the mag sail in order to compensate for that so you don't fall short. This last slide I'm going to put on here just to show where all these numbers came from. Um, this is the Excel model that uh, ties uh, all the mag sail stuff together that was in mentioned in this slide, and it's also got a little piece of the uh, dirty Icarus model at the bottom right corner here to calculate the fusion deceleration stage. Uh, the numbers of interest here are the ones in pink down in the corner because those show where you end up after all of this. And that's what I have for you. Any questions? Thank you, Robert. We have about five minutes for questions. Yes, right here. Uh, I think on the um, f that uh, mag sails uh, are going to have to be used for uh, uh, mag uh, for sails to decelerate sails as well, and it seems like that's going to be a lot lighter because um, we've got a lot less mass to decelerate. Uh, does it s d just scale down in pr in proportion, or is it a more sophisticated scaling? Yes, it actually scales really well, so um, it would work beautifully for that. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that later. Okay. Yes, right back here. Does the mag sail technology first have to be tested 
in probes within the solar system before we start bringing it out into uh, Alpha Centauri so we, we get experience and, and, and learn how to uh, uh, solve the problems that we might encounter and get some kind of feel of it? Yes, and in fact, uh, Robert Zubrin first proposed this as a way of accelerating uh, vessels within our solar system, and uh, he had some smaller versions that he proposed to test the whole uh, theory out within the solar system, so definitely. Any more questions? We have, mm -hmm. we have time, yes. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, you've done, or your group's done a comparison uh, between using a mag sail and using a solar sail for deceleration, just as um, a solar sail, uh, what you're working with in terms of what's providing your force is a little less stochastic than, let's say, if a solar storm kicks up an Alpha Centauri when we get there, even if we predicted it right, you could decelerate way early. Yeah, the advantage to the mag sail is that the drag is uh, proportional to the velocity squared, so um, we can start deploying that mag sail far away from the target star where the uh, solar radiation is quite low. So uh, it ends up the mag sail works way better than a solar sail for deceleration. And over, over here. Uh, that's a really nice set of calculations. I, I'm always impressed by how thorough you guys are. Are you looking at any other uses for the coil once you've got it? You know, I... Uh, felt a little pang when I was doing the model and realized that it made sense to just kick it loose at the end. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know what to do with it. It's going to be traveling ahead of you because you're going to fire up the second stage to decelerate. So it's going to get to your target before you do. I don't know what you would do with it. Um, you definitely need to get rid of it, though, before you fire up the second stage for deceleration. Otherwise, you have to carry a whole lot of uh, fuel. Any more? Oh, okay. Well, that, that just tells us that somebody's coming if we happen to see a mag sail fly by. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for about two questions left. Do we have any? Do we have questions? Hi, Robert. Uh, any, any thoughts on how you would deploy the mag sail, like spooling and perhaps the deployment time? Yeah, um, actually, uh, Andreas Hines' uh, student, Matthias Reibel, did a, an excellent study earlier this year uh, talking about the actual engineering side of putting one of these mag sails out there, and uh, he had a whole thing worked out with how the spools deploy. Um, there's one of the things that Zubrin pointed out, which is that if you put the current through the coil, it actually uh, creates enough hoop stress that it'll self-deploy, and you can augment this somewhat by spinning the mag sail um, to get it to deploy a little more rapidly. There's one right here, and this will be the last question. We're just on time. Uh, did you just do the thing analytically to get a calculation? Because it all could be done numerically. I'm afraid I don't understand your question. I mean, you can numerically solve the uh, equations. Exact exactly. equation. Oh, you're saying to actually numerically solve uh, using the uh, magnetic field equation with the elliptics in it and everything else. Yeah, I, I thought about doing that, but it looked painful. <laughs> yeah. We'll finish there with a final round of applause for Robert. <laughs> Our concluding speaker for this morning's session is Gwyn Rosaire from Texas A&M. The title of the talk is The Nuclear Thermal Rocket's Role in Promoting Interstellar Explorations. I had all the talks all set up, but somebody got them all. The session, we'll have lunch after this, and uh, the afternoon session will begin right at 1.15 p.m. with our keynote address by um, Kevin Long. So be back here by one fifteen. Backward, and when you can use the red laser, you can use the green laser. Okay. Can I see the keys here? Hi. As he said, my name is Gwen Rosaire. I'm a nuclear PhD student for, or nuclear engineering PhD student from Texas A&M University, and I'm here today to, I guess, promote the NTR as the stepping stone technology to actually become an interstellar civilization. So we're going to go over a little bit of the scale of the problem. I'm sure you've all seen this before. 
a little bit over energy density and its application to the interstellar uh, problem. And then a little brief history of energy and where we come from in that regard. And then we're going to talk about the nuclear option, the exciting stuff. So just NTRs and then finally commercial space nuclear. So any technology being presented to you at this workshop will need at least one miracle in development in order to enable an interstellar mission. This is a quote by Dr. Stephen Howe. Uh, he's one of my mentors at the INL currently. And I, I thought that this was very appropriate for this crowd because any single one of these mission concepts or propulsion concepts is going to require some sort of miracle in either breakthrough physics, materials engineering, construction in space, the list goes on. There's, there's something that just has to magically appear. <laughs> so to put things into scale, here's a log scale in AU. And here we have Alpha Centauri at 270,000 AU from Earth. And that's, that's a, a very, very long distance. And, it, and I still have trouble wrapping my head around this, the, the sheer magnitude of the problem. So we look at the rocket equation. We go through the derivation. We see that we have an exponential problem. That means with just a smidget more of mass delivered to the final to the final star system, you have an exponential growth in mass. So we take this and we look at all the breakdown of your propellant and your structure, tankage, and your scientific payload, and we see that you have a certain regime in which if you don't have a high enough exhaust velocity, you can't do the mission, period. There's not enough mass in the universe to get to Alpha Centauri if you don't have the right uh, if you don't have the, the right uh, exhaust velocity, or at least high enough. So we see at the equation at the bottom, we have the mass of the fuel. And then you, you can also notice the, the singularity that's in that mathematical equation. And this singularity is what I was talking about that essentially makes something not possible. Um, so there's an associated energy density with the mass of the fuel that you're carrying along. Now this energy density has with it an exhaust velocity, a char or not a characteristic exhaust velocity, but an exhaust velocity that you can achieve with that much energy and the, the products that come from it. With this in mind, we have uh, three missions and certain time frames, and then the delta V is required to, in order to achieve those missions. Now, using those velocities, and those, or rather those delta Vs, we see a energy density that we have to achieve in order to make that possible. Otherwise, it's just not doable or it takes a lot longer. So I want you to keep those in mind. And we look at chemical, chemical, it's not good. You can't even go very far in human lifetimes uh, beyond even the asteroid belt. Um, so fission makes the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud possible, but you cannot do an interstellar mission using fission. It's just infeasible, unless you resort to multiple stages. So we get to fusion, and that's why you see the Daedalus concept having two stages, because it's barely feasible at 100% efficiency. And then you get to antimatter, and then all sorts of other miracles happen. So that takes us to the history of power in humans. So here at the far left in the yellow is about 100 watts. That represents us with a 2,000 calorie diet, or 2,000 calorie a day diet. We're equivalent to a 100 watt light bulb. So that is about 400,000 years ago that we are in current form. And about 125,000 years ago, we got fire. And fire allowed us to build our civilization the way it is today. So. Then we get to draft animals, water wheels, and then we get to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution allowed us to expand even further and make even more advances by harnessing the energy. And then in the 60s, we got to Phoebus, or the nuclear thermal rockets, rather. And from there, we went from the steam-powered stuff, and we're still pretty much in the steam 
the steam era. We use steam from coal plants to still generate our electricity. We're still in this purple. So we look at the NTR and Phoebus, which produced 5,000 megawatts for, I think it was a, a one hour burn. It's incredible. The thing isn't that big, but it's twice, over twice the amount of power that was output, or that is output by the Hoover Dam. So where does this lead? Where can we go? We see on, on the log plot how far we have to go in orders of magnitude in order to realize the interstellar problem. We can't get to interstellar by making this huge jump from steam power all the way up to peak fission or peak fusion or even antimatter. We have to use the NTR as a stepping stone into the solar system to make interstellar travel possible. So this takes us to the different propulsion types. And here you see the fission fragment rockets. There was a talk uh, yesterday, or a keynote on that yesterday uh, from my professor at A&M. And you have a bunch of the different ideas that have been proposed today. So now we look at the rover Nerva program. Now this was the peak of the technology of its time. And it's sad to think that we took it up to a technological readiness level of five, six, and then we just threw it away. We have to spend a billion dollars today to recover that technology that we had back in the 60s. Um, over 20 of these things were built and tested from the late 50s to the early 70s when the program was canceled along with Apollo when it lost its ride. So I would like to also note that the peak power densities achieved in Peewee were over five gigawatts per cubic meter. I mean, that's, that's hard to fathom. If you've seen the Hoover Dam, to think two of those and then squish it down into a cubic meter, that's what we're talking about. So these solid core NTRs have a theoretical ISP a maximum of about a thousand seconds. So the next step in the evolution, and, and so uh, I'm trying to make the case for the NTR as a stepping stone in which all the technologies developed throughout the NTR program will lead to materials advances that will help usher in the, the high temperature superconducting magnets, the ones that are radiation hardened and things like that. So we move over the, to the, the next step in the evolution is just let the fuel melt and you almost double the, um, the, the ISP to about 2000. It's right about where the limit is before you start boiling everything. So another interesting thing that will another problem that we would solve in a program that would address the molten core NTR are two phase flows in microgravity as well as trying to uh, deal with the heat flux. Uh, that's the, the interstellar problem to me is definitely a, a thermal management problem because we're going to have to, well thermal management and materials, we're going to have to manage all of this stuff and the best way to gain experience is to just start doing it. And the, and the nearest term available thing is the solid core NTR. So now we go from the liquid core NTR, we go to the gas core, and this one is the hydrodynamically confined. So you have these little hydrogen jets that flow around and try and confine the plasma. The problem with this design is you give it a little acceleration and the entire clump of uranium just flies out the back. So this one is going to require a redesign. Um, Yes, okay, so uh, another issue here is that its ISP is also limited by the fact that you have, um, you have a lot of heat flux in the nozzle region uh, right before the expansion and you have to come up with new technologies like even ablation of tungsten potentially uh, to, in order to cool this nozzle. So putting that one aside, we go over to the nuclear light bulb concept. Developing this will also advance our understanding of heat flux management as well as um, figuring out how to make radiation hard transparent materials. 
So these rad hard transparent materials uh, would help us form lenses that would actually last the 100 years using uh, ICF type design on Daedalus or Icarus. So from this, um, we go to the next step in evolution once we've developed our heat flux management and our materials database. We take it over to fusion. This isn't really fusion, but it looks pretty, right? Um, so with the fusion drives, uh, we then now have a bunch of other materials that are now rad hard. Now we develop the superconductors that are able to deal with the 14 MeV neutrons that come off this thing. 14 MeV neutrons are no laughing matter. It is extremely hard to deal with those, especially when they start colliding within your material. It just tears it to pieces. You have what's uh, called a radiation-induced void swelling. And this will actually turn a nice ductile metal into chalk, almost. So once we figure out how to make superconductors that actually repair themselves at the nanostructure, we then can begin to consider antimatter. Now the, the size of this problem is unbelievably high. I mean, it's, I mean, you're talking about a nozzle that's a kilometer long. So I, I think it's, it, it, it stands to reason that we absolutely have to start tomorrow if possible. I know it's a bit dreamy, but we need to start getting nuclear stuff into space so that we can gain the experience necessary to achieve this scale of a problem. So this takes me to my final point, and this is on to commercial space nuclear propulsion, power, whatever. So currently in the U.S. today, we have two licensing options, the DOE or the, or the NRC. The DOE owns any highly enriched uranium that has any research or, well, they, they don't like to lend the stuff out for commercial use, but any research um, avenues, and they have what's called the Global Nuclear Threat Reduction Initiative, it's a mouthful, but that essentially means that they're trying to get rid of all the HEU that's in the research reactors that we have around the world which also means they're not going to let it out anytime soon. They're not going to let us use it for NTRs. So that leaves us with one option, the NRC, which requires low enriched uranium for commercial reactors. So one of the problems with LEU though is it requires moderation, which means you just slow the neutrons down. That gives you more mass changes the design space considerably because you only have a few moderator choices that are actually effective. And this actually needs change, uh, in order to transition to LEU, it needs changes in the Outer Space Treaty. The Outer Space Treaty currently um, requires that any nuclear material, or not nuclear material, but any uranium that's shipped up into space has to be HEU. So we have to change this to allow us to get to HEU and allow nuclear technology to become commercially viable in space, because we will not go anywhere unless nuclear power is commercially viable in outer space. This past summer, a uh, uh, team that I was on, we designed a low enriched nuclear thermal rocket that was competitive with the small nuclear rocket engine concept that was put out by Los Alamos National Lab in, I think, the late 70s, early 80s, I can't remember when they finalize the design. But the, the point was is that we got thrust to weight ratios that were better and we used extremely conservative design analysis and we, show, uh, we, had, we proved that it was conceptually possible to build a low and rich nuclear thermal rocket. And with that, I would like to open the floor to any questions. And we're on a good schedule, so we have time for several. Now, and next, we'll, answer, we'll ask over there. There are several types of antimatter rocket nozzles proposed. There was one that was just proposed a year ago, a new type. I was wondering, what, what one were you assuming with the kilometer-long nozzle? Well, that's a kilometer-long interaction length over the back end of the nozzle. If we go back to this, 
And, and I use this just for illustration purposes. And so as you can see, the you only have like, I guess, 21 meters uh, of length, but you have to be able to control the pi ons, the pi plus and pi minus and the pi knots. I, I think a pretty considerable amount of your, um, of the matter that is produced from your antimatter collisions is, are pi knots, which you can't do anything with unless you figure out a way to harness the gammas. We'll see. Over here now. So, uh, Glenn, I just wanted to piggyback on a comment you made about uh, the Outer Space Treaty. So this came up in a talk yesterday also um, where it occurred to me that there would be, I think the time is right for a conference to think about a superseding regime to the Outer Space Treaty that would encourage general spacefaring, because I think there are a lot of things where the, where the treaty as it was written between nation states that were trying to constrain nuclear war is not the same problem we're trying to solve today in terms of long-term survival of humanity. And it, it may be worthwhile for some of the groups here to think about having a conference like that for shaping uh, a, a succeeding regime to the Outer Space Treaty. Absolutely. And then back, right there. Hi there. Uh, you said the Outer Space Treaty, did I hear correctly, only allows HEUs? Yeah, it has to do with the specific wording, and I think at the time they were trying to limit the amount of radioactive material that uh, is put into space, because I think it was, I think it was right after one of the, the Cosmos satellites broke up over Canada, and I'm actually, I'm really fuzzy on that, but um, we had a, a policy guy work with us this past summer and he pulled up the document and showed us the specific clause. I don't, I don't have that number right on, right off hand. Uh, I can get it on my computer though. So the, the LEU, uh, so my second question is the LEU NTR uh, that you designed, that you mentioned, uh, is that a surface launch rocket or? No, it is not an SSTO. It is, um, uh, we, we designed it to be compatible with NASA's nuclear cryogenic upper stage program uh, that's currently being, re or not researched, but they're uh, currently under development in, I think it's uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. Next question. Oh, okay. Oh, way so back there. I see one. Okay. So. There and then, okay. Then. I have, uh, uh, the, the question has two parts. So the, the um, uh, there's uh, recently some um, uh, revival of, of researching into the thorium as an alternative for nuclear uh, fission power. So my question is, you, is, uh, you think that uh, going to thorium is going to help the ability to license uh, the material for research purposes? And, and the, the second part of the question is, I, I know it's a, uh, a bit hard, but uh, do you think thorium will be better suited uh, for electric propulsion with with a with a thorium reactor, or uh, will uh, a thorium thermal uh, reactor will work all, uh, as good as a uh, one from enriched uranium? Okay, so thorium, unless you're India is not necessarily an alternative. I mean, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for the US to develop the thorium cycle when we have plenty of uranium around. I mean, it doesn't make economic sense. Um, uh, so, and then in regards to NEP versus NTP, I, I think that's what your question was. Okay, so once you get to NEP, so you're converting that thermal energy into electrical energy, once you get beyond uh, about a megawatt, I think, your entire electrical system mass winds up being dominated by the radiator. So at that point, it really doesn't matter if you're doing thorium breeding into U-233 or you're doing LEU or HEU. It's, it's really a, a heat rejection problem. And there so are some advanced technologies out there um, well, when I say advanced, I mean advanced concepts. We haven't been able to test a whole lot of stuff in space, so uh, it's unfortunate. But did I? 
answer your question? We have a question way in the back there. Where? I just wanted to confirm that it is Marshall that's doing the NTR study, and we are looking very strongly at LEU for the reasons that you stated. Also, um, I've done a lot of work. Thanks for paying for the research. <laughs> <laughs> no sweat. <laughs> Thank Mike, though. How it's, um, uh, the problem with the radiators is, is right on, but I wouldn't say that there's a power limit. It happens at all power levels. That's why you don't see a lot of that going on anymore. Uh, the alphas just get blown up. The radiators end up dumb. 40, 50% of the total system mass. So. Joe has a question up here now then. Thank you. The uh, theme I heard several times in your talk was possibly that you want to see vision work so you can do materials development. I heard that repeated several times. And so my question is partly for you and maybe partly for our friend, colleague who uh, gave the foundry talk yesterday. Now, I'm not a materials expert, but uh, you have problems with neutron damage and it's bad with metals and you have dislocations and you get you know, yield points and things like that. Uh, is there work in your field looking at materials that are amorphous because then when they you, know, you, you get dislocation where you just go, oh, it's more amorphous, so you just get more of, of what you've got. I mean, I don't really know what's happening in your field, but so, that's the question. Um, <clears throat> one of my professors at A&M is doing research into uh, nanoscale or nano-engineered materials. Uh, one of the things that he's found is that some nanomaterials are more rad hard than others, uh, and so it's, it's this interesting thing. It can either make the material worse, or it can make the material to where you have the initial knock-on and then this huge void is created. And then you have a reassembly from the outside in using that, in, uh, that information. So the material essentially reassembles itself at the molecular scale. So whether or not we can figure out if we, if we can make superconductors like this or um, like, uh, I guess like design processes for like TZM or some other refractory alloys or even aluminum or titanium, uh, we have yet to see. So, so amorphous metals or are you talking about like glasses? It is, and um, I'm not specifically a materials engineer, but uh, I, I do think people are looking at it. It's not as highly funded as, say, like uh, graphene or carbon nanotubes, unfortunately. And radiation hard materials isn't, I mean, it, it's, it's big in the nuclear engineering field, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't think people are really that interested in it. We'll go here and then there if there's time. Yep. It, is liquid core reactors and gas core reactors an essential in order to develop the technology to finally get a controlled food fusion reaction in space vehicles? I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but I think it does help. Because if you look at the problem, fission is easy. Uh, uh, with regard to fusion, and quite frankly, I think we'll see fusion uh, rockets before we'll ever see fusion electric or fusion on the electric grid. Um, uh, at least I, I do think that the solid core NTR is necessary in order to open up the solar system, make the solar system, especially harvesting minerals from the asteroid belt, economically viable, and uh, making a return on your investment. And we'll finish with this question. Uh, so Gwen, you had mentioned that, that uh, this would be either uh, activated or operated in the high or beyond the atmosphere. And given that uh, solid core NTR is, uh, well, is materials that we know a lot about, 
Are you aware of any work that anyone's done on the producibility of such uh, objects from space resources? Has anybody looked at whether or not you could construct a, a NERVA from lunar materials and what, what kind of processing and manufacture would be required to do that? So the graphite elements of antiquity for the NERVA, uh, <laughs> for the NERVA program, those didn't hold up too well. Uh, I, I came across some photos that actually showed some of uh, the, the fuel elements as they, not as, but uh, after they came out of the reactor. And it wasn't just a mid-band corrosion thing, so we're going to have to go beyond graphite. Uh, the CSNR is currently developing tungsten, so I, I'm not really sure what the tungsten resources are like on the moon. But we do need tungsten, and we do need to enrich it in tungsten 184 to make the LEU stuff work. We've been missing one person, so we'll answer, uh, we'll go with his Just question. Just a, a final comment. Although we are slowly trudging along um, with NTR, um, NASA gave some great presentations on at the Joint Propulsion Conference on that for a future Mars mission. But I also learned that the Russian Mars mission has abandoned NTR in order to save mass, and they're going all electric propulsion. Hmm. Is that they, the they, they don't have a, uh, a concern for the well-being of their astronauts and the duration of the mission as, as we generally do. Any comments? Oh, I, I, I thought that was just a comment and not a, not a question. Um, it, commenting on that, uh, the Russians, I think, actually uh, wound up selling their NTR program to China. So, mm. <laughs> with that, that, that's not official, but I mean, it, it makes the most sense. <laughs> with that, let's give Gwen a final round of applause. <laughs> and then one lunch announcement. Again, lunch is to be picked up uh, by the gossip bar using your, gal your galley cart ticket, and then we'll be eating lunch at the Coronado Room just over from the registration desk as yesterday.
Systems Engineer for the Department of Defense and a legal author and consultant for the American Bar Association in the area of unmanned aerial vehicle law. She is also an adjunct professor of law and computer science at Ebring Riddle University, as well as systems engineer for Icarus Interstellar. So take it over, Donna. Good afternoon, everybody. This afternoon, we are changing pace. We are talking about the environment, the economy, politics, and ethics. Our keynote speaker, Kelvin Long is the founder and executive director of the Institute for Interstellar Studies and is the managing director for Stellar Engines Limited. He is also the chief editor of the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society and co-founder of Project Icarus, as well as one of the former vice presidents of Icarus Interstellar. Mr. Long now presents Rise of the Starships. Mr. Long? Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, excellent, good. So um, first of all, congratulations to Icarus Interstellar for organizing a wonderful meeting. Um, I think this has been really successful so far, and I'm looking forward to future meetings um, in the years ahead. So as was pointed out, I'm representing the Institute for Interstellar Studies, but I'll also be uh, representing um, JBiz um, in England and also um, um, Icarus Interstellar, uh, who have, of course, organized this conference. So I've called this Rise of the Starships, and I actually stole the name from the Terminator film, Rise of the Machines, because I kind of like the name. Um, so I think um, this image is from, of course, the last Star Trek film, with Enterprise rising out of the ocean. Now, of course, um, you can debate the uh, engineering practicality of that, and whether that's really credible. But I think it's really apt when you think about rising the starship, okay? Because what we're essentially doing as a community is we're bringing the starship into reality from imagination. That's what we're essentially doing. And everyone who is here at this conference is participating in that journey. So I'm going to split my talk into three parts. The first part is about um, some of the developments that's happened, that's got us to this point. I'm then going to talk a little bit about um, Tierkovsky and um, how we could think differently about the space-time problem. And thirdly, just a couple of slides on motivations for pursuing the starship. So let's get started. So I mentioned the uh, Enterprise from the Star Trek film. So um, does anybody here know Jay a Abrahams who produced the, uh, the movies? Because I, I want to have a few words of him. Okay. So in the first movie he directed, there was a vessel called the USS Kelvin. Okay. And he blew it up in the first 10 minutes. In the second movie, there was the Kelvin Academy, which he also blew up in the first 10 minutes. So somebody's really got it in for me. So uh, I really appreciate it if you could leave something structurally up. So I'm a really big fan of Leonardo da Vinci. And um, I went to a collection of his artwork last year in London, 92 pieces at the National Gallery, fantastic. And when you think about what Leonardo da Vinci did back then, he was thinking about stuff that was centuries ahead of his time. I'm sure that everyone thought he was kind of odd. But you know, you can look around this audience and see lots of odd people. I'm sure I'm one of them. So Leonardo da Vinci was thinking about parachutes, helicopters, tanks, wings. But the engineering practicality wasn't there. The physics knowledge wasn't there to make those things come to reality. What are we doing today? We're talking about starships, some of which are centuries or even millennia into the future. So I think that the way I like to look at it is we are kind of like children of the Renaissance because we're following in the spirit of what Leonardo da Vinci was doing. And long may that continue. So a lot of our inspiration has come from science fiction and there are various science fiction authors in this room. I'm a big fan of Arthur C. Clarke and I got to meet him just once, and I was a friend of his brother Fred, who sadly passed away recently. Some of Arthur C. Clarke's works includes 2001 Space Odyssey, um, which I'm sure you've all seen the film, The Songs of Distant Earth, Rendezvous of Rama. There's been other fantastic authors, such as Robert Heinlein, um, Robert Forward, Gregory Benford. These are all fantastic pieces of work. Essentially what science fiction does is it enables us to describe plausible futures, okay? So you can think about the implications and the consequences if you build a civilization this way and what happens. And so it's enabling us to scope out the future possibilities. And so interstellar flight is very coupled to that problem. The 1968 film, 2001 Space Odyssey, was a real watershed moment for science fiction. Um, a lot of people weren't even interested in it, really enjoyed this film. And um, Clark was very keen on these spacecraft, these dumbbell-type shaped structures. 
Um, and he had a view that the payload needed to be separated from the nuclear power plant. And it's very similar to his areas in the, f in the book he wrote in 1951, um, the, the Sands of Mars. The British Interplanetary Society um, is the oldest space organization in the world, still in its original form, 1933. It's in its 80th year this year. And by the way, sorry to embarrass him, but we have um, Daedalus Royalty in the audience, okay? So this guy, Jerry, um, Jerry, could you stand up? This is Jerry Webb. He is one of the original Daedalus study designers, guys. So he's a good friend of Alan Bond and a council member of the BIS, so it's really great to have him here. So the BIS were thinking about stuff for years before others. This is a design for um, an astronaut on the moon that was published in 1950. Okay, it looks a bit metallic and kind of something that was medieval, but they were thinking about these sorts of things and publishing the papers. Arthur C. Clarke wrote a paper in 1950, Electromagnetic Mass Drivers on the Moon. Here's a story I really like. Jules Verne, 19, 1865, from Earth to the Moon. H.G. Wells, 1901, the first men in the moon. The BIS said, well, what does it really take to get to the moon? So they designed a lunar lander, okay? And they published it in 1938. This is their vehicle, the actual drawings from the report. And this is a rendition that David Hardy did um, at the 75th anniversary of the BIS, showing it with the background of Chesley Bonestell kind of mountings, because that's how we used to think the moon looked like before we got there and discovered it was just lots of lava planes and pretty smooth. Here's some of his other renditions of going to the moon. This is before Apollo, okay? So they were planting the seeds of feasibility that the going to the moon was credible. There were problems with the design, I won't get into that, but they did the best they could. Kind of Von Braun vision for the future that they were looking at. There's a dumbbell type spaceship in the background. Single stage to orbit space planes going up into space, building these huge structures. You need all of this in place before you can build enormous starships. One of the most exciting things that's happening at the moment is the development of single stage to orbit space planes, in particular Skylon reaction engines in London, in, in Oxfordshire. And this thing has the potential to bring down massively the cost to low Earth orbit if you can make it work. And the team have actually cracked the main engineering problem. But that needs to happen before you can build megaton structures in space. You need cheap, reliable access to Earth orbit. So let's think about, a bit about strategic roadmaps. So in 1996, there was a paper um, by John Anderson, a NASA chap, on the Horizon Mission methodology. And what he was thinking about is how do you extrapolate into the future? So he thought about, if you imagine a dark horizon, you can't see the future, but you can shine a flashlight into the future, and that essentially illuminates a particular part of it. That's like extrapolating into the future, taking today's technology and extrapolating forward. What he was talking about doing was imagining the impossible future that you want to create and work backwards from that future to actually create your roadmap, okay? And that's what I think is a credible way to move forward if you want to really make the starships happen. So you can kind of define um, a, a structured approach to the problem, defining your key system requirements, your key technology steps, and your missions which meet those criteria. So here's just an example I wrote up. Don't pay too much attention to the numbers. This is a, a starship, hypothetical, with its propulsion, power, habitats, infrastructure, fuel, and you want to emerge all of these capabilities to the level where the starship is possible. So you start off maybe with propulsion. And so maybe in the near future you say, we want to have 100 kilometers per second delta V capability, one kilo, um, kilowatt per kilogram specific power. And you want to get to the future where something like 30,000 kilometers per second delta V is possible, 10 megawatts per kilogram, because that's what you need for typical energetic starships, okay? And you define milestones in between. And you do something similar for power, so you talk about kilowatt systems up to um, terawatt um, power systems, and each one is a milestone in between. You do something similar to habitats, fuel utilization, infrastructure. Don't pay too much attention to the numbers. I made these up just as to illustrate the example. And so what you then do is you build in your phases. So phase one, for example, contains um, an element of each of those, the power, the propulsion, the habitat. And then you build mission capability scenarios that meet this criteria. So you say, okay, we're gonna go to Mars because Mars is a stretch goal for the propulsion technology, for the habitats. If you can do all that, that moves you to your level one milestone. And that's how you gradually move outwards towards the stars. And you go for a phase two approach up to phase five, where you get to a point where all of your capability is um, equivalent to what you need to go to the stars. So you build a roadmap. And so you have these parallel paths that you're pushing in reality, they wouldn't all necessarily be parallel because some would advance more than others. And of course, I'm just focusing on technology here, but there's lots of other issues to consider. 
So here's an example where in Project Icarus we looked at uh, building an interstellar roadmap. So what we decided was um, when the DARPA 2011 100 Starship Conference went ahead, they were talking about 2111 as the year to actually make the interstellar capable society possible. And so that's this date here. So what you've got is the pink lines is the, um, the manned craft and the blue lines is the robotic craft. And what we did is we decided that every 25 years you needed a new generation to be the stewards of the technology to make it happen. And we planned a whole raft of missions from 200 AU, 1,000 AU, 3,000 AU, 32,000 AU, right out to 272,000 AU, which is the nearest stars. And this kind of gives you a roadmap. And this is all linked to technology readiness levels. So you start off with your TRL 6 to 9, which you can do today or in the near future. And then your emerging technology, TRL 3 to 6. And then eventually your Envision technology, which is your one to three currently. So that would be maybe your warp drives, who knows. But you kind of progress along this scale and you build in your roadmap. There isn't many roadmaps that exist today for, for getting to the stars. And this is something that our community needs to be doing. Here's the stars, here's where we want, want to get to. Um, Alpha Centauri is, gets up all of our interest. This goes up to 20 light years. There's tens of stars there that we could potentially explore. Let's look at that. Here's a map of all the nearest stars. Let's say we wanted to colonize them. So this is a trajectory is going outwards from Sol, right out to um, BL Seti, Epsilon Eridani, and Tau Seti. So the rule here is you have to stop at each star. It's kind of like a game. And so what I did is I wrote a program um, that correctly cal calculates the trajectory distance between each one. So you need the right ascension and declination and so forth to actually do that. Okay, Almost turned my PowerPoint off. And so you, you end up with your different trajectories. So you're trying to colonize the local star system. And it takes a finite time. If you're traveling at 10% of the speed of light, as an assumption, it takes a finite time to get between each stars. And so you can look at how long it takes to start to colonize that system. So for example, to go from Sol to BL Seti, um, um, and then to Epsilon Eridani, Tau Seti, you're talking about a total distance of 12.96 light years. Um, and you're talking about 129 years if you don't stop at 10% of the speed of light. And if you're going to stop it up for 100 years at each point, because you're trying to colonize the system, you're talking about over 300 years. And so this is just a local net kind of network. And you could take this forward to trying to colonize all of those local star systems within that little bit of space. So eventually, you own this huge volume of uh, light years um, with a big transit crossing time. Maybe you set up your trade routes and so forth. So we're all kind of living out there and um, living off each other's uh, exports. Um, but this gives you an ownership of a total mass of about 10 to the power of 31 kilograms of the entire system, if you just look at the stars, and a total energy of about 10 to the 48 joules. This is what you could potentially own if you start to colonize that. But when you run the model on this sort of system to actually set up all your trade routes, it takes centuries. So there's the problem of getting to the first star, but it's the problem of actually becoming an interstellar capable society. Now, interstellar studies, I regard as having started around 1952. Um, there, are, there were some papers before, Sanger in 57, for example, but Shepard really was the first to look at the problem of interstellar flight from an academic point of view. And he sat down and he said, what does it take, velocity, energy, and he wrote this paper. And unfortunately, he died um, only a year ago. We, we're losing all these great people. There were other developments, of course. The Project Orion nuclear pulse system um, was a wonderful development, um, which required um, nuclear technology being detonated rearwards of the pressure plate. And um, these things were really limited. For something like atomic bombs, you're talking about 5% of the speed of light um, as a maximum performance. For hydrogen bombs, you're talking about 10% of the speed of light. So it's quite limited in terms of its performance. Um, but they really mainly looked at interplanetary vehicles, not interstellar. But Dyson did a bit of an interstellar work on it. Ensman starships. Um, there never used to be a proper um, decent design for the Ensman starship. And me, Richard Abusi, and Adam Crow last year wrote a paper, which we published in Jabez, actually trying to work out what the Ensman starship was. And we actually got in touch with Ensman, who's still alive. And this thing is like 9% of the speed of light. It has this huge deuterium powered sphere, which it mines from the gas giants. This habitat separates into three cylinders when it gets to the system. And it takes about um, 60 years to get to the nearest star. It starts off with 200 people on board. At the end of the mission, there's 2,000 people on board. So that's a really fun ship, OK? <laughs> So let's have the next conference on this ship. This is Daedalus, 1970s. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about what the Daedalus team really set out to do. Um, it wasn't to prove that fusion was the best way to get to the stars. That's not what they were doing. They were interested in the Fermi paradox, whether there's intelligent life in the universe. And they said, well, um, if can we even conceive of a machine that can go to the stars on paper? Remember the BIS Lunar Lander study in the 1930s? feasibility study, can you conceive of something on paper, and therefore laid the seeds for its creation. So that's what the BIS were doing. They sat down over five years and designed this vehicle. You've heard Robert Freeland's talk earlier about um, Daedalus and Shree's talk, so I won't talk much about it. 
But 12% of the speed of light um, gets to the Barnard star in sort of uh, 50 years or so, 50,000 tons of deuterium helium-3. Um, but in my opinion, they showed that interstellar travel was feasible in theory. And the thinking was, if you could design something like this at the outset of the space age, what could you do in hundreds of years from now? Therefore, interstellar travel was feasible. And so the solution to the Fermi paradox was not that interstellar travel wasn't feasible. That was the conclusion of the study. Okay? Everyone loves Daedalus. It's very inspirational. Here's just some artwork. Um, this one, I'm not sure what's going on. Because Daedalus was a peaceful scientific mission. And I think these must be the, the probes, the sub-probes coming out of it, but they look a bit like missiles. So, but if you're an alien civilization that's coming towards you, maybe you wouldn't know the difference. Okay. So in 2009, um, we started off actually in 2007, me and Richard Abusi um, had worked on a warp drive symposium together in London, um, reviewing our Kubia's work. And in 2009, we got together with Project Icarus. Um, Andreas Teolis was there, Richard Osborne. Um, there was Rob Swinney, Pat Gallia. Um, there was a bunch of uh, people that are in the team and have really been on this journey with us who were there at the beginning. And we decided to launch this Project Icarus, which had the purpose of really um, reawakening the vision of interstellar flight and also to redesign the Daedalus vehicle as a design exercise and to build on the progress that Daedalus had done to review their work and see if we could improve it. And you already heard the ex excellent MagSAL talk from Robert Freeland earlier, who's really um, moved on the subject from Bob Zubring. So we're making good progress. This is some of the Daedalus team. This is Jerry Webb, who's sitting in the audience. Alan Bonds at the back there. Um, Bob Parkinson. And all of these guys are watching what we're doing. They're really interested in what, what we're doing. But a lot of them are working on the SSTO problem. Um, Alan Bond, Tony Martin also worked on the Walsh ships designs in the 1980s. This is one of them, produced by Adrian Mann, who's this wonderful space artist you will keep hearing about. Um, I think he's one of the best space artists in the world. These things are like 200 kilometers length, 20 kilometers across. This cylinder at the back is an ocean. Okay, so that would be a fun place to be. We've had other developments like Bob Forward, who really like to think out of the box and say, well, do we really want to carry propellant? Is that the best way to get to the stars? So he was talking about microwave-driven systems. We had a, an excellent beam um, session yesterday. Um, but you know, these 50,000 tons frontal lens he was talking about to launch something that was only grams in, in terms of a payload to the stars, um, maybe hitting 20% of the speed of light, but entirely credible technology. Okay, and there's been a lot of work done since. The Bussard Ramjet, we had the wonderful talk earlier from Michael Minovich, and um, he's kind of stolen my piece, because I was going to talk a bit about this, um, so I don't need to tell you about interstellar ramjets now, because you're all experts. Um, but there's a lot of problems to point out about the interstellar ramjet. When it first came out, I was born in 1960, but when it was published, I think a lot of people thought, this is the solution to interstellar travel. Um, but there's problems with the drag that you're picking up through the interstellar medium. There's problems with the heating, as all these interstellar protons are hitting the coil. Um, and there's a few other problems. You need to get up to a high percentage of speed of light anyway before you can start to get sufficient um, influx of uh, hydrogen into that um, huge tunnel. But it was a great paper, and there's been a lot of other studies done since which are worth looking at. And I'll point out Al Jackson, who's also in the audience. We've got some of these pioneers here, which is great. So warp drive, the, um, you know, Star Trek's kind of ruined it for us, right? Because uh, we all love Star Trek, but it makes it look easy. And you need the warp drives in order to make the plots entertaining. Alcubia came along in 1994 and said, well, let's apply general relativity and produce this metric. And he described space-time and how it would actually work. And you had this explosion of papers, and it's fantastic. And we're going to hear a talk from Sonny White, I think, tomorrow, and to see how he's progressed on the field. But this is another thing we should be looking at, and putting it on an experimental platform is definitely the way to go, because ultimately, experiments is the test of any theory. And, you know, string theorists need to remember that. Okay. <laughs> So um, I have the pleasure of being the editor of JBIS, which is the oldest astronautical journal in the world, founded in 1934. And uh, these are the famous red covers, produced between 1974 and 1991. I was born in 74, so it shows how young I am. Um, and you know, it really has been the torchbearer, and particularly the BIS, of the interstellar vision for years. And I think it's wonderful that the BIS has been supporting a lot of these organizations, like I4IS, Icarus Interstellar, to basically help them push forward. The oldest space organization in the world, helping the youngest to move on to the next vision. And that's how you do it. There's been a lot of books published on interstellar. These are the main ones. The earliest I could find that was a proper credible treatment was 1965, um, which, okay, so let me just run through those. <laughs> 1965, James Strong. That's the earliest I've been able to find. And Greg Matloff told me that's the book that got him into the subject. Um, Greg Matloff's pioneered quite a few papers on the subject, of course. Um, we had the recent um, book um, by Mark Millison and Eric Davis on frontiers of propulsion science, Paul Gilson's and Tory Dreams, 
Um, I produced a book in 2011 which had the sole purpose of teaching me the subject. That's the only reason I wrote it, because I wanted to learn the subject. And so, um, Going Into Stella by Les um, Johnson, and we've got a Starship Century book which just came out recently. These are all fantastic, and the I I4S is producing our own book too. And we've got the emergence of these organizations, okay? And I've got a few websites here, Tau Zero, um, would have been go going for quite some years, I think since about maybe 2007 or so. Um, the British and Planet Society, the oldest, Icarus and Stella, who have organized this conference, I4IS. And we've got all of these other um, organizations that are, that are out there, Starship Century, TVIW, Global Starship Alliance, Star, Star Voyager. And it's so wonderful to see the grassroots community coming together to discuss the inter interstellar problem, because it's only by talking to each other that we're going to move forward. I want to give a shout out for this legend, Paul Gilster, who's in the audience, um, because he is writing these blogs, and I'm sure everyone in this room reads them. And could we give him a round of applause for his fantastic contribution? <laughs> so keep writing, Paul. You're doing a great job. So when you think about the interstellar problem, um, when we were looking at this in Icarus, um, we were thinking about where we've come from and where we're getting to. So we had all these historical projects, and then this was kind of Project Icarus-centric because we were thinking about ourselves. But you know, um, and then you kind of diverge into the future and where we want to get to. And there's kind of several things that need to happen in order to make the Starship happen. You need to capture all the knowledge that's been done to date so that people aren't repeating old work. Okay? So you need knowledge capture exercises. You need research support, grants, institutes, all in place, awards, comp competitions, training to, to train up the next generation. That's primarily what Project Icarus was about. Competitions. We've already had two competitions, the Black Sky Prize and the Alpha Suratori Prize being launched at this conference. Um, strategic and technological roadmaps. I've talked about that. Scientific tools, how many codes, numerical codes are there in the interstellar community? We saw the finite element modeling earlier, that's wonderful. The first masters in Starship design, prob probably. Fantastic achievement. Experimental validation, we've heard about Jim Benford's microwave dream cell work and a few solar cell experiments. Where's the rest? Let's get experimenting. And communication networks, where we're here, we're talking, that's where it starts. These are the sort of things we need to be pushing in order to build this community up as a viable proposition to make the stars happen. So in um, last year, in August of 2012, I started working at the Institute for Interstellar Studies, and we have three arms to it. There's an educational academy, and we just had four uh, master's students graduate with the International Space University in Strasbourg doing projects for us. And we've got a technical programs, um, which looks at launching lots of technical projects. We've got 10 so far, and we've got an enterprise spin-off, which looks at actually for-profit products, which can emerge to Starship, so individual technologies. We um, have an ambition to have a facility to bring you all together, like at this wonderful event. This is a concept we came up with early on, which is a pyramid structure. It was just a bit of fun, but the New York Times liked it. Um, this is a, an actual building we went and looked at uh, with an investor, which had potential to be a facility. So we are actively looking at these sorts of opportunities. We ha have been reading, uh, writing Principium, which is possibly the first ever uh, magazine of the interstellar community that goes global. And I hope you're reading it, enjoying it. If not, go to the I4S website and download it. We're on our sixth issue. And the team, which is edited by Keith Cooper, and the production is Adrian Mann, and we kind of work together, and our remit is to represent everyone. Okay, So to take a, an, an impartial viewpoint and just represent the community. That's what we're trying to do. We produce music albums. We've got a, an iPhone app, which is available on the iPhone store, I4IS. And we're producing a book, and we've got technical projects moving. That's the sort of things we're doing. Our latest product is a laser cell product, um, project called Project Dragonfly, which is named after Robert Forward's book um, from 1984, um, was it, Jim? When was it? About the time. So we couldn't call it Project, project um, Forward because Jim's already doing a Project Forward with Icarus and Stella on microwaves. So we're looking at laser cells. So my philosophy in this community, if someone's doing a good job on another project, why, why repeat? Why be redundant? So um, I want to see all of the options being pursued. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to work together cooperatively in that way. So Project Dragonfly aims to demonstrate laser cell propulsion theoretically and experimentally, um, and in particular from vacuum chamber tests on the ground right up to CubeSat architecture. And our ultimate ambition is to launch a probe past one light year. That's what we want to get to. The problem is the powers are enormous, um, even if you have small probes that are grams in size. We've also launched the Alpha Centauri Prize. Um, the, the Alpha Centauri Prize is a whole collection of prizes. We want to kind of repeat the Ansari X Prize. Um, so we're hoping that someone like Paul Allen will come along and say, hey guys, you know, you're doing a wonderful job, here's some money, let's get this moving, let's get these guys designing. We want to have teams around the world doing miniature project Icaruses. Ten teams every two years competing. Imagine after ten years of running that prize, that cycle, you would have a hundred 
reliable studies. And then you can truly say, if you go to the stars this way, this is what it takes. Because at the moment, we've only got one starship design in history, in my opinion, that's Project Daedalus, because it was a, a preliminary stroke detailed design in its integration level. Nobody else has integrated starships in the way that they did. So um, the particular prize we're launching at this meeting is the Progenitor Award for the best paper that has the most potential to impact interstellar studies in the next century. And I want to acknowledge Icarus Interstellar for sponsoring the $500 award for this. So it's wonderful. We're working together on that. So that's a little bit about the progress of where we are. I'm now going to try and think a little bit about flipping the coin on how we should think about designing starships. So we all think about the Tchaikovsky equation. This thing designed in, uh, derived in 1887, uh, although someone told me recently it was derived earlier. Um, by a British guy, I think. Um, that's always the way, right? I mean, these controversies. So, and by the way, the, the right flyer, no, I, I won't go that way, okay. So, um, so Konstantin Kirchhoff, 1887. This basically describes the natural logarithm of the mass ratio of your vehicle, multiplied by exhaust velocity of your jet, um, gives you your delta V. And I wanna look at propulsion from a different angle. So here, you've got energy along the, the, this, this axis, um, energy-driven designs, mass-driven designs, space-driven designs and time-driven designs. There may be some missing on here, and I apologize for those who have their little pet hobbies. Um, I want to think about how we've approached the rocket problem. So what we've done is we started off with this equation, the Tchaikovsky equation, and we said, well, let's try and get as much bang for our buck as we can possibly get, higher exhaust velocity. So you go through the solution space of chemical to electric, and nuclear fission, fragments, fusion, antimatter, pure photons, okay? You get to a point where you can't get any higher exa exhaust velocity, you hit your performance limit. Um, you can do tricks like staging and so forth. And then someone comes along and says, well, let's just leave the propellant at home. So we end up with our solar tower solutions. And but of course, that falls off of 1 over R squared. So you move into your beamer solutions, like your laser cells and your microwave cells. And so you've got all of these non-mass um, propellant systems, because you're leaving the source, energy source at home. And then somebody else says, well, OK, let's, uh, let's mine the energy as we're moving along on route. So we'll take a, a nice interstellar ramjet, pick up the interstellar hydrogen. That solves the problem. Um, and somebody else says, well, hey, there's vacuum energy. Let's mine that. Let's try and pick that up. Um, inertia drives, negative matter. So I call these space drives. And then we've got these wonderful time drives because they mess with space time. Okay? And that's what Sonny White's going to be talking about tomorrow. And um, you know, if they can make it work, fantastic. Black hole drives, Krasnikov tubes, all these sorts of things. What tends to happen in our community is most people will focus on one solution. Like, I'm interested in fusion, because I'm doing a PhD in ICF fusion, but there's other people that are interested in laser cells and so forth. Everyone's got their pet, pet hobbies. I would love to see some of these combined as hybrids. Let me explain. So the Tchaikovsky equation, let's just review very briefly how you derive that. So you start off with your Newton's second law. You equate that to your thrust of your system. That's proportional to your mass flow rate and your exhaust velocity. You're losing mass because you're throwing away propellants. So that gives you your negative dm by dt. And you equate these, the thrust in this equation, and you then integrate um, with respect to dm and dv, and it out pops your Tchaikovsky rocket equation. All nice and simple, OK? Now, in that particular model, you have no external forces. Of course, if you're launching from the Earth up into space, you have gravity, you have aerodynamic drag. Those are external forces which you have to consider. In this model, we've ignored it. So let's think about external forces. So I'm going to call them F1 and F2, OK? So you run through that um, cycle again of deriving your equation, including your um, force terms, your Newton's second law, dm, dm, uh, m dv by um, dt for each term. And you include that, you integrate, you'll get your external force terms. Now, the way we think about the rocket problem, the space-time problem, I should say, not the rocket problem, is we think Tchaikovsky, or kind of non-Tchaikovsky. And I think, I was thinking about the Tchaikovsky equation. I was thinking, well, actually, if you think about the, uh, the mass ratio, if the mass ratio is unity, the logarithm is zero. Okay, and now from a physics point of view, you would say your, the ap applicability of the equation is outside of its domain. Okay, from a mathematician's point of view, you might say it's broken down. Okay, so this told me that essentially what you've done is you've got a, 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 a finite value problem. You started off with your initial conditions that you've put into the problem. You've, you haven't got a general function, you've got a particular function, a particular solution, and that's what the Tchaikovsky equation is. But actually, um, there is a general solution, which we don't know what it is, which would describe all of the problems of space-time motion. Okay? Now, in theory, you could say that's the ground unified theory of the universe. Okay? So it's a kind of intractable problem. But maybe what you could start to do is to think about combining some of these solutions. Instead of, say, fusion, lasers, etc., maybe you could start to combine them in parallel. So here's, for example, the equations for solar cell systems. So the radiation pressure of a solar cell is proportional to its reflectivity and the solar pressure. You go through this with your cell loading, uh, mass over the area, characteristic acceleration, integrate to get what your delta V1 term is. So that's your 
um, delta V velocity from your solar cell. Do the same for a laser cell. You end up with an equation um, for, this, for the laser cell, which is proportional to the power um, and the reflectivity, and you end up, again, you integrate. So what I'm essentially saying is, um, rather than just considering a rocket system in isolation or a laser cell system in isolation, why not combine all of these solutions into one kind of vehicle? So you end up with a delta V that's equal to your jet solution plus your solar cell plus your, your laser cell. Now what would such a thing look like? Maybe it looks something like this. Don't pay too much attention to it. I'm not claiming it's a design. It's just a cartoon. Okay, so what you essentially got is something that has a jet coming out of it, um, and it has a, a solar cell maybe around the outside concentric ring which pushes it and it gets so far and then a laser cell switches on once you get past your 1 over r squared limit and so that thrusts it forward. So now what's the advantage of this? I was thinking about telescopes, okay, you've got the refractor, you've got the um, reflector and they have disadvantages and advantages but then you've got the catadioptric, the smith cassegrain type telescopes which have all the advantages of both but none of the disadvantages. When we're trying to push a particular propulsion technology and we hit the limit of diminishing returns and performance, um, maybe if you started to combine some of these hybrid solutions, you would increase your design space options, and you could start to find new optimums and new trade-offs, okay? Where instead of having 50,000 tons of propellant, but with a large payload, or um, a tiny little 10 grams laser um, thing, maybe you started to combine some of them, you would find new, new trade-offs, um, which would make the problem more realizable. So that's a new perspective I'm coming at the problem from. Let me give you some examples of how this might work. So, how much time I got? 70, that's wonderful, great, I can slow down. <laughs> okay. I started with 78 slides, I got it down to 70, and then I got it down to 60, and I, it was painful deleting them. Um, so let's, let's, let's slow down a little bit. So Project Orion was this wonderful nuclear pulse-driven system. Okay. Um, Stanley saw Ulam, Ted Taylor, 1947 or so, came up with the idea originally. And then we had um, the Freeman Dyson, Ted, Ted Taylor worked later on, um, actually advancing it as Project Orion. There's some fundamental limitations to Ryan, apart from the fact he's huge in mass, and they only looked at an interplanetary version. The ISP of the system is limited by two main factors. The first is you're throwing your units, as they call them, out the back, and they detonate, and they explode. But the angle that you subtends limits the amount of momentum that you can impart to the vehicle. The second limitation is that you have these huge shock absorbers, and they have to expand and contract as the vehicles move along, and they also limit the specific impulse. Now, there was this guy called Stan, um, John Dal Solem in 1994 who published a few papers um, on something called the, um, the Medusa cell. Everyone heard of that? Wonderful concept. You should look it up. Essentially, what he did is he combined a kind of cell concept with a, a nuclear rhyme. What he said is, well, let's actually take our spacecraft and let's deploy a huge spinnaker cell. There's a canopy. And let's throw the, throw the units out the back and they detonate into the canopy. And essentially, you're your specific impulse is proportional to your area of your canopy. So your specific impulse is not so limited. And also you can design the length of this, this spinnaker line as much as you want. So this, the John Dal Salem solution, which is also interesting from a deceleration point of view, I'm looking at a Project Icarus, is kind of a hybrid solution. It's a different way of thinking of the problem of moving Project Orion forward. Um, here's another example. So. Um, there's people who are interested in black hole engines, and I think those are fascinating ideas. Um, and we heard about the interstellar ramjet, and the, the main problem with the interstellar ramjet is you've got this interstellar hydrogen, um, which comes into this huge um, funnel, and interstellar hydrogen has a terribly small cross section, so it's very difficult to fuse it. And also all of these protons are coming in, and they're building up heat, and it's very difficult to try and moderate that to a point where you can react it. And so Alan Bond did some work on that in the 1980s, Ram aug augmented interstellar ramjet where he would moderate those protons. But here's another solution to combining a black hole engine with um, something like um, the interstellar ramjet. So what happens is you take those, um, the protons that are coming in, and basically um, it requires a leap of faith, as physics likes to make assumptions. It requires that there are more than three spatial dimensions. So now I'm a fan of string theory. Okay. And what happens is the, two, the seven TeV protons come in and they collide. Now, if there are more than three spatial dimensions, this changes the Schwarzschild radius um, for the collapse of those protons. And essentially, you would have Hawking evaporation instantaneously, okay, within like 10 to the minus 24 seconds, really rapid. And this would produce a whole emission of, of charged particles. And the idea is that you don't really care um, what's happening to those protons coming. You don't need to capture them and moderate them slowly. They just come in and they just collide and annihilate and they produce a lot of charged particles. Now there's lots of efficiency issues which might make this difficult to work. Um, but this is, this is, I call this a black hole evaporator engine. But the idea is to combine solving the interstellar ramjet problem with a breakthrough propulsion physics idea. It's just a new way of thinking about the problem. 
Okay, so in my last couple of slides, I can't believe I'm ahead of time. This is unreal. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the interstellar motivation, okay, um, and why I think um, a couple of things that really get me excited about the interstellar studies. Um, so here we've got the Enterprise again rising out of the ocean. Um, so I was a massive fan of R.C. Clarke, and I was really sad when he passed away. As I say, I was really glad to actually have met him um, just the once, and uh, that was enough, quite honestly, and I'm sure there are people here who got to meet the guy. Um, Arthur C. Clarke was really interested in the future evolution of humankind, and you can see that in his science fiction work like Charles at End um, and some of the other novels he wrote. And one of the things he talked about was the possibility that humans are in fact not the ultimate aim of biology. Okay? He called it Homo electronicus that humans can actually evolve to something that's full-blown artificial intelligence, that we would become something else. And he, you can read his quote here, but one of the ideas he proposed was, we talk about robotic spacecraft, we talk about um, manned spacecraft, and that came up at a panel session yesterday. And people were thinking this or that. But actually, in the future, when I say in the future, I mean possibly centuries down the line, the definition of what it means to be human um, is gonna change, okay, because we're already, integrating with our technology on a fundamental level. You know, you, you get in a car, you're driving a car, you're dependent upon that, you have an iPhone. All of these things, are, we are integrating with technology, we're converging with it, and there's no reason to think that won't continue. What if in the future you could completely download yourself into a system, you could completely understand the, the anatomy of the human brain, and you could download your consciousness? Not only could you send the starship to the stars, you could be the starship. Okay, you could experience what it's like to be a starship. And this is one of R.C. Clarke's ideas, and I think it's a very powerful vision, very exciting. What it means for us, of course, is um, a different question, because um, we don't want to lose our humanity. But it, you could flip the question and think about other life in the universe, and whether they've evolved to full-blown AI and sort of transcended in the same way, and therefore, are they out there? And what do they think of us? Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he gave a lecture recently, and he was saying that um, human beings are like 1% difference in our, in our DNA from the apes, okay, for the, that we um, share a biological line with. What if, and look at the difference in our mentality and our consciousness and our ability to do things and engineer things. What if there was a species that was only 1% more intelligent than us? Think how grand that species would be. And then somebody that was 10%. So maybe we're, maybe we're just like entertainment to them, you know, we're, we're kind of struggling around with our, oh, let's just design the starship. Um, but I'm sure that, I hope that they think we, there's a lot of optimism for us, you know, when we get together at meetings like this. So the last thing I wanted to talk about um, is motivations. Now, you can talk about um, why go to the stars? Why do you want to do interstellar travel? And you can say, well, five billion years, the sun's going to die. So we need to find some real estate that's outside the solar system. Or you can say there's economic reasons for going to space. We can um, space utilization, find new minerals and so forth. You can say we want to make discoveries in science and we want to go places and explore, find life, intelligent life. There's all these kinds of reasons. And I was thinking about that before I came out here and I was thinking, why am I doing starship research? Why have I been involved in all these wonderful organizations, the British Interplanet Society, Tau Zero, BIS, Icarus and Stella, I4IS, um, all these groups that are trying to make this thing happen. And I was thinking actually there's a much more personal motivation for me. Um, there's kind of two reasons. One is related to my interest in intelligent life and also science fiction, which I find inspiring. But the other is, um, when I was a young man, um, I was, um, you know, didn't have a lot of hopes for me. I was um, kind of not doing so well at school. And I went into a, a museum in Northern England, um, in Staffordshire. And it's in a museum that usually has artifacts on Josiah Wedgwood pottery, okay? And they had an exhibit on Project Apollo. And uh, it was kind of unusual for a museum like that. And I figured out recently, it must have been 1989, because that would have been the 20th anniversary of the, of the moon landing, so I was 14 at the time. And I went in there, and there was these newspaper clippings of um, President Kennedy's speech, and there was an Apollo lunar lander mock-up, there was a spacesuit, and it, it, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. It was like, wow, this is amazing. These, these guys, okay, in this case, you, you Americans over here, you said, we're gonna go to the moon, we're gonna do it in 10 years, and you actually went there. That is empowering, that is inspiring. And I recently gave lectures at NASA Glenn and, and NASA Marshall, and I actually had the first opportunity to thank them for inspiring me as a young man. Now, why it's related to this is because it took my life on an entirely different trajectory. I don't know where my life would be if I wasn't so inspired by Project Apollo. 
And, and so I kind of got infused by the idea of the Starship and trying to merge the industry that the Starship is necessary to make it all happen. And it's because of that change in my trajectory. So I started to think about why do the Starship? What is the power of the Starship? Now, some people have the argument that let's not pursue the Starship now. Let's, uh, we need, we've got a lot of problems on Earth. There's a lot of inequality on Earth. There's a lot of um, poverty. There's a lot of conflicts. You know, we need to get humankind harmonized first before we start to think about doing energetic, ambitious things like the Starship. No, I completely disagree. Okay? We are um, a civilization that is industrious. Uh, we like to move forward and pioneer things. I think that the development of the technology of the Starship does three things. It's three, first, second, and third order effect to it. The first order effect is that it enables you to build up your space capability and actually do stuff, like make discoveries in science, okay, and explore the universe, increase our knowledge about the universe. The second thing it does is it helps you to develop technologies which can be applied to solving the problems on Earth, okay, such as the poor resource distribution. Imagine if we had a fusion reactor that could power cities, okay, and the, the developing world had them as well. We could solve a lot of problems overnight. Clean energy, that would be amazing. It may take us more decades to get there, but that's an amazing spin-off application. And why are there all these people in this room saying, let's do a fusion engine this way? Maybe they're going to make that discovery that has a spin-off application. But there's a third order effect to development of the Starship, which is a social cultural one, because it goes back to my story. There are kids out there in the world who will hear about this amazing people that are talking about crazy starships and the search for intelligent life and fusion engines and laser cell beams. And I think, wow, that's awesome. Physics is awesome. Biology and, and medicine is all awesome. You guys are doing some great stuff. And they'll be inspired. And no matter what's going on around them, no matter what their situation is, um, and I know people in Africa and India um, who I work with who are inspired and they're building stuff in their back garden. And they want to pioneer that future because they're inspired. And it raises them out of their circumstances. It makes them want to get an education and be better than their circumstances would have let them be. And so um, that is the third order effect of the Starship. And over time, I think that will produce a more scientifically literate population on the Earth, a more harmonious culture, because people start talking with each other. And I think that will solve a lot of the social cultural problems as well. Um, so that's the end of my lecture. And thank you very much for staying with me. Do we have time for one quick question? Yes, in, in Thank back. you very much. A anyone else? Yeah, over here. Yes. The infrastructure problem uh, is going to be more immense than uh, we all might think it might be. Uh, say, for example, uh, it's okay, you can build a machine, but how do you get it there? How, who's going to uh, teach us how to navigate? We don't have the same um, stepping stones that the earlier ocean pioneers had of one generation teaching the next generation, teaching the next generation how to navigate. So I think that's an excellent question, and to me, the most important thing is education. Um, I was thinking about, um, in the past, you had the clipper ships on the oceans, and when we got to the moon, that was like a radical, um, massive scaling up in our capability. We were, had the clipper ships on the oceans, and we talked about going to the moon. I think the interstellar problem is similar. We've been to the moon, sizzling in the space, we want to go to the stars. It's a similar problem. The, the thing that solves that, you need your roadmaps, um, and you need people that are capable of putting those together. Um, but you also need um, to include people in that journey, and the best way to do that is education, because we need physicists, we need biologists, we need engineers, and this will all start to um, put it together. But in terms of navigating, um, you clearly need leadership, okay? And the leadership is here. This is the potential for the leadership in this room. All of these people in this room have the capability, the potential to actually make the starship happen in the next century. Um, but what you've absolutely got to do is bring the next generation in. Um, one of the things I would hope for this Starship Congress we might have in future years is maybe we could have um, some kids coming along, right? And some sessions with some kids. That would be wonderful. And then when they're our age and they're organizing conferences and we're sitting at the back, um, slightly great and, uh, you know, it hardened in our ways, we can... Um, be proud of their achievements, and they can take it on to the next generation. And Project Daedalus, Project Icarus, you know, we, we're picking up from their steps, and we want others to do the same. And that's the only way Interstellar is going to happen, generational progress. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Long, for that very dynamic speech. Our next talk is by Dr. Armin Papazian, who is the founding chairman and CEO of Kuiper, a boutique financial modeling and consulting firm, and the founding CEO of the International Space Development Hub. After earning his PhD in financial economics at the University of Cambridge, UK, he assumed a number of, e of academic positions in the Middle East while also a research associate at the Cambridge Business School. In 2006, he embarked on a career that led him to achieve capital market history in the Middle East, first as a consultant, then as a managing director of innovation and development at the Dubai International Financial Exchange. Dr. Papazian led the launch of the Middle East's first structured products platform with Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, and Merrill Lynch, simultaneously listing 14 products and launching online trading. He has also led the creation of the region's first tradable bond and Sukuk indexes, which HSBC, and the first fungible dual listing with the U.S. exchange in the region. He then assumed the role of head of Islamic finance for a UBS AG with global and cross-business mandate, serving wealth management, assets, asset management, and the investment bank. He started his own venture, Kuiper, in 2010 with clients in a variety of industries from oil to aerospace, property, fashion, and space. Serving startups, government agencies, large corporate corporations, foundations, and individuals. In 2011, he was invited to act as judge for the FT Investment Banking Awards. And now I'd like to present Dr. Armin Papazian speaking on money mechanics for space. Dr. Papazian. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, for uh, this invitation and the honor to be speaking for a, to a crowd like this. I'm honored and privileged to be here. Uh, I may be the only economist, I think, in the room. I don't know if there are others. Please speak up and express uh, your opinions and disagreements, if any, uh, or agreement, uh, if you are in agreement of what I'm about to present. Um, what I'm about to talk to you about is, first of all, uh, this is how we are, and this is where we are right now. <laughs> this is the center of the galaxy, and this is us. Pretty much all of us, even in this room. Uh, not because, and I'm not referring to your techni technical genius here. I know you can see a lot more. I know you can uh, get into the magic of subatomic particles or land curiosity on, curiosity on Mars or or in one way or another. But because of our financial and monetary infrastructure on Earth in space, because we already are in space, is where we have a huge evolutionary bottleneck. And I'm not sure that we actually um, address it as often and, uh, and in the, the level of assur assertion with which we need to address these topics. I don't think we are actually there yet, and I believe this is the beginning. Now, why are we in this position, really? We heard some incredible thing, things from Kelvin. I think it was a fabulous start, and I'm so happy to be following him in the presentation. This is the NASA budget as a percentage of the federal budget. Um, the trend is quite apparent. I don't have to discuss it. If you count in inflation as well and all the rest of it, you know pretty much where this great country and also the country that has achieved the uh, moon landing and, and, and other great feats within space, this is the trend. Recently, NASA had to cut its education and outreach budget. I'm sure you've heard about that. Now, my argument, my very simple one-line argument is the following, that we are the inventors of money and our financial imagination is as important as our technological imagination when it comes to extend our reach into the cosmos. Now, where are we living now? We're living debt crises, austerity measures, um, cuts, furloughs, Detroit in bankruptcy, and so on and so forth. The species is going 
through some form of financial monetary uh, anxiety. We don't know what the hell is going on. A lot of people have no idea what's going on, but they still pay the price. But the issue, what is it that we face? The first thing is, we have to make a very clear distinction from this understanding of what we are and where we are into this one. Where do you wake up? Here or here? When you put your feet down from your bed, when you look at your computer, when you read your friend's paper on propulsion, where are you? Here or here? Every split second, you are in a bed of stars. We are in a bed of stars. And that applies to our own biology, as, a, as well as our physics, but also our finance and economics. Now, what's this trick about money? Do you see all these little colorful things that we call countries, the, this mosaic of the political map we've been struggling with uh, for so many centuries, or at least a couple of centuries, at least in the current shape? And these countries are like monopoly games. 3D in space monopoly games. Each one of them prints something that you work for, for which we dedicate time, energy, and a host of other things. They print a paper. It's actually not paper. Money is made out of 75% cotton and 25% linen. Because if it was made out of actual paper, it wouldn't last until the end of the day. And that's why if you wash your money by mistake, it doesn't get ruined because it's a piece of clothing that you carry around, <laughs> literally. Now, these are samples of these pieces of clothing people use around the, around the planet, intently motivated and de determined to make more of them. And yes, because we, are, we have based our socioeconomic infrastructure on this type of banknote, which is cotton and linen, really. This is the Mongolian one. I'm showing things that you haven't seen. And this is a special edition. <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, no, really. I mean, the, reason, the, the reason I show this now here is because what you see here is very important. Not every currency, not every structure has this type of transparency as the American Federal Reserve System. I mean, not transparency in the way it actually states what it is. That's another issue whether people actually understand. That's another issue. But the bottom line is that we are actually told what this thing is here. What does it say? It says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Now, why is this so important? And I'm going to start with the balance sheet of the Bank of England, because that's really pretty much where we should start. I think because a lot of things have started there in the first place. And the balance sheet of the Bank of England issued department 2010 shows you something very, very simple. How much, how many, how much pounds, notes have they issued, dollar worth? And what have they backed it with from an accounting sense? Now, they printed in 2010 at some point, um, financial statement 2009 and 10, 50 billion, 50 billion uh, pounds worth of, of currency. But what is it backed with? Securities of or guaranteed by British government, other assets including those acquired under, it doesn't matter, this is still based on other government securities. And what does it mean? What it's backed with is actually government debt. Look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet, US Federal Reserve. This is, these are the dollars printed, Federal Reserve notes in circulation, cotton and linen. How many billions? Here they are. What are they backed with in the, uh, in the asset side by majority, by US Treasury securities, which, are, which is American public debt? You have 16 trillion of it, by the way. And it's a limit. You have a $16 trillion limit live, and what does it mean? It means that the federal government, the US government cannot borrow. It's basically the limit how much can the United States government is authorized to borrow. 
Now, this is the limit how it shows. This is from the US Treasury. But the reason I'm showing you this is I'm going to come back to this stuff a bit later. But what I want to show you really is that in the process of money creation, government debt is the ze ground zero of money creation. It starts, the, the creation of money in the system is created by a, a paper-based electronic accounting exchange between two arms of the state, the central bank and the government. The central bank prints the money, the cotton and linen, and the government prints the debt which, which are exchanged for each other on the balance sheet of the Bank of England, as you saw, and therefore the printed paper, the piece of clothing, becomes money in circulation. Then, how does it grow? It grows via debt again. Now, your debt and mine. And business debt, corporate debt, municipality, municipalities, agencies, everyone's debt, all of us. And it grows via a multiplier, which is basically a credit multiplier. Do you know who is responsible for this? The banks outside the Federal Reserve, everyone else. All the other banks grow the money supply by borrowing, uh, by, by lending to us. Every time you go to the shop and you use your credit card, you think you're buying, but you're actually signing not for your purchase, you're signing for your debt. So you actually create that $150 machine that you bought, you put your credit card in, but you created that money on that, at that second by the agreement to pay it back. That, that money didn't exist in the money supply until you decided to put your hand in your pocket, give it to the cashier, and then sign the sheet. Thus, you created money supply. And that's why the banks are key. So government debt is at the core of the monetary system we have built for ourselves. And the government debt levels have been growing over many, many decades. But over the 2008 crisis, 2008 and 9 and 10, they just shot up in, in, in unbelievable ways, creating huge strain on government finances, mainly because governments intervened to help the banks, which is quite ironic, actually. They did everything possible, even to the point of injecting capital into banks, nationalizing them, selling them, and so on and so forth. But by 2011, once the banks had gone over this crisis, we had the second chapter, Act Two. Now the banks said, hold on, governments, You've got so much debt, there is not enough growth. How are you going to pay it back? Well, you're going to have to cut budget because otherwise we'll cut your credit rating and you won't be able to borrow again. That's very neat for people who were just saved by the same people that actually they're trying to downgrade. But unfortunately, governments are the victim of the same monetary architecture because governments cannot actually print the paper, they actually create money via their own borrowing, which is the same thing with you and me. Now, this is an example, again, it's the UK money stock 54, this was later in 2011. You can see that there is a, a $54.3 billion cash in coins, and yet the money supply is $2,152 billion. The difference between the actual amount of cash and coins and the actual money supply is achieved via the creation of deposits, monetary deposits, which are the loans that banks give and enter the digits in your account because you've just signed a, le a loan agreement, a debt agreement. Just like the central bank and the government, debt, money, you and I are in the same equation. The moment we sign the debt contract, we create the money. Okay, I'm gonna have to be quicker, I guess, but this is basically zeros and ones. Money is zeros and ones. 75% cotton and 25% linen. Debt and credit based, expands via banking system, co-created by central bank, banks and government. Government, because without the government debt, that equation of money creation cannot happen. Now recently, one of the other things that governments okay thank you one of the other things that governments have done is that in response to this crisis what they did is that they started injecting money on the one hand into the banks that's the job of the central banks while governments are cutting budgets so you have bank lending in the UK which have all been negative throughout the last couple of years going down growth rates 
and then you have unemployment rates going up, and then governments come up with a very smart, insightful policy called austerity measures, which is pretty much saying, basically, <laughs> we've got no other option. That's pretty much literally what they're doing. Now, austerity measures sovereign debt crises in the galaxy. When the state is the creator of money, when the sovereign is the creator of money, when you and I are the creators of money, sitting in a bed of stars, scratching our head, getting indebted, figuring out what's going wrong. And the system, this little corner here, sitting here, and Kelvin was wondering what these other guys may be thinking about us. I think they're laughing, <laughs> their heads off. They said, these guys don't even realize where they are. Sleeping and waking up in the bed of stars and yet borrowing their way into, into the ground instead of investing themselves into space. And this is our true context. And this context is denied in our monetary architecture because we're driving the whole thing upside down. Now, what can we do and what's the real problem? The problem with backing money by debt instruments, I mean, a debt instrument is a, is a contract, is a legal debt contract, as you, have, as you know when you signed your mortgage. Every other financial instrument is a contract. But what, when you create money by backing it with instruments that are debt-based, what you do is that you chain the species to calendar time. Billions of individuals, families, households, universities, governments, municipalities, agencies, corporations, they're all in debt. And they're all bound by their monthly payments because if they don't, they go bankrupt. What, ha what that means is that they lose the whole, start, the whole point of why they started that venture in the first place. And so they get stuck. And we get stuck in a framework that I can only describe as rodent economics. Now, I'm going to try to get quicker, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump to questions section if I don't have time because I really want to finish this. So what's the challenge for the century? I believe the challenge for the century is to choose between an abundance economics versus a scarcity economics. Because what we can really do, and our systemic challenge in this country, is to create the science and the technology to transform the debt limit into a wealth floor. And this philosophical transformation will liberate us from the illusions of debts, which are self-inflicted in the middle of a gigantic cosmos. Is this the solution? Burn the debt? No. Because there are billions of humans whose livelihood today depends on the system we have so ignorantly supported over many decades. We're not doing this to create more pain, we're trying to make change that actually there's less pain. So this is no go. We're going to have to be more ingenious than that and we're going to have to keep our word. But what are we going to do about these guys? Occupy Wall Street occupy this, occupy that. Well, we really have to occupy ourselves with something interesting to do, and I think going to the stars is no better thing to do, really. And that is what motivates, and that we can do. What, how we're going to do it is by creating money by a public investments rather than public debt. And then investing in, the, in our youth and our children and their education. Just be careful what they're studying, though, because economics, and finance, oh well, we've got huge problems. It's these sciences, in my opinion, are at such levels of infancy, it's like they're almost blind. Look, the first thing economics students learn, your 18-year-old son and 18-year-old girl who are just, you know, inspired with life, ready to take on anything and learn what this amazing experience is about, they walk into their first macroeconomics class and they were taught scarcity. Everything is scarce. We are rational beings. Everything is scarce. So what does that mean? Well, this is the system we create. Scarcity where? 
And that's the difference. Economists, when they look down, they look, they see their kitchen floor, they see the carpet, but they don't realize that just about further down, if they were, they allowed their mind's eye to go beyond what they physically see, they will see some upside down people on the other end and some more stars underneath. So where is that scarcity that this science is teaching our kids? Where is it? The other problem, and the key issue, of course, is that I said, scarcity has become the framework of our cognitive way of thinking in economics. And even it has translated into our own lives as to what, how we make our decisions. And basically, the key issue on the economics front is the starting point of scarcity as a projection, as a human projection. The next one in finance, and I, I, now you can see why I had this picture in the beginning, but the second problem with the finance, not economics, is that finance is built on two principles of value, risk and return and time value of money. There is absolutely no reference to space. Because finance cares only about the mortal investor. Because every financial model we have tries to measure the profitability of future cash flows. And who else but the mortal investor cares about the profitability of cash flows? How about the unmortal, immortal being and its impact in space? Who's going to take care of that? Well, I have introduced a new valuation metric which I call space value of money. And it basically measures the aggregate net asset impact of our cash flows and our actions, such that the value of an investment is not just derived by the net present value, our ROI of the, the, the person putting the money, but also by the ownership and the profits that that cash flow will create on our path. Now, the proposition I have, and this is the solution to the problem and the crisis, and this is what I was referring to yesterday about the Federal Reserve issuing. This is the instrument I propose, which is public capitalization notes. What they do, public capitalization notes, is very simple. They are issued by government treasury or issued by an agency sponsored by the treasury. They, per they are directly purchased by the Federal Reserve. But the structure of the instrument is such that it shares ownership, risk and profit, income creating, value generating investments into real economy immediately. There is no intermediation between the new money invented by the Federal Reserve and our economy. Because right now there is, right now it's the banks. And without the banks, that money will not actually create what we need to actually uh, transform the situation and achieve a recovery. Now, macro PCNs do a number of things. They channel the money as income. They create employment, investment, consumption, tax revenues, deposits. They are good for welfare. And eventually, they have a monetary impact as well as a real impact without additional debt, without reliance on credit. Inflation, I'm sure you're going to, the first reaction is inflation. Uh, what's going to happen if we print too much money? Uh, you know, that's a, well, they're printing too much money by the tons every day. Money is created by the billions every day. It's just that it's under the veil of scarcity so that it's available via debt. Because otherwise, you wouldn't borrow it if you knew it was abundant, would you? Now, alternative tools of money creation, I go back to the Bank of England balance sheet. If you look at the Bank of England balance sheet, there's one line which I did not stress on, and it's called deposit with banking department. So look, this is very neat. Bank of England has two departments, issue department, banking department. The issue department creates, prints the paper, and then balances it with either, uh, well, government debt, and then almost half of it is just a deposit in the other branch of the same bank. I mean, if, if money can be created in such form, we can definitely use PCNs to create money. And now this is the ultimate thing. Since September 2012, Federal Reserve announced, in September 2012, the Federal Reserve announced QE3. They're going to put 40, they started with 40 billion, they've been putting 85 billion a month of new money. 
This is a new way, a new way of creating money into the system. Not government debt, because governments are over budget already and they can't borrow, so they're buying bank debt, bank instruments. And this specific scenario is very challenging, because what do mortgage-backed securities really do? Well, mortgage-backed securities, when the Federal Reserve buys mortgage-backed securities from the banks, it's giving the banks new reserves, taking away their toxic assets, whatever they have created, and gives them new money, takes the instrument out. This can only become spending and income for you and me if it's borrowed. Because if it's not borrowed, that money will stay in the bank and will only improve bank balance sheets which is what's happening now. And then, while they invest in, inject the money into the banks, it comes out as new debt, which means some more debt payments to the same guys we're trying to pay our debt, current debts back to. It's ironic. Public capitalization notes do this in a different way, but achieve the target desired. Public capitalization notes channel, channel the newly injected money from the Federal Reserve directly into the economy as spending, new income, projects, expenditure. No one has to borrow that money for that money to become immediate expenditure in the economy. This one then creates new deposits because all those engineers that we fired, we're just hiring them again. All the scientists we left on the street, we're hiring them again. So they, have, they can pay back their debts, they can put new deposits, and you're back to square where you started. Banks have new reserves. The money is always going to come back to the banks. It's just that it's a different route. This one goes Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve mortgage-backed securities in the banks, and this is where it's stuck. It's a black box. That's why it's a black box. And this one, and, and basically, this one goes to the people, to the economy, to our own evolution, to industrial projects, to space. I'll give you the example a little bit later. And then it comes back again, but actually it has the time and the opportunity to impact our economy before it gets back into the banks. And my proposition is to you, all of you here, all the organizations and everyone remotely in any way involved in, in, in this process, is that we can allocate 40 billion of the monthly 85 billion that the Federal Reserve has been printing every month and printing, not physically printing, because they were just giving them new digits not new cotton and linen. So what they do is that they allocate just for one month 40 billion, not the whole thing, half, even less than half of what they're injecting into the banks. They can inject it into NASA so that we can actually create the technologies all of you are thinking about, inject the money into research projects that are going to serve our evolution, and not have to rent seats in other people's rockets or actually give up the moon. And so I believe strategically this country can allocate about $2 trillion over the next five years via a PCN program into space development. Remember, they just injected about a couple of trillion into the banks and nothing has happened. Don't, don't be fooled by the numbers. Now, and let me, a couple of, words about the banks themselves. Now we are giving 85 billion, and we, I say we as humans, even though it's none of us is involved in the process, I'm pretty sure, but we as humans, we are tolerating this specific injection of 85 billion dollars into the banks, while the banks are being, look at these titles, swaps probe finds banks rigged rate at expense of retirees. Banks replacing Enron in energy inside Congress as abuses abound. abound. B Bank of America Barclays sued by Houston for LIBOR manipulation. Give them another 85 billion, please, because they're doing such a great job. <laughs> Come on. And cut the NASA education budget because who needs it? What we will we do with the 40 billion? We get together and we win a 99-year lease for a 100-year roadmap in Hangar 1, Moffett Field, and we build a starship the way we think we should. Here it is. It's an official request for proposal due 16th of October. 
And we started this in June 2012. Pro an unsolicited proposal went to NASA with the transit of Venus on June 6. And the other thing we can do is actually build a starship, as I told you, and build a healthy home. I think what Kelvin said is so true. I mean, all this technological win, and everyone has been saying over the last couple, over the last yesterday and today, all this technological knowledge and uh, the ability to create it will actually have a huge impact on our future. So final, final message to you, we can afford to create and spend as much money as necessary to invent our future in space. We must embrace this enormous molecular universe as our own true and palpable context for now and the foreseeable future. And we must transcend debt-based money and drop scarcity as an economic worldview to unlock the resources of our galaxy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Papazian, for that very insightful talk. Our next speaker is Christopher Weimer from the Washington Engineering Institute, and his talk is Using Game Mechanics to Increase Funding and Improve Public Knowledge. Mr. Weimer. Christopher Weimer, and for as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be an explorer, an adventurer. As a child, I would go back in time in search of dinosaurs. I would dive to the bottom of the ocean in search of strange sea creatures, and I would explore distant planets and alternate realities looking for new and exciting life forms and I'd usually make a home in time for dinner. Now, as an adult, I fulfilled this need for adventure in other ways. Books, video games, movies, but they never really give the same satisfaction as playing did as a child. As an adult, I have a stronger craving for my adventures to be real and to matter. Pretend is okay, but reality is where it's at. And that's what makes Icarus Interstellar so special. This adventure is real. This is yet another moment in history where science fiction is becoming science fact. And there are countless people out there right now just waiting to be a part of something like this. And there's a specific group of people that I think can be extra helpful. A group called gamers. But this group isn't as narrow as you may think. And, there, and it has grown to incorporate a very large portion of the population. Nearly everyone in the world plays some kind of game every now and then. Whether you're spending 30 hours a week playing World of Warcraft or EVE Online, or you're spending several minutes a day playing Angry Birds, or even a daily crossword on a bus ride to work, you're spending some portion of your time engaging in games. Recently, people have caught on to this fact, and they've started to incorporate game elements into other non-game activities to make them more fun and engaging. This is commonly referred to as gamification. Now, game elements, or mechanics, can usually be traced back to three key things. Mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Mastery is the feeling you get as you progress and you get better and better at something. Autonomy is the want to choose our own way and to control the different aspects of our lives. And purpose is the desire to have our actions truly matter. M-A-P, or what I like to call the map. Because if you're not on the map, then you're lost. These three things are what produce long-term engagement. People motivated by these things tend to stay motivated for much longer. Which is why it's extremely important for Icarus Interstellar to utilize these motivators when engaging, when engaging with their supporters. So, Let's, let's apply them directly to Icarus Interstellar. 
Mastery. Enable people to improve and increase their support for Icarus Interstellar over time. Autonomy. Offer many options. Allow people to choose how to provide support for Icarus Interstellar. And purpose. Give people a reason to take action. Provide them with a sense of meaning. Inspire them to participate in Icarus Interstellar and to get their friends involved. Now, as I continue, I will highlight which areas of the map apply to my examples. Now, there are two main ways for the general public to contribute, crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Crowdfunding is gaining small amounts of money from a large number of people, the exact opposite of traditional funding. It's not one big check, it's a lot of little ones. Crowdsourcing is obtaining services, ideas, or content through contributions from a large number of people. So similar idea, instead of a few people doing a lot of work, it's a, a lot of people each doing a little work. So let's start with crowdfunding. Kickstarter and Rocket Hub are two great examples of this and are pretty well known. And Icarus Interstellar just ran a, success, a successful Kickstarter campaign to fund this event. In fact, they raised $5,000 more than their original goal. That's really cool. There's a couple key points that I want to make about crowdfunding in this way. Inspire your supporters. Remind them how profound this mission is, how rare it is, and how spectacular it is. Really drive this point home. Make them feel good about contributing to the cause, and let them know that their hard-earned money is going to good use. And make sure to offer lots of donation options, especially on the lower end. You should have at least as many options in the one to $100 range as you do in the $100 plus dollar range, maybe more. This is where a majority of people will be, don will be donating. And remember, there are a lot of people out there that are interested in contributing to projects like this, but they're not all gonna be able to contribute $1,000 at a time. They're gonna contribute five, 10, or $20 at a time. And when they do donate, reward them. Make the rewards interesting, but also make sure that they reinforce your cause in some way. So things like merchandise, like t-shirts, hats, posters, educational pieces like books and DVDs, and recognition by listing names on sites or even on the project itself. These are common rewards that are easy to tie back into your cause. Kickstarter is growing fast and it's being used more and more by big names and small names alike. Director Spike Lee uh, is, is running one of the most successful Kickstarters to date, and he has raised just over one, one and a quarter million dollars, and he still has several days to go on the campaign. A couple key things to note. He makes it widely available to donate by having 28 of 49 rewards at $100 or less. And his top, top rewards are very compelling, and they offer things like ultra-rare props from previous films, being able to visit Spike on set, and even sitting courtside with him in a Knicks game. Crowdfunding is becoming easier and more effective for companies to raise money. But where does it go from here? Well, I think projects like this will decide where it goes. Icarus Interstellar is unique in it. It has such an earth-shattering goal of building a starship, but it also has an incredibly long and also short timeline of launching an interstellar mission by the year 2100. It's incredibly short with respect to all that needs to happen technologically, but it's also incredibly long from the perspective of the general public. Most of us function on very short time scales. We count the hours till lunch, we count the hours till we get off work, we count the days till the weekend, but rarely do we consider what our actions will mean 50 years from now, 100 years from now, or 200 years from now. And it's because of this that Icarus Interstellar faces a very unique challenge. How to keep people motivated and engaged, not just for today and not just for this month, but for their entire lives and for the lives of their children. It's this unique challenge that I think will influence how we do our crowdfunding. What a project like this needs is what I would call continuous crowdfunding. And what this means is that instead of having a deadline, the crowdfunding would be open-ended and you'd keep track of people's donations and allow them, you keep track over time and allow them to level up and reach various reward levels over time. Some key points. 
The standard Kickstarter structure will be very useful here. This is everything I just mentioned. So a large number of affordable donation options <coughs> with rewards that tie back into the project, an inspiring cause, and so on. And let people see where their money is going. Or better yet, let them choose where their money is going. You can show a blueprint of a ship with various components labeled, and donors can then choose which section of the ship to donate to. And give as much feedback as possible. Let people know how things are progressing. Allowing people to watch and engage with development in this way really helps to build a, a connection with your supporters. Donor progression. Keeping track of the donations that people make and allowing them to level up over time. This is probably the most important aspect of continuous crowdfunding. So let's say, for example, that I get one point for every dollar that I donate. And let's say that I donate $10 every month. Over time, my donation points add up, and at a later date, I can use them to access exclusive rewards that aren't otherwise available. So things like autographed items, or rare pieces of prototypes, or maybe even <coughs> meeting with members of the, design, of the design team. Family progression. And remember, it's not just about getting people to donate today. It's about getting them to donate and contribute over long periods of time. So in order to do this, we need to stop thinking about just individuals and start thinking about families and groups of people. Sadly, I will probably not get to fly on a starship. But perhaps my children can, or maybe their children. Perhaps my donation points can exceed my lifetime and be passed from person to person. Consider it a starship savings account. Perhaps these long-lasting donation points could eventually decide the privileged citizens that board our first colony ship. Long-term recognition. <coughs> Just as donors will pay to get their names in the credits of a Spike Lee movie, they'll pay to be acknowledged on this project. But unlike the short-term recognition offered in most Kickstarters, we could offer some very long-lasting credits. Imagine the Icarus Interstellar equivalent to the Voyager's golden record. Donors could list their names or even decide what other material goes on the record. Or imagine other supporting projects. Let's say that we want to build a space elevator. We could inscribe names of top donors or top families of donors along the elevator, putting names every 10 feet or even every foot. You could put a lot of names on that elevator. Enabling and encouraging people to donate multiple times over time is incredibly important to a project like this with such a long duration. So we should constantly be looking for ways to embrace this longevity and use it to our advantage. Another example of crowdfunding is something called free rice. Free rice has two main goals. One, to provide free education, and two, to help end world hunger by donating rice to hungry people around the world. On the site, players can answer trivia questions on a number of subjects, and for each right answer, free rice donates 10 grains of rice <coughs> through the World Food Program. These donations are made possible by the sponsors that advertise on their site. The main driver behind people playing this game is that they, they want to donate rice to people who need food. Free rice has raised just under 100 billion grains of rice, and they've fed millions of, of people around the world. So what would this look like for Icarus Interstellar? Well, we could have similar goals. Free education. It's not an official goal, but in my opinion, it would be a great bonus. And then, of course, to have a successful Interstellar launch. We could have trivia or puzzle games where you can donate to Interstellar Travel simply by learning about Interstellar Travel. And as players play these games, sponsors on a site make small donations to the, pro to the project. Now, obviously, we're allowing players to choose a topic so that plays to autonomy. But what if we spice it up a little bit? What if all the points won in specific categories went to making donations in that field? For example, all the points I earn in a physics puzzle go to making donations in something physics related. Or they could even be as specific as answering questions about our sun or sunlight, raising donations for solar sails. It's not only important to have choices, but those choices should matter. And it should make a difference whether I choose A or B. <coughs> so,
quick recap on crowdfunding. Offer lots of donation options, with the majority being in the lower, more affordable range. Offer cool and interesting rewards that tie back into your cause. Inspire your donors and remind them the importance of, this mi of the mission. Enable and encourage people to continually donate to your cause and reward them for doing so in addition to the normal rewards. And bring supporters into the loop and let them know how things are progressing and let them know where their money is going. Or even better, let them choose where their money is going. Do you want to support the post the pulsed fusion propulsion engine or the rigging for the solar sails? So let's move on to crowdsourcing. Now remember, this is similar to crowdfunding, but instead of raising funds, you're collecting services, ideas, or content. The first example I want to go over is something called Zooniverse. And Zooniverse is really interesting. Zooniverse is created by the Citizen Science Alliance, and they're constantly creating new game-like projects that help scientists and researchers handle the flood of data that comes in from various experiments. Through these projects, players can help explore the ocean floor, study wind patterns on Mars, or even search for exoplanets. And Zooniverse has around a dozen or so projects like this going on at any given time. One of my favorite is called SETI Live. In this project, players examine radio frequency signals from the Allen Telescope Array. And like the other projects, the major benefit to SETI here is that they have players going through the data that can most benefit from human attention, as opposed to just computer power. In SETI's case, they have players going through the data with heavy human-made radio <coughs> frequency interference. Another cool aspect of SETI, of this, is that SETI uses live signals when available. And if enough players notice the same signal, SETI will actually reposition their telescope. Now, just like in free rice, players are partaking in these projects because they believe in the cause. And the fact that SETI will reposition the telescope if players see something worth looking at is compelling to those engaged in the program. It's encouraging to know because it makes my efforts feel more real. So let's apply some of these things to Icarus Interstellar. You could have similar projects that could help with fusion engine research, solar energy research, or even deciding which star to go to. <coughs> Anything that would benefit from having many eyes reviewing and categorizing. And just like how players can collectively move SETI's telescope, our players could have equally profound impact, perhaps helping to decide telescope targets or eventually uh, deciding the best source of propulsion. And it's not just about money. Players can contribute in many ways. These, allow, these projects allow people to donate something just as valuable as money, their time. And again, the, the people are out there. You might not have thought that you'd have people willing to listen to thousands of audio recordings of caves trying to identify bat calls, but Bat Detective is one of Zooniverse's regular projects. And Zooniverse has had almost one million people engage in their game-like projects. So let's invite these people in, and you'll be happy we did. Foldit and Philo are two more great examples of crowdsourcing. Foldit is a game about protein folding, and Philo is a game about DNA sequencing. Both games take complicated problems and turn them into puzzle games. Players then play through these puzzle games, <coughs> and researchers can analyze the results of the games. And they're similar to the Zooniverse projects in that they use problems that can benefit from having human, human attention as opposed to just computer power. And they turn players into problem solvers. I'm sure there are many issues with interstellar travel right now that can be, tr that can be transformed into puzzle games. Maybe some of you can think of some examples right now. If we could turn these problems into puzzles able to be played by thousands of people, then we stand a much better chance at finding solutions. And it's not just puzzle games. There are endless possibilities to what we can create and how we can gain from it. A quick example of a bigger, more grandiose game would be what I'd call a starship builder. SimCity meets Kerbal Space Program. A city builder meets a rocket builder. In this game, players could design 
and create their own interstellar probes and starships. And they would have to take into account things like population, worker roles, ship structures, as well as fuel expenditure, propulsion types, and eventually uh, even resource collecting and distribution mid-journey. So you could go from having one fully designed starship to having thousands. And apparently I went a lot faster than I thought I was going, so already wrapping up. Um, but to wrap up, this project represents a microcosm of Earth, both in development and even possibly as a, a colony ship in the distant future. And it'll take more than just physicists and engineers. We need a combined effort of all humankind. Games have the ability to provide funds and support for interstellar travel, as well as the ability to engage, entertain, and educate the public. And it's my opinion that the public can provide much more than the governments or private investors. I believe that the public can, can carry this project and it should be a priority to start creating these avenues of engagement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Weimer, for that very informative talk. Uh, we're going to go right into the break since we are actually right on schedule now. So please be back at 3.01.
Okay, please take your seats. Everyone, please take your seats so we can stay on schedule. Gentlemen, please come in and take your seats. We're going to about to begin.
wish these guys wouldn't do stuff like that. Could everybody take your seats, please? Our next uh, talk is by uh, two speakers. Heath Rezebeck is, an Icarus, is Icarus Interstellar's Outreach and Collaborations Coordinator for the 2013 Congress, the Texas Ambassador for the Open Knowledge Foundation, and has just begun an internship with the Long Now Foundation to help curate the manual for a civilization product. Nick Nielsen is the author of two books, Political Economy of Globalization and Variations on the Theme of Life. They now co-present X Risk 101, Existential Risk for Interstellar Advocates. Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, X Risk 101 is divided into two parts. In the first, I will cover the fundamentals of X Risk and update on the Vessel Project, a framework for preserving the cultural, scientific, and biological record. In the second, Nick Nielsen will explore the longer term implications of overcoming X risk for the future of civilization. Though discussed in different terms, X risk was a key concern and priority for the DARPA 2011 Starship Workshop. In its January 2011 report, that workshop prioritized creating a legacy for the human species, backing up the Earth's biosphere, and enabling long-term survival in the face of catastrophic disasters on Earth. At the 100-Year Starship 2012 Symposium, I presented a synthesis of strategies to address all three of these goals at once, called VESSEL. Before updating on the VESSEL project, I want to talk first about existential risk, what it includes, and why we should prioritize it and find ways to meet its challenge. So existential risk denotes, simply enough, risks to our existence. Existential risk encompasses both extinction risk and global catastrophic risk. Nick Bostrom, director for the Future of Humanity Institute, defines existential risk this way in a key paper we'll cover throughout. An existential risk is one that threatens the premature extinction of Earth-originating intelligent life or a per the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for desirable future development. As we can see, Small personal risks are down in the lower left, laser fun, that's all right. Uh, the loss of one hair is the small personal risk. Whereas in the middle, uh, in, in, uh, under global catastrophic risks, uh, global tyranny would be an example of that. And finally, the destruction of life's long-term potential defines existential risk in the upper right. So existential risk has become, or rather X risk has become a popular shorthand for this whole spectrum of risks. We can see signs of it emerging as a priority for various space related efforts. One of the most popular images of X risk today is that of a sterilizing asteroid strike. And asteroids play a big role in some of the most visible efforts in space industry today, such as the Arca telescope or NASA's asteroid uh, initiative. Specialists sometimes see unpredicted cultural or technological risks as even more urgent. Starship Congress has its eye on some pretty long-term goals. And Earth provides our only space and time to work towards them. On that basis alone, the challenge of X-Risk must be answered. But setting aside our own goals, what are the stakes? How many lives have there been, or could there yet be, if extinction is, av is avoided? Nick Bostrom has run some interesting numbers. To calculate the loss associated with an existential catastrophe, we must consider how much value would come to exist in its absence. It turns out that the ultimate potential for Earth-originating intelligent life is literally astronomical. Well, how so? First, we need a standard of measurement. Let's start with the total number of humans ever to have lived on Earth. Wolfram Alpha lists the total world population as 107.6 billion people over time. The current global population is 7.13 billion. If we leave out the current population, we get 100 billion, about the number of neurons in a single human brain. 100 billion lives. One pale blue dot. Here's Carl Sagan on that famous image of Earth from afar. Consider again that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, 
everyone you know, everyone you love, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. 100 billion lives is our basic unit of measure. Now, how much value would come to exist if our future potential is not cut short? Well, in Bostrom's research, 10 to the 16th power, 10 million billion, is one estimate of the potential number of future lives on Earth alone if only 1 billion lived on it sustainably for the 1 billion years it's projected to remain habitable. But if we consider the possibility of the spread of life beyond Earth, as we're attempting, or synthetic minds and lives yet to come, Bostrom's estimate grows truly vast. 10 to the 52nd power potential lives to come. That's 100 million times 100 billion times 100 billion times 100 billion times 100 billion. And that means that reducing the chances of X risk by a mere one billionth of one billionth of one percent is worth 100 billion billion lives. Now, with just a slight shift in priorities, we can hugely boost the chances of life achieving its full potential by working to enhance its prospects today. Let's look at Bostrom's uh, definition again. An existential risk is one that threatens the premature extinction of Earth-originating intelligent life or the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for, future desi for desirable future development. Now, notice that fragment destruction of its potential for desirable future development. Survival alone is not enough. In some cases, a surviving society may become brutalized, stagnant, or diminished irreparably, unable to aspire or to build itself anew. And this brings us to two subtypes of X-risk, as crucial as extinction itself. And they both fall into the realm of global catastrophic risks. Permanent stagnation, Humanity survives, but never reaches technological maturity or interstellar civilization. And flawed realization, humanity reaches technological maturity, but in a way that is irredeemably flawed. Now, pop culture has a working knowledge of them both, actually, in very different terms. Nick and I joke that it's a bit like zombies versus vampires. Permanent stagnation and flawed realization, losing our capability as a civilization or enduring only in a deeply flawed form. These two risks fill our dystopian movies, but because popular culture understands them, we can learn valuable lessons about our messaging and priorities by understanding them too. These two types of X risk cut to the heart of what it means to achieve our full potential. There is a vast opportunity between these risks because of the many advances needed to achieve an interstellar future and because of the benefits such advances could have for life on Earth in areas such as habitat design, energy infrastructure, biotechnology, as well as advanced computing, networking, and archival. If we work to prototype here and now, solving real-world problems along the way, all will benefit. If we make advances open and adaptable to humanity's best minds, we will gain allies in our effort to uplift Earth and thrive beyond it. Perhaps advanced, resilient technologies could carry a seal, standing for the dual design goals of uplifting life on Earth while advancing our reach towards the stars, like LEED certification for an infinite future. What would such projects be like? Last year, I proposed the Vessel Project as a means to safeguard cultural potential on Earth and beyond. I'll close with a brief update on this approach to advanced computing, compact habitat design, and long-term archival. Capability lost before advanced goals are reached will be very difficult to recover without a means of setting a baseline for civilization's capabilities. A vessel is an installation, facility, or habitat that serves as a reservoir for Earth's biological, scientific, and cultural record. Into a vessel is poured what must be remembered for humanity's potential to be maintained. On Earth or beyond, a vessel habitat is designed to carry forth the sum of all we've been. In 2012, vessel was pictured as the lily pad seasteading habitat but different vessels would have different designs based on their needs and settings. These traits remain key in each case, however. At a vessel's core would lie biological archives meant to preserve key traces of Earth's biodiversity. Here, the primary model is Gregory Benford's groundbreaking 1992 Library of Life proposal. 
He details a program for freezing and preservation of endangered biomass for possible future recovery. Also crucial would be core archives for cultural and scientific knowledge, both physical and digital. I'm working with Icarus Interstellar to make sure the vessel framework is compatible with Icarus projects. Surrounding these archives would be research labs, where specialists could collaborate on advanced technologies, seeking critical paths which avoid and mitigate X risk. Or in a time of recovery, sealed labs could be the birthplace of new beginnings. Research labs would open inwards and draw upon the core cache, but in the near term, through an outer ring of learning labs, vessel facilities could welcome the curious and give visitors an inspiring glimpse at advanced studies. Immersive labs could be catalysts for change, helping people understand the arc of history and nature, culture and science, the common risks ahead, and the limitless possibility if life achieves its full potential. And, and a nod to Kelvin's comment on that earlier today. Built around these three roles of learning, research, and archival, the vessel framework is designed to adapt to any setting or situation. What all vessels would have in common is a dedication to preserving cultural capability and a layered, approachable presence adapted to its setting. Many should be built using many approaches. Some could be public, while mission-critical vessels may be as remote as the Svalbard seed vault or even secret. Some may be massive habitats, with others more like sculptures, compact and dense as a room. At the recent Starship Century Conference in May, Freeman Dyson envisioned terrarium-like habitats, which could seed the vast reaches of space with life. This egg-like approach is hugely inspiring to ponder from the perspective of the vessel project. Whether urban or remote, extreme habitats or modules on a starship, vessel is offered as a flexible framework for the long-time survival of life's capabilities. Now, the Vessel Project has several routes forwards. My plans for 2014 include a global survey of existing long-term archival projects, an open design document to help others adapt and evolve the Vessel Framework, and a Kickstarter for a Vessel-related art project. Right before Starship Congress, I began an internship with the Long Now Foundation, working on a project called the Manual for Civilization. As the first core collection for their planned library of the Long Now, a 10,000-year archive, this work will overlap deeply with the Vessel Project. So my own timeline for Vessel is in flux, but if you'd like to collaborate, discuss ways of applying X-risk mitigation to your own work, or want to help accelerate these efforts, please get in touch. You can register for updates on the Vessel Project at vesselcc.launchrock.com. We now turn towards the longer term with Nick Nelson. The motif of the pale blue dot graphically shows Earth's place in the universe, and if we could continue to expand our scope for several more orders of magnitude while remaining focused on our pale blue dot, we would perceive our Earth in the full magnitude of its cosmological context. As Earth is placed in, placed in cosmological context, we must similarly place Earth originating life, intelligence, and civilization in its cosmological context, and we can do so by way of astrobiology by which we understand the study of life in space, which removes the distinction between life on our planet and life elsewhere. With Earth originating life, intelligence, and civilization placed in cosmological context, we ourselves and our civilization can be understood in terms of the Fermi paradox. Fermi asked, if the universe is filled with life, where is everybody? The paradox has only been sharpened by recent scientific discoveries of exoplanets, including small rocky planets in the habitable zones of stars, some of them relatively nearby in cosmological terms. Once we remove the distinction between life on Earth and life elsewhere, we see that the idea of an alien is an anthropocentric concept, and a Copernican conception such as astrobiology must do away with the idea of aliens as constituting all life other than Earth originating life. So when we ask, where are all the aliens, we must answer, right here on Earth, we are the aliens. We are the only known aliens to pass through the great filter, which is what we call whatever it is that has filtered out other possible civilizations and left us only with our own civilization on Earth, so far as we know. And the development of astrobiology has directed our attention to the many near disasters we have experienced in the past disasters that have shaped the surface of our planet and the history of life on Earth. 
The emergence of a single hominid species from several branches of hominid evolution makes Homo sapiens a kind of existential choke point or bottleneck in the history of intelligence, so that there is a sense in which we are the great filter. And this life, which is itself a marvelous and meaningless accident of the cosmos, is vulnerable at any moment to being annihilated by another meaningless accident of the cosmos. Through the ages of cosmological and geological time, our home world has been subject to massive volcanism, asteroid impacts, solar flares, gamma ray bursts, and the extensive glaciation that characterizes the present quaternary glaciation with its warmer interglacial periods such as the Holocene, during which the whole of human civilization has emerged. These natural forces of the Earth, the solar system, and the cosmos at large have shaped terrestrial life, humanity, and human civilization. We have been hammered on the anvil of a violent and dynamic universe, and we have survived. Earth-originating life has now given rise to industrial technological civilization, which continues in its development to the present day. What follows planet-bound industrial technological civilization is a process I call extraterrestrialization, which places Earth-originating civilization in cosmological context, just as a pale blue dot places Earth in cosmological context and astrobiology places life in cosmological context. The resources of industrial technological civilization hold the promise that life, intelligence, and civilization can spread beyond our terrestrial home world. Each stage in the development of a civilization capable of harnessing the energy resources required to expand beyond exclusively planet-bound conditions represents passing through further layers of the great filter. The gravitational thresholds of our home world, our local solar system, our local galaxy, and our local universe are each of them existential risks and existential opportunities for the future development of Earth-originating life, intelligence, and civilization. And the mitigation of one level of existential risk means ascending to a more comprehensive level of existential risk. The technology that our civilization develops will influence the structure of extraterrestrialized civilization. In the settlement of the universe, excuse me, if the settlement of the universe is parallel to the settlement of our planet, each gravitational threshold will be passed by an initial, will, will first be an initial slow wave followed and filled in later by much faster waves of expansion resulting from later higher technology. But in the event of a disruptive technological breakthrough, as for example the Alcubierre drive, there could be an initial fast wave expansion only later filled in by slower and more thorough waves filling in the gaps. Given this context of extraterrestrialized civilization and its cosmological context, we can approach existential risk mitigation through three principles. Knowledge, which transforms unknown uncertainties into quantifiable risks that admit of calculation and mitigation. Redundancy, which means multiple self-sufficient centers for Earth-originating life, and autonomy, which asserts, assures the independence of each self-sufficient center to seek its own strategies for survival. What does knowledge have to do with risk? Following the economist Frank Knight, we call Knight what we call Knightian risks distinguishes between predictability, risk, and uncertainty with predictability implying total knowledge, risk, partial knowledge, and uncertainty, the absence of knowledge. These are simplified and idealized categories. No risk is entirely free of uncertainty, and even uncertainty must lie within what is possible within our universe. But this gives us a way to think about risk in as a dynamic framework, which changes over time. The growth of knowledge moves the boundary of risk forward, meaning less uncertainty and more predictability. For example, even if we have done very little in the past 40 years in terms of human space exploration and extraterrestrial settlement, and we are still accessing Earth orbit with disposable chemical rockets, space science has made enormous progress, and this knowledge has transformed our understanding of the universe and our place within it. This growth of our knowledge of the universe has made the universe a little less uncertain and a little more predictable for us, suggesting clear paths for the management and mitigation of existential risk. But knowledge alone is not enough. Without redundancy of Earth-originating life, intelligence, and civilization, we still face the possibility of a terrestrial single point failure. Existential risk mitigation ultimately means multiple self-sufficient centers for Earth-originating intelligent life. These distinct centers of Earth-originating life will be subject to distinct risks and distinct opportunities. And these distinct populations of Earth-originating life, intelligence, and civilization will be subject to distinct selection pressures, and so they will evolve into unique form. Knowledge of risk and redundant centers of Earth-originating 
earth originating life together are not yet enough. Redundancy without diversity incurs the risk of homogeneity in monoculture. Existential risk mitigation also points to the necessity of the independence of each self-sufficient center to seek its own strategies of survival. The mutual independence of self-sufficient centers means the possibility of continued social and technological experimentation, which in turn will lead to the realization of distinct forms of civilization. The idea of autonomy seems simple enough as a condition for existential risk mitigation, but it may be more difficult to achieve than we suppose. If we look around the planet today with all its ethnic and cultural diversity, we see that there is, for all practical purposes, only one viable form of political organization, the nation state, and again, for all practical purposes, only one viable form of civilization, industrial technological civilization. We need to proactively seek to transcend social and technological monoculture to arrive at, to arrive at a civilizational pluralism from which social and technological experimentation flows naturally. Taking existential risk seriously means that certain moral imperatives follow from this, but who could possibly object to preventing human extinction? But of course, it's not that simple. It might be more difficult than we suppose to define human extinction because to do so we would need to agree on what constitutes human viability in the long term. Additionally, there are vastly different conceptions of what constitutes a viable civilization and what constitutes the good for civilization. What is permanent stagnation? What is flawed realization? What exactly is subsequent ruination when achievement is followed by failure? What constitutes a civilizational failure? And what exactly would constitute the drastic failure of life to re realize its potential for desirable development? And what is human potential? Does it include transhumanism? For some, transhumanism as a moral horror and a future of transhumanism would be a paradigm case of flawed realization while for others a human future without transhumanism would constitute permanent stagnation. These are difficult questions that cannot be wished away. To pretend that they are not contentious is to fail to do justice to the complexity of the human condition. These different conceptions of human potential and desirable outcomes for civilization will issue in different ideals, different aspirations, and different actions. But if we can continue to increase our knowledge, to establish redundancy and assure autonomy, there is reason to hope that existential catastrophe can be avoided and an okay outcome realized, which is the point of what Nick Bostrom called the Maxipoc rule, maximizing the probability of an okay outcome, where an okay outcome is the avoidance of existential catastrophe. Survival is not salvation. Survival often simply means that we will have the opportunity to go on to make later mistakes on a larger scale, but this is better than the alternative, which is extinction. Thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for that exceptional talk. We have time for a few questions. Yes, sir, here in the front. Well, let's see. Uh, one thing about the definition of extinction is remember that the top of the Permian almost everything was wiped out and yet it rebounded. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> it, it, well, biological... You didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Yeah, biological evolution wouldn't go away. So even if you had total extinction, like at the top of the Permian, you, you still have the rebound. No, of course, you start pretty far back. <laughs> uh, it's very unlikely that there will be an existential risk visited on the Earth that it results in complete sterilization. That's certainly the nightmare scenario. But it's certainly plausible that existential risk that would pretty much uh, throw civilization in the, in the tank would, would, could come along. As we just earlier today, we were talking about the possibility of a, a massive solar flare that could burn out the global electric grid. That would be a real screeching halt to industrialized civilization. Human beings would survive, probably. Uh, not seven billion of them, but a lot of them. And we can certainly think of many other causes. Most, the, 
the Future of Humanity Institute that uh, Keith, Keith mentioned earlier focuses on uh, anthropogenic extinction risks, risks because they think that the, the things that we're doing to ourselves, like irreversible, irreversible environmental damage or the emergence of unfriendly AI, could potentially be uh, a much greater concern than uh, asteroids. And just to uh, add a period to that, we have a track record. Biology has a track re record of surviving the known risks. It's the unknown risks that we have no track record of surviving. Okay, so uh, you mentioned, uh, I have a, a, a brief comment. Who, uh, here, 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 here. Okay, so I have uh, one quick comment and a question. So the comment is that you mentioned the great filter as in the context of explaining why uh, we seem to not see any neighborhoods. So, uh, uh, but uh, and the, the same Nick Bostrom mentioned that if we ev ever find life on Mars, it will mean that humanity is not the, uh, well, uh, the Earth ecosphere is not the unique snowflake that we want to believe, but it's actually very, uh, very likely. So. It, if that's the case, the great filter may be uh, still ahead of us. And so, and the, the question is, you mentioned flawed re realization. I, I'm not, I understand what 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 is the zombie, which is the, we we stagnate, but I'm not sure what it means to be flawed uh, realization. Uh, okay, um, I, I I removed a slide uh, from this thing, partly because I ended up seeing the movie and the movie wasn't that great, but I did have a slide in here uh, comparing the two to the very broad stroke brushes in uh, Elysium, where you have permanent stagnation on the surface and the orbital in its rarefied luxury is flawed realization. That's a perception that I think we need to avoid and we can avoid by practicing uplift of life on Earth in the process. I can imagine someone uh, uh, identifying Klingons as a flawed realization, though I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, agree with that. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Our next two speakers are Giorgio Gavarigi and Andre. Kamanoa. They will be delivering two speeches back-to-back. Uh, -back. They are from Unispace. Uh, the first um, talk will be on critical path and interstellar routes, and the second talk will be a Kardashev 3 approach to extrasolar colonization. Gentlemen. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Giorgio Gaviraghi, and my colleague here is Andrea Kaminoa. We are both architects and uh, we are part of uh, Star Voyager and Unispace. Star Voyager is uh, an organization of uh, about 30 uh, professionals, academic uh, people, and uh, we started a, a Starship reference project about a year ago. While Unispace is uh, the operating uh, uh, branch of uh, Star Voyager, meaning that Unispace is uh, uh, organize to answer uh, international, European, and uh, American calls for uh, space or innovative uh, proposals. Now, uh, Andre will, uh, will start uh, uh, with our critical path and interstellar routes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, well, um, since 2010, uh, thanks to the DARPA and NASA 100-year Starship Initiative, um, interstellar travel has started to be an important subject in public domain uh, for research purposes. Um, several groups are working uh, in the research and development uh, of the new incredible concepts uh, with the challenging objective of um, to reach Alpha, Alpha Centauri system, maybe Proxima Centauri first, um, in 2110. Um, but 
once the once we reach once we get the capability to reach such an incredible milestone uh, what's next each stellar system in our galaxy um, could be a potential target for an interstellar mission how many well a lot um, and if we count other galaxies uh, we can say that we have almost infinite uh, potential targets so we think that we should advance in, in a step-by-step -step way following a, a possible uh, interstellar master plan development of course uh, we should start with our immediate influence area for instance um, with the neighbors of our star sol the sun uh, the sol's neighborhood um, into uh, a 15 like years distance counts 56 stellar systems uh, that comprehends 75 stars so um, this work is is based in in a, in a single question uh, but not short question uh, which are the most convenient is the stellar route that a space based Kardashev to uh, human civilization should use to explore to settle to colonize and to ensure its immediate influence area well to to answer this question uh, we propose to analyze um, this problem as a project management exercise certainly uh, someone will have to do it uh, thus let's start with critical path method and program evaluation and review techniques diagrams to familiarize us with uh, with this concept uh, I will try to explain it in shortly uh, in a part diagram uh, we have nodes uh, activities with uh, an estimated duration um, and these nodes are joined by arrows that mark the presence uh, the critical path method is the shortest way that a series of activities can be done here um, we have a, an example that shows in, in a modest way how to apply uh, the strategies mentioned before um, in this case Alpha Centauri is the well in this case no in the reality Alpha Centauri is the nearest stellar system to Sol at a distance of about uh, 4.26 light years uh, then the following the following stellar system is WISE 10 for for 49 53 19 nice nice name uh, at a distance of about uh, 3.63 light years from Alpha Centauri well the basic idea is uh, to iterate this exercise until we reach our 15 light year uh, arbitrary limit um, So, as we, as we say, uh, the, the idea that we propose is to iterate the, pro, um, the previous exercise from Sol until we reach our stellar system, uh, sorry, um, our limit of uh, 15 light years. And, however, sorry. Um, in order to simplify um, the, 
idea we can do this in, in a graphical model with a 3D map that is shown in the web, uh, showing with a line the stars that appears to be closer. So once we we have got done this, we can clearly see six paths, six interstellar routes. Well, but the previous uh, the previous graphical model is the, it is not quite precise. Uh, in order to to have uh, precision, we have to access we have access to data and the most accurate and complete data that I found um, is the Parcos catalog and where we can take the precise here we, we can take the, the precise measure distance to the closest stars and its as it has its ascension, its declination and with this information we can calculate using a, a little bit of trigonometry uh, the accurate distance among stars. Well, um, I'm not going to, to worry in all of you. Meanwhile, we describe this formula, but uh, I only want to show that uh, the form that we found to to do this with a more reasonable precision. So. We have three questions. Uh, how many starships should be dispatched? Um, in which order should be their destinations? How much, um, how much time would imply? Well, in order to answer these questions, uh, we, have to, we have to calculate the accurate distance, aim on stars as we saw previously, um, we need to know the distance and with those distance we can make the third diagram and we can find the critical paths but regarding the time we'll, it will depend it will depend of, of the type of, pro of proportion that we have. So due to the short time for this talk um, we come back to, to the graphical mode um, as we can see we are going to need six starships for these six interstellar routes but these starships should have mothership capabilities what is what is it? Uh, mothership capabilities basically is a traveling space settlement an entirely artificial or based or an asteroid of limited size to secure local resources also is a traveling facility to help developing um, several operational settlements in different stellar systems, spreading activities and establishing multiple settlements, each with its own master plan and expansion capability in an integrated interstellar economic system. That's all. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, now we. Uh, oh, okay. we Shoshoka, Viragi, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, start the second. Second. Start the second.
Okay, we are going to to talk about uh, a different approach to extraplanetary uh, system colonization, a Kardashev tree approach. Uh, why we are using the Kardashev uh, uh, parameter? Uh, because it's the most known parameter that we have to identify an advanced uh, interstellar civilization. In reality, it's very mechanistic, and we will show it later how it works. It's based in uh, um, power uh, consumption. It's based in uh, very mechanic uh, uh, parameters and concept. Uh, it may be, uh, it may have some critics because uh, uh, the quantity of uh, power uh, consumed by a civilization or by a society. Doesn't, doesn't really mean that that society is uh, much more advanced than another one. But this is uh, uh, a very known um, parameter, so that's why we are using it. Now, uh, once uh, our society will reach interstellar planet capability, meaning that uh, we will have the capability to go out of our solar system, and uh, according to Kardashev, it's uh, called the uh, Kardashev 3, uh, while Kardashev 1 is a planetary society, Kardashev 2 is an interplanetary society, I mean a society which uh, can spread in a single uh, planetary system, like the solar system in our case. Uh, the Kardashev 3 is a intergalactic, it's a galactic society, meaning that uh, it can spread in a, in a galaxy. In our case, we have the um, the Milky, the Milky Way. Uh, okay, what uh, we have to stress is that uh, we can't really uh, compare uh, with our parameters the type of society which we are uh, referring to. Uh, the people will certainly be very different from us. Uh, the location from where they will go to uh, to other solar system, to other planetary system, will probably not be Earth, will be our space settlements, which will be spread out uh, in our solar system, maybe as far out as the Kuiper Belt. Uh, so it will be uh, people, generation of people, which are already used to live outside the Earth, which are already used to, to live in a, in a space environment. Uh, in artificial environment in this case because only Earth we have uh, our natural environment which is suitable for uh, our uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Now, there are multiple motivations for that and uh, we have some uh, uh, conventional motivation and we have other less conventional. Uh, before we go on, I just want to, to establish uh, uh, what is uh, the Kardashev scale for whoever doesn't is not familiar with that? It's a scale which was um, um, proposed uh, in the 60s by a Russian astronomer who was uh, working on a SETI type of uh, research for alien civilization. So he asked himself, what kind of civilization, of civilization what level of technology we may, we may meet? Uh, so, uh, he uh, defined a scale based on energy consumption, which we can uh, briefly uh, show like this. Phase one, a society that utilizes the resources of an entire planet, very similar to our society. But we still, we are not yet at that level. In fact, uh, you can see in the yellow column, uh, each uh, technological advance can be classified somehow. Now, we are uh, PC Internet year 2000. We are basically at 0 0.8 scale in the Kardashev scale. Then we can go to phase two, uh, which is a society that utilizes the resources of an entire planetary system. We are heading to that. And phase, uh, phase three, there is a mistake. Phase three is uh, an interstellar society, a society that utilizes the resources of an entire galaxy. And you can see the power consumption, and it's exponential. It's a billion of times, a trillion of times, if we are talking about, uh, about um, 
Kardashev tree level uh, higher than our society. And of course, uh, there are some um, concepts uh, which are connected to the type of society. For instance, we may reach uh, uh, Kardashev one level at the maybe pretty pretty soon uh, by the time that we achieve uh, singularity or, uh, or other uh, uh, events like uh, fusion power and so on. While space colonies and asteroid mining are already considered part of a K2 society. Now, uh, our society uh, has been uh, characterized, especially in the latest years, by exponential growth. Uh, if you can see uh, the years, and you can see that in the last uh, century, we have an exponential growth in population, energy consumption, uh, resources utilization, waste production, which is a bad uh, uh, growth in this case, desertification, pollution. We have an economic back. At the same time, we have an exponential acceleration in scientific papers, for instance. And what does it mean? That uh, uh, we may reach, uh, in a reasonable time, uh, the K2 or the K3 society. Now, uh, a K3 society will have uh, experience which we are still not uh, uh, considering, which we, we still need to reach and uh, we can call them singularities. The most known singularity is uh, the one which is uh, proposed by uh, Kurzweil, which is uh, artificial intelligence smarter than humans. Uh, according to Kurzweil, we should reach that level in about 20 years uh, in, in a reasonable time. What means that uh, the artificial razor, robots or computer will have uh, an intelligence uh, level which is first will reach our level and then will be uh, superior to us. That may create uh, a, a totally uh, unexpected situation uh, for, for our civilization. But then there are two more singularities which we can consider singularities. Virtual immortality, meaning that uh, uh, with our um, scientific advances we may soon uh, eliminate diseases. First we have to to know what caused the diseases and how to, to, to deal with them. But I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's possible and we can reach virtual immortality. What it means? That uh, it will change completely our society, it will change completely our, uh, our values and uh, of course our goals. And the third one is mind uploading. Mind uploading is still more, uh, uh, has a, a still bigger potential. Because mind uploading means that we can have some sort of immortality, not only, but uh, if you consider that our brains can be uh, uh, uploaded in a file, uh, in that file we can modify them, we can improve them, uh, we can add other, other brains, other minds, so we can reach what is uh, called by, uh, by science fiction writer, basically Arthur Clarke many years ago, we can reach uh, what we call, call the universal intelligence, meaning that most uh, minds will be in a single receptor. Of course, if this society, the K3 society, maybe even the K2 society, will have uh, gone through these uh, singularities, we don't even imagine uh, what uh, may happen, because we, we, we can't. But we have to speculate about it. The previous events would completely change the rules of the game of our society if properly applied and utilized, allowing further acceleration of progress and solving all existing global challenges by creating an affluent global society and a quadrillion economy, maybe more than a quadrillion economy. Here we have uh, what uh, we can consider a, a conventional growth. If you can see, we have uh, um, events which has been uh, over the centuries uh, has been um, have been developing and we can see in the in the lines we can see the K1 society which is probably uh, the middle of this century we can reach it 
then if we follow with the same uh, trend, with the same acceleration, we may reach a K2 society, let's say in, according to many scholars, we can reach it in about, uh, in less than a thousand years, and then a K3, we will still need uh, further millennia. But the singularities can completely change this picture. And here it is how they can. Because with the singularity, you can see that the acceleration will be more than exponential. By the time of the singularity, which means by middle, by mid-century, uh, the progress will be so, uh, so accelerated, so exponential, that we can reach the K2 and the K3 in a much, much shorter time. And of course, we can't really foresee what may happen when we reach uh, this level of, uh, of progress. Now, uh, what do we need for expansion in, uh, outside of our Earth? We need uh, uh, three conditions. Atmosphere composition must be similar to Earth, and I'm talking not only about humans, I'm talking about the terrestrial ecosystem, meaning humans, plants, animals, all what uh, refers to our way of life. Then we need the climate. You can have uh, the same atmosphere, but if the climate, let's say, you have uh, 100 degrees below zero, then uh, you can survive, and our ecosystem will not be able to survive. And of course, we need gravity. And this is why all the space settlement movement came out, because uh, we can uh, colonize Mars, we can terraform Mars, but at the end of the day, uh, even if the climate is the same as uh, the Earth, even if the atmosphere composition is the same as Earth, we don't have the gravity, we don't have the same gravity. So the people who will be uh, living there, the people who will born there, will basically be different than, than we are. And then we may have problems going back to Earth or some other sort. There will be some sort of mutants. So this is why uh, planetary uh, colonization may be, may be uh, a, doubt, uh, a, propo a proposal which is not really fit for uh, our terrestrial ecosystem. And that's why uh, they are proposing uh, space settlements where, where in the space settlement they can recreate all those three conditions for uh, terrestrial ecosystem survivability. Now, and we are again are talking about the population, uh, about the K3 society. What will be the population? The population of the solar system will be, of course, based on Earth, can be based in most bodies, uh, how? With an underground terraforming system, meaning that even in a hostile body, uh, if uh, um, um, approached with uh, some sort of techniques where we can recreate in small, much smaller than an atmospheric condition, um, our, our terrestrial ecosystem, we can live in a shared sleep environment with a very little effort because we don't have to, to colonize an entire planet. We, we just have, st we can start on, on a very small scale. So we can uh, colonize or let's say utilize, be part, uh, populate the entire uh, solar system, all the body, most bodies of the entire solar system. But at the same time, we can also build uh, space settlements, either totally artificial or utilizing hollowed up uh, asteroids and even artificial planets. So uh, our population will spread in the solar system. And this population may be the population that will uh, go further on to, uh, to the star, to other stars. They don't need to be uh, born on Earth. They may be born somewhere else and be used to, to live outside of, uh, of the Earth. And of course, uh, what we will have? We will have uh, um, in the extrasolar system, where could we go? We can find uh, planets or moon naturally similar to Earth. Very, very difficult. Uh, we, will, we, we can live in uh, what Andre said were mothership, which are basically are traveling starship, but are traveling space settlement. Because a starship is not uh, what science fiction usually Star Trek type. It's a, it's a settlement. It's a, it's a complete uh, space settlement with thousands of people because they have to recreate uh, our terrestrial ecosystem and they have to bring all the knowledge that we have of our civilization.
Now, motivation and activities. We have a list of motivation. Uh, economic defense, human expansion, for profit. Uh, popular, populate Earth-type planets, if founded. Terraform suitable planets, not provided for life form. There is a code of ethics about this. Underground terraforming in most bodies with hostile conditions. Checking for possible not interference with local life form body, if they exist. Space settlement and artificial planet, the most probable for permanent human living. And, of course, unmanned colonization and exploitation by artificial intelligence with minor blooded brains. The most probable in case of hostile condition. Now, this is the K1 approach. This is our current approach to space. We are based on Earth. We are at the, at the bottom of a deep gravity well. I mean, we are in the worst condition to explore space. And we are sending our probes, our, our mission from the Earth to the moon, to Mars, to wherever. How will a K3 society approach a, a planetary system? Like this. It will be a space center, no more planet center. It will uh, utilize a, a mothership, which is a, a, a traveling starship. And it will approach the, the planetary system uh, in accordance to, to the plans that they have, to the type of planets that they may encounter, to the local resources. They may be asteroid, may be comet, may be something else. And the, the, they will come from an outside situation to an inner situation, exactly the opposite than our K1 approach. This can also be uh, functional in our solar system. And probably very soon, uh, we will have a, a space center approach to space. But we are still in, in the beginning of all that. So what are the main goals? Establish human presence in the planet, uh, in extrasolar planetary system. Create habitats suitable for terrestrial and ecosystem survival. Develop conditions for population expansion and economic development. Establish a local self-sufficient economy. And create knowledge capability for further development and self-sufficiency. There are many scenarios. The colonization can be part of a master plan for human expansion. We, we may have a human mission preceded by unmanned mission that will prepare, uh, let's say, the terrain for, uh, for uh, the arrival of uh, humans. We may send uh, mind-uploaded uh, mind uh, AIs, artificial intelligence. And we may have other alternatives for, uh, for sending people. We will soon see what. Humans, and this is important, may not necessarily be real, but could be mind uploaded platforms with embryos of clones. We don't have to send people. We can send our embryos. So we don't need a starship, a manned starship, with all the ecosystem. We can send uh, an unmanned starship with different, uh, much uh, uh, less complicated, and maybe can travel faster, and can reach the same goals because we have to define which are our goals. And of course, as I said before, the satellite may not certainly not be coming from Earth, but from some traveling space settlement located in the most convenient planetary system. So what can be the two sort of approach? A planet center approach, where all resources are concentrated in a single location, there is no duplication, single economy, and master plan from expansion. It's a similar to Earth. If we go to a new plan, to a new planetary system, and we decide to, to, to allocate all our resources all our, uh, in a single body, in a single planet, we would be back to a K1 situation. Uh, single life support, food production, manufacturing system, as well as facilities. Disadvantages. Less affordable system to exit the planet for gravity issues and expand the civilization. No exploitation of resources of different type distributed in the planetary system. Bigger possibility of extinction due to several factors. You can have an epidemic, you can have a natural catastrophe, wars, and whatever. It's like uh, what we're living now on our, on our planet. And the other one is the space center approach, which means that uh, we are 
uh, living uh, in a space settlement, in a traveling space settlement, and we are approaching each body uh, with different uh, uh, concepts. Advantages, the, we multiply the exploitation possibility of the system. Uh, we don't have the, uh, let's say, the eventuality of dictatorship governance, of power concentration. Uh, we multiply the experience uh, for the entire system. We can distribute sk uh, skills, more possibility of growth. And in, and the disadvantage is that we need multiple life support. Each uh, body can have a different system, food production, manufacturing facilities. A need of fast uh, of space travel and related fast vehicle for interchange. Development first, as we said, the first be an unmanned uh, phase, followed by a manned one. But uh, what we've been discussed up to now is what uh, basically we we may call a conventional approach, a mechanic approach. Uh, we build a starship. Uh, we send people. We colonize. We have some other alternative. We have to to think about. This is the uh, the conventional approach. We have uh, the settlers. The as you can see, they are young. Then we send a starship. It may take a generation, whatever. And at the end, the young will become old. But they will still be humans, and of course there will be younger ones. But this is the conventional approach, which uh, most of science fiction is based on. Then we have another one, and this is a, a non-conventional approach. <coughs> and this is, we don't send, uh, uh, we don't send the, the people, we don't send humans. We we mind upload their brain, and we mind upload the brain in artificial intelligence or other or other um, media and uh, we store their body uh, DNA we store their embryos so and we send uh, the stored embryos and we send the AI robot at arrival the robots will have the capacity since they have their own our brain to clone to to give birth to help the, the birth of the humans. So the humans will reborn there. Not the same, but I mean, they're cloned. So this is the second. It's a non-traditional, it's a non-conventional. And finally, we have a totally, and I'm saying this, non-ethical, not politically correct, but it can happen. And it may happen against us. Another civilization can do this with us. We are mind uploading and we are not sending anything solid. We are sending files. We are sending our brains in files. They can even be an intelligent and universal intelligence in a file. It can travel at light speed, much faster than any type of, uh, uh, because we are not sending uh, anything material. And what we do there? We need uh, some support support with mobility and uh, manipulating capability. To do what? To rebuild our, to, to build the, the, the equipment and the conditions for our presence. In this case, we have to occupy, this is why it's totally unethical, but it may happen. We need to occupy an alien, an alien, uh, an alien. And that alien has to develop uh, our uh, the conditions for our presence in, in the other in the other planet and again you see we have uh, the population uh, of course cloned or whatever now this possibility uh, has been discussed and proposed by many science fiction writers in the opposite way uh, the an alien civilization a much advanced in our civilization can do this with us can occupy us and uh, develop their own the condition for their uh, coming here but of course this is all speculation conclusion a country society while taking advantage of the singularities effects uh, will be enabled to to pursue bigger and more ambitious giga projects 
What is a giga project? Exoplanet terraforming is a, is a, is a giga project. And terrestrial ecosystem seeding is another uh, giga project. Artificial planet construction uh, can start in the solar system and can develop them somewhere else. Maybe a very advanced civilization is not based in a single planet, it's based in artificial planets because to recreate the, the, the same condition is very difficult. Planetary system development. Mind uploading entire humanity and distribute them in cloned bodies in exosolar system to accelerate their development. Creating of zillion interstellar economies. Zillion. Association with friendly aliens for joint galaxy development. This is a big uh, question mark. Accelerate development to reach K4 status. Reach human exoevolution step, Homo galacticus. We will not be the same. We will have mind uploading. We can have uh, universal intelligence inside. So we really have a, a lot of uh, and total planet underground terraforming. I mean, we can underground terraform most of the bodies. Now, such type of society, a Catri society with this type of, uh, of possibilities, uh, its members, its goals, its technology will be totally different from any previous planet-based one, from our, from our uh, civilization. New challenges will be faced, new goals will be obtained, generating by itself more singularities than our imagination can foresee at the time of this writing. And don't forget, just to close this, that interstellar planet by itself will generate another singularity. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We have time for one or two quick questions. Yes, sir, here in the front. Um, I'm not sure I'm understanding the uh, mind download and the cloning correctly. I mean, if you sent, <coughs> if you create an infant somewhere, and if you download a mind into that infant, that doesn't seem to be an ethical solution. Uh, if I understand the question is, uh, you need to understand how the mind uploading improvement may, may happen. Okay, if we consider that the mind uploading is a file, it's a file, big as we want, but it's a file, we can add to that file other files. And at the end, you can have a mega file with uh, all our brains here. If each one of us is a, is a file, we can put it together. Not only, we can add uh, AI's intelligence inside. So the, the, the challenge of the AI's to be smarter than human can be uh, overcome by uploading also their mind in our mind uploaded file. And that file can be transferred back to, to a human. We are a medium. It can be a computer, it can be a robot, can be can be a human being, can be some, something else. So this is the, the entire concept. And by the time that we have developed this kind of technology, uh, we will use it. And we will be totally different from what we are today. And we can't foresee it. I mean, I'm just guessing because nobody can really imagine what may happen. Okay, uh, real quick, sir. Why would that be a... Hello? Why would that be ethical to do in humans but not in the aliens? Okay, this is a very good question. And what about if the alien does it to us? What about if the alien does that to us? I mean, I know it's not ethical. I've been... I keep saying that, it's not ethical, but it can be a possibility. You can give the, the alien back its own uh, uh, brain. I mean, we just occupy temporarily uh, an alien body. But this is a possibility. I mean, we are here to speculate. We are not here to, to propose. It's not a proposal, it's a speculation. But uh, if you don't think in a mechanistic way, which means uh, human, starship, uh, travel, and arrival, 
and you think uh, in a more quantist, uh, quantistic way, why do we, do we need a, a starship? Why don't we sell files if we are files? And then we recreate somehow uh, a, a society in another, uh, in another uh, galaxy. Why not? Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate it. Okay, now to give a brief synopsis of today, tonight's uh, events is uh, Rachel Armstrong. Hi, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. So I just want to remind you that at 8 o'clock, um, you need to be back here, please, because we have three very exciting things happen. Um, first, Sarah Jane Pell is going to give a talk about her work for about uh, 25 minutes um, on the kind of um, uh, performance art that she's been doing over the years. And it's accompanied by a video program of extraordinary videos. I've had a look at some of them, and they really are extremely mind-provoking. Um, and um, the other thing is that uh, we'll be announcing the initiation of the Black Sky Thinking Prize. Um, so that won't be awarded until um, 2015, the next Starship Congress, um, but we would like to make you all aware of it and what kinds of ideas it's trying to promote, um, essentially so that we can raise awareness and get people excited about um, building a spaceship. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, can we take uh, 10 minutes and then please be back at um, 4.30 for the uh, General Assembly of the Starship Congress.
let's get started. Please take your seats. Okay, welcome to this evening's General Assembly Starship Congress 2013. It, was with, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Secretary General Anu Bowman. Thank you. Um, has anyone seen Jim Benford? We're, we're one, uh, one person short. <laughs> um, presumably Jim will join us momentarily. Can we go ahead and get somebody to turn the lights up? So this is uh, a little different. We, this is a dialogue and a conversation. We actually need to see each other. You need to go run the other way. So, um, and just like yesterday, it is, it is a conversation that involves everyone. So I'm going to encourage everybody in the back to scooch in because, you know, it's a little hard to have a conversation that with, with everybody spread out so much. So please, please come on in so we can be a little intimate and, and um, have everybody included in the dialogue. So um, for day two of a General Assembly session, uh, let me just remind you, for if there's any new people in the audience that weren't here yesterday, we have, um, we'll have... Jim Benford from Starship Century, Les Johnson from the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, Calvin Long from the Institute for Interstellar Studies, Mark Millis, Pau Zero, Richard Busi for Icarus Interstellar, Armin Papazian, who's also not here, Armin, <laughs> for Star Voyager, I'm sure both of them will join us shortly, and uh, Joe Ritter for uh, Global Starship Alliance. Can we send somebody to go find these guys? No, Armin's gonna sit. Armin is going to sit tonight. He's here. He, he'll, he's, yeah. Can, I'll give it a try. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and we're going to go right to the questions. But before we do that, and since we're waiting, I, um, I have some notes from last night. And so I want to just kind of refresh everybody. It's been a long day of a very good, good discussion and interaction. But just to remind everybody, I, we heard some interesting things last night. We heard, um, with regard to the question on the economy, um, sorry, can't read. Uh, I, I heard things along the lines that space really isn't so costly. Um, I heard that we should do small projects uh, and not try and do larger projects. I heard that we need to actually incentivize the profit motive. Um, somebody said something about really needing to be aggressive. Um, there was a comment about, about uh, dual-use technology as being kind of a motivator. With regard to the question on investing in the future, um, this, the, um, the one, one person commented that the government actually was, was in a good position to do facilitation of activities. Somebody else commented that, you know, there are a lot of other groups beyond just government and private entities, uh, private, private industry, I should say, that really had control over large factors of, of what could be done, and that needed to be taken into account. Um, someone else commented on needing to target or wanting to target philanthropists. Um, someone else commented that um, private entities are probably much better suited to pushing, pushing space interests. Uh, and somebody else said that really there's a lot of money out there. Um, and others commented that really it was an issue of leadership, private, government, you know, where's the leadership and how do we understand that? The thing that actually maybe in retrospect shouldn't have surprised me the most, but actually did, was the comments from everybody on the very last question that we discussed last night, which was the interstellar community and how do we view people coming together. And that was the one actually that had fairly broad consensus across our panel, which was that competition is good, collaboration is good, um, some competition, some collaboration, depending on the project, but no, there were too many different uh, visions and too many different voices, and there really shouldn't be a move to push behind one project only. Um, so there was actually some consensus on that. Um, so we're still missing. Uh, I just have a note that says Armin's not in the area. Anyway. We're still searching, but the search is now traveling by other direction. Okay. <laughs> well, so last I saw him, he was doing interviews in the um, lunchroom. So um, that's Armin's at the end of the table, so we'll, we'll go ahead and start. So tonight we're focusing on um, the, the next 20 to 50 year period, meaning this lifetime. Question one, 
Uh, and I, I'm going to encourage you to just remind everybody that the, all the questions are in the program. So if you look at the uh, at today's pro the program opposite today's schedule, you'll see the questions there. So general topic, human condition. As we focus on the exciting possibilities of colonizing other worlds, we are also aware of the problems that still exist on planet Earth. This includes inequity, poor resource distribution, cultural non-harmonization, disease conflict, managing global environmental change, managing the impact of disruptive technologies, and differences in ethical and moral perspectives. Before we send humans to colonize planets around other stars, should we focus on improving the human condition on Earth first, or should we go as soon as we are technologically ready? Is it possible or desirable to do both, leveraging our advances to the benefit of Earth for the, sorry, for furthering our, for the furthering of our interstellar goals? Um, Jim, please. Well, my answer is, of course, both will occur in parallel, as has already happened in most of human history and already happened in the history of the development of space. I, I take this argument to be, so what I call this the slums of Cordoba or argument. It goes like this. Queen Isabella, King Ferdinand, don't support this C Columbo character wanting to go with his wild schemes to somewhere else in the world that we don't even know exists, when we have slums right here in Cordoba. Well, I was in Cordoba recently, and I looked around, and they still have slums in Cordoba. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have the Western Hemisphere as a major part of human civilization, and we have coffee to drink because it was originated there and a thousand other things. So, in fact, she didn't take that advice, and we shouldn't take it either. Uh, wait until things are perfect on Earth will not, not serve either the interests of those on Earth or the planet itself or the development of space. The reason for this is that the two are synergistic. We don't have, uh, if we denied ourselves uh, satellites, we wouldn't have cell phones. We wouldn't have all, lots and lots of things that are the benefits of having a, even a, a toehold in space it, that we have today. The future of humanity will have a component beyond the Earth for scientific reasons, for economic reasons, and for ecological reasons ultimately. Besides, no one is sufficiently in charge on this planet, in charge of resources, to be able to partition them from a single point of view. So the answer is both will occur. Jim, I think we're in, we're in violent agreement. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, uh, we, we talked about this and we, we came to the unanimous opinion that there will always be income gaps, unequal resource distribution, some form of cultural disharmony, disease conflict and divergent moral and ethical perspectives among humans. I mean, after all, unfortunately, that's part of what makes us human, right, is the disagreements. We've got to learn to get beyond that. If we choose to wait until these are resolved, then we will never reach the stars. To, see must, to say we must wait is the same as to say we will never go. It is also an underlying economic and cultural perspective that we categorically reject. We believe that space development and terrestrial wealth are not an either-or proposition. Sometimes, in fact, most times in human history, one plus one is more than two. Furthermore, material and financial resources expended on activities up there aren't necessarily useful for or don't necessarily take anything away from what goes on down here. This uh, question kind of harkens back to a myth that came up during the uh, space race, which was, in my opinion, our opinion, debunked, and that is that money spent on space is somehow thrown away in space. No one launches currency into space, just rockets and satellites. The wealth stays here. This argument can also be made for labor resources. For example, just because rocket scientists are good at being rocket scientists doesn't necessarily mean that we'd be good at doing anything else if we weren't <laughs> building rockets. So uh, the answer to this question is we, we need to go, we shouldn't wait, and if we choose to wait, we'll never go. Thank you. So once again, I'm going to read from the Institute for Interstellar Studies team statement. So the human species has made tremendous progress with the rise of reason and education leading to a gradual reduction in ignorance. 
The challenge of interstellar flight is an exciting and enriching endeavor which will affect everyone and therefore should involve everyone. The problems of inequality, poor resource distribution and cultural ignorance that still exist in our societies need to be continually addressed, but in parallel with the pursuit of space endeavors and not at the exclusion of it. In particular, the pursuit of space is an inspiring activity which has the potential to lift people up to higher levels of education and knowledge and to create a scientifically literate population. This in itself has the potential to empower people to solve their own problems, including poverty and the lack of opportunity. As we as a species become more knowledgeable about the universe and ourselves, we will mature together and gradually we will begin to look at the Earth and each other from a different perspective. Meanwhile, the act of pursuing space will have a harmonizing influence on people, while also providing opportunities for global collaboration, communication and dialogue. As we proceed, our ambitious stretch goals will lead to new technologies, which can then be applied to Earth One, and thereby, thereby solve many of our existing problems. The choice is between a dynamic civilization, which both improves its conditions at home and expands into space, or a static one, which neither expands nor maintains itself and soon collapses. This is demonstrated by the history of the past half millennium. Sending humans to colonize the stars depends on a dynamic solar system economy, of which Earth is the metropolis. All act industrial activity ultimately depends upon the cost of energy. Interstellar travel, as well as terraforming, demands vastly greater energy than any other known activity. It can only be com com contemplated by an energy-rich society, which will necessarily be more productive compared with our current terrestrial status, and therefore more wealthy. There is a need to open up resources of space to support and enrich humanity. This will take the investment in research and cutting edge technologies that should cut down the cost of accessing space. Excellent examples of this include today, such as SpaceX Falcon 9, Reaction Engine, single stage to orbit Skylon. This will leverage our advances to the benefit of Earth and further our interstellar goals. The resources in space will banish scarcity and create harmony and abundance for mankind. As we begin our journey to space, we need to find consensus and dialogue as a means of solving our problems. Leaders should be held accountable for good leadership and money spent on disharmonizing or destructive activities should be used to find a way in world economies to improve the livelihoods of humankind. There is a saying known as the golden rule which states that space exploration should be conducted in a way so as to reduce, not aggravate, tensions in human society. This would seem to be a good basis upon which to conduct relations with each other as any peacemaking species should. In summary, our answer to the question is that a growing society both explores its frontiers and improves social conditions at home. A stagnant or declining society does neither. Therefore, we must do both together. Thank you. Okay. Just a minute, Mark. Let me encourage everyone to hold your applause to later, just because it, it slows us down that much more, and, and we're really tight for time. I want to make sure we have enough time for lots of discussion. Please, Mark. Okay, all my fellow Earthlings, I'll put this simply. Um, I want you to think of some of the more aggressive people through history and the ones you might know. Would you rather give them frontiers to conquer, or do you want to keep them trapped here on Earth to where we're conquering each other? That's your choice. Number two, and this I want to preface with, a, a lot of things that are talked about here are very, very often advocating for work that we're already doing, you know, self-advocating, which, which is normal. Uh, but I want to preface the, the uh, thing that I'm about to mention next. I don't work on, I think it's a really cool thing, but I don't work on it. So I'm not self-advocating with this idea. Um, but when you really work the challenges of interstellar flight, you have to have uh, completely sustainable closed loop life support, which sounds really cool for spacecraft, but think of what that means on Earth uh, you end hunger, okay? It's that simple. Is that worth doing? Will you do, have we done that on Earth yet? No, because it's so easy to ignore it. If you up the ante of the challenge to interstellar flight, you're forced to do that, and it becomes immediately applicable on Earth. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, detecting a trend in the panel here this afternoon. The universe is probably littered with the one planet graves of cultures which made the sensible economic decision that there's no good reason to go into space. Each discovered, studied, and remembered by the ones who made the irrational decision. Those are the words of Randall Munro, XKCD, some of you may have heard of it. Um, I think it would be a horrendous error, a tremendous mistake if our ancestors um, applied the 
let's not go until philosophy, until we've figured out all our problems. You know, if our ancestors, ranging all the way back from the early uh, tribal expansion, all the way up to the European colonization of the Americas, and as uh, Jim pointed out, had they solved all their issues, uh, and had they waited until the human condition had improved, and the answer is unequivocally uh, no. And I think you know, one of the key issues here is that space exploration and the improvement of the human condition are irrevocably linked. Um, uh, investment in space technology has led to uh, kidney dialysis, for example, global positioning satellites, water purification, miniaturization, which ultimately led to the digital age, and how many tens or hundreds of billions of dollars have been injected into the economy thanks to the, the, the digital age. And there's even a, a, a even more convincing argument that came out of the uh, uh, Midwest uh, Research Institute, or an, an MRI study, uh, which looked at the relationship between R&D expenditures and technology-induced increases um, in the, the gross national product. And, and what they determined was that over an 18-year period, for every dollar that was spent on R&D, led to returns of over $7 uh, in the GNP. And so, I think ultimately that um, investment in interstellar research uh, leads to improvement of conditions here on Earth. The two are, the two are linked. Thank you. I, um, the pr just like a baby just about to be born out of a mother's womb, um, do you think they're ready for life on Earth? They, they have to get ready and it's the right time. The conditions are extremely good inside and it's really warm, but do they want to come out? They are, well, that's life. And as soon as we stick our head out of this molecular sphere <coughs> and have the guts to build the structures around it, maybe railways and maybe sail ships and others and whatever we actually manage to invent, I think the improvement of the human condition on Earth is actually uh, fundamentally a matter of interpretation. Because the reason why we are in this condition in the first place is because of a misinterpretation of where we are. In other words, that we are in a bed of stars and this is really um, a galaxy and it's not some abstract you know, 3D box we're in somewhere. Um, and and we, we, that realization, I believe, is, is where we come to, the, to uniting, and I agree with, with, with my colleagues here, is that the improving the human condition on Earth or anywhere will always be about our imagination and the choices we make, whether on Earth or outside. And that is in itself a challenge that does not in any way um, create conditions on whether going to space has to be conditioned by or, go, or colonizing other planets needs to be conditioned by an improvement here. An improvement here is due any day and every day. Uh, and an improvement there outside is also in the same category. So we, we definitely believe that we should explore and we should definitely, um, you know, fortune favors the bold. Hi. It's good to be back here. I don't know that I have any special insights that any of you in the audience here or people in our virtual audience don't have, but since I was asked, I'll gladly give you my opinion. And the question was, uh, focus on conditions on Earth first or go to the stars or both? And so, well, how long do you want to wait? Um, you know, should we be Luddites and not develop technology because conditions are not perfect? And I think someone said, when is it perfect? Um, and then yesterday I talked about the huge abundance possible uh, with dual-use technology to stimulate an ecosystem of companies for the trillions of dollars that we need. And it's another way to raise funds, Armin. Um, and and because nobody said, oh, yeah, we'll make two trillion and give it to you. Uh, and and so you look at dual-use technologies for starships and, and in all the things we need for starships. And I'll say it again because I said it yesterday. And I think people need to, to know this. These are uh, what we require advances in recycling, in medicine, in materials, in energy production, in energy consumption, in efficiency. All of these things are things that can really improve the quality of life on Earth. 
Uh, we've heard for years, NASA had wonderful press about their uh, spin-offs and dual-use technologies. And, and there's so many intangibles. Most of the people in this room are product of the Apollo era. Uh, the students that I helped last week are getting the benefit of the Apollo era uh, because I was a little kid when it happened. And so there are so many intangibles. That the last thing I'm going to say is this is so akin, it's, it's an odd debate. It, it's so akin to the basic science research funding debate. Should we fund basic science for pure knowledge versus take care of applied problems? And you never know what you're going to come up with. I mean, who knew that uh, when Charles Towns was funded by AFOSR to do a laser that you'd have uh, 100 of them in this room in your laptops for things that you're using. We have no idea what can come from these things. This is a drop in the bucket of a global economy. Uh, we can't afford not to do these things. Uh, again, the question was Earth first or go to the stars or do both. Uh, I think we only go to the stars by doing both, and in doing so, we help people at the same time. Thank you, Joe. So let's um, let's open this up to the audience. Um, and in particular, I want to go ahead and toss the first question out um, to our distinguished colleague from the British and Planetary Society uh, as a courtesy to, if he's got a question or a comment he'd like to make at this point. Jerry? He's always been low. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say on this because I totally agree with all the panel, so it's a little bit different. I actually would just like to add one other comment that I think that if we manage to colonize the solar system and get a solar system economy, then uh, the same thing will apply with uh, when finally mankind, whenever that is, goes into stellar. If the solar system is colonized, uh, eventually the habitats that are built from, you know, uh, throughout the asteroid belt and beyond uh, will become more and more look like the more, more and more like the habitats of uh, classical world ships. They'll become more and more comfortable. Some will fail. Some will be poverty stricken. Some will, you know, the, it will be evolution again. And uh, and um, so I don't think there'll ever be equality. It's, uh, isn't that the human condition? It's always been like that. So uh, I, I'm afraid I have no useful comments to add other than uh, uh, let's just get on with it and forget this one, get the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone else in the audience that would like to comment? The gentleman in the blue shirt there in the front. Over here. Over here, please. Right, right there. Yeah. I don't think it's all that complicated. Uh, we need a better nuclear technology, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities, uh, like the uh, Whitam Larsen nuclear process, the uh, Bessard Polyvuel uh, fusion reactor, or thorium fission that are simply not being pursued. And if we have a better nuclear process, we can uh, greatly reduce poverty and end the man-made global warming. In the same time, do a lot better job of exploring space. Now, on the other hand, we can't ignore the fact that our social institutions have become dysfunctional. Like uh, we had a <coughs> lecture on the banks earlier, and uh, it seems like the middle class is disappearing, disappearing in the United States, we're coming in oligarchy. So I think that uh, we need <coughs> better designed social institutions and better designed energy solutions. Thank you. So let me ask, is there anyone here in the audience that disagrees with the panel or with Jerry or with, with you know the assertion? I think we all, okay, so I'd like to hear from somebody that disagrees. So the other gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> sit down, sit down. <laughs> you know, I think there's pa paybacks are hell, you know that. There's kind of a preaching to the choir element of 
what you've been saying, and I'm part of the choir, so I totally believe what you're saying. But I think what you really need to do to refine your argument and make it effective more generally is to stress your arguments against people who are skeptics. So what I would urge you to do is to, in future Icarus conferences or com similar conferences, uh, specifically invite some skeptics uh, to get some dialogue going because I didn't hear enough disagreement. As one example uh, of what a skeptic might say, um, this technological spin-off argument I think starts to break down as technologies get more and more expensive and more and more exotic. An example is the supersonic transport or the Concorde, which is an attempt to transfer supersonic military technology to civilian uses and turned out to be a failure, not because it wasn't useful, it got you there a lot faster, but because it was so much more expensive than the other alternatives that it turned out just not to be viable. And so I think there's a possibility that the technologies going into interstellar travel are so expensive and so exotic that perhaps they won't make nearly as big an impact on the uh, you know, commercial or general societal benefit on Earth as our ex past experience with space technologies, which have clear benefit with you know, communication satellites, GPS, mining asteroids, and things of that sort. So I think that this community needs to come up with uh, you know, spe more specifics in terms of what kind of spin-offs there might be and more credible examples. Thank you. Mark, I think you want to yeah. comment? Well, I just wanted to, um, um, as far as interstellar spinoffs coming up, I, I, I can't go there yet. But as far as uh, the assertion that um, as technology progresses, it gets more complex and more expensive, that's not necessarily so. I mean, those cases do happen. Uh, the uh, supersonic transports are a good example. Uh, but also there's some very inexpensive uh, technology that's come along uh, to keep aircraft icing uh, to a minimum and um, other things to keep aircraft from crashing that aren't particularly um, complex and more expensive, maybe more refined. So as the technology advances, we're not sure how complex or expensive the exacting solutions will be. Uh, we can't foresee that. Um, they may be quite simple. At this point, we don't know. And if you look at the history of technologies, they do cover a span from the very simple to the very complex to the relatively affordable to the outrageously expensive. And we have no idea how it's going to turn out. Thank you, Mark. Let's um, take a question, and then we'll come back to the panel right here. So I'd like to address this question uh, first to Armin, and then anyone else who might like to comment on it. I remember as a young man getting a, a seminar, my first in retirement investing, and being confronted with the time value of money and compound interest, and being just shocked at how much a dollar or a year delay in investing made in the long term. But I've never seen anyone do that kind of analysis for the time value of innovation or the compounding value of knowledge or, or technical innovation over time. And I can't help but think that if there was some way to confront ourselves as a society and say, this is the potential cost of a year delay in investment of however much, and I don't know what an appropriate investment amount is for a society, although they're good ideas for an individual. But, it, but if you could say, wow, you know, if we had gotten on Moore's Law exponential curve two years earlier, where would we be in terms of, of wealth today? I think that you could, you could structure and have a different conversation in society. So I was curious, ha, is that work done, or how, how might that be pursued? Armin? Well, um, in terms of whether the work, um, I, there's a lot of different ways of looking at, uh, I mean, it's the opportunity cost logic that you're trying to bring up, I believe, if, I, if please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and it may be a good idea to show what the opportunity cost is, but um, in terms of the, when you talked about compound interest and, and, and what money becomes uh, within the um, uh, interest-based model and the banking model that we have and the, the costs and the, and, and, the, and the opportunity cost, in our situation, the opportunity cost is 
to quantify an opportunity cost like the one we are facing today, I mean, let me give you just five or four parallel events that have happened over the last six weeks uh, or a couple of, or two months, let's say. Um, and I did refer to this, but I'm just going to give you a, a simultaneous quant qualitative picture to, to show you that it, it may not necessarily be important to have that quantitative assessment, even though it may be a good exercise. But look at it from this perspective. Over the last six weeks, all the news I showed you earlier on during my talk have happened between July and August 2013. During both months, okay, that's fact one. Houston has sued Barclays. Um, uh, they were uh, found to be um, rigging the rates against retirees, and they've been manipulating the energy market and LIBOR. All of this is during the last two and a half, three months. In paper, on Bloomberg, fact one. Second, during the last three months, we heard effectively that the NASA education and outreach budget is being cut. During the last couple of months, over LinkedIn, everyone was debating whether why are we giving up the moon and should we give up the moon. Am I right? Yes, fact two, simultaneously. Third, during this process, Congress and the politicians are debating how much and where to cut and why, and no one is actually addressing the fact that while all this is happening, the abuse in the market and the injection of new digits and NASA is at the same time being put in the corner and to the point of giving up the moon. How, you, how can you quantify the simple absurdity of the image? How can you, uh, it, it, the, the, the level of common sense required to turn this thing around is so basic that I think it, uh, it's not about quantification. It's, I th it's a lot more about just starting from a definition of context. Where are we? What are we? The moment economics and finance fixes this definitional dislocation they have, that quantification will become part of the new exercise, which is the creations on the tools of prosperity rather than the analysis of the in-depth analysis of uh, how to allocate resources in a shoebox. Thank you, Arma. Um, Jim, just a quick... Yes, I, uh, a direct on. answer to your question is uh, example, uh, clear examples exist of the... Uh, of the failure to adopt technologies early enough. Uh, and those of us who travel around the world a lot have seen a lot of societies that didn't adopt digital technology and computers early enough and fell behind in both economic growth and efficiency. And that's very clear in uh, the second and third world. Uh, and I, as I used to uh, go to, I go to Australia a lot, and it was very clear that Australia was a, was a decade behind a decade ago, and they're almost not behind at all now, and it really had a cost element to it because you have inefficiencies that develop uh, uh, because the, uh, the uh, economies compete with each other. So there are a lot of examples of non-adoption of technology soon enough to take advantage of it. So with that, let's move to question two. General topic, artificial intelligence. It has been predicted that early in the 21st century, technology will continue to, continue to evolve at an increasingly exponential rate, with the possibility of a form of technological singularity being formed. This may enable us to have increased mission capabilities in space and so bring about an interstellar mission earlier than otherwise. The probes we first sent to the stars may be fully artificially, artificial intelligent machines before biological humans have even left the solar system. Based on the assumption that we can create intelligence which could mimic or even surpass human intelligence, should future interstellar missions be undertaken by such artificial intelligence or should interstellar exploration, exploration be a strictly human endeavor? Jim, please. As has been, uh, as it has been so far in, in interplanetary exploration, future interstellar exploration should be done as far as possible by machine intelligence in order to minimize the mass of the vehicle to minimize the complexities of its systems and to minimize the cost of the expedition. Humans should be involved only if we're going to do something so complex that it requires the special abilities of humans, one of which is nonlinear thinking. Also, humans should go when we want to start to establish human presence and the associated ecology in new realms. Of course, we may find a way to send genetic information and have robots raise the children, this is a far off possibility, and as a parent, I have a firm uh, skepticism about the ability to raise children 
by a robotic means because uh, we don't really, I don't really understand how I arrange my own children. Uh, maybe by example or by something I don't ever understand. Um, it has, though, if it could be done, it has the advantage that the support requirements for maintaining genetic information are relatively simple, involving cosmic ray shielding and the maintenance of the appropriate temperature. Yeah, our response to this from the uh, Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop is, also, is, is rather brief. We believe that interstellar exploration will follow essentially the same path that interplanetary exploration is currently taking. Robots first, followed by humans. To assume that some form of artificial intelligence is possible and then place it in an either-or proposition with regard to human exploration, in our opinion, is creating an unnecessary potential area of disagreement. It will be what it will be. The development of technology has enhanced the human experience in two ways. Firstly, it has allowed us to turn certain menial tasks gradually over to our machines, which means that we can spend more time for leisure, learning, or self-improvement. Second, it has led to an enhancement on the performance of our activities way beyond what we could have ever achieved based on our biological abilities alone. There is a clear separation today between human beings and machines, and this is manifested in how we also pursue the exploration of space. Artificial intelligence, robotics, machines, these are all an, an inevitable part of space exploration. Does it mean they get to have all the fun? No. Call it ego, call it pride, or just good old-fashioned human curiosity. But we want to go out there too, regardless of whether it is the most logical thing to do. Perhaps we have to download our consciousness into machines to do it. And again, we have to consider how far we are willing to change our humanity to do so. But humans have to go to the stars, and there's a very good reason why because one day our planet will die. Maybe we'll destroy ourselves, or maybe it will happen in a billion or so years when the sun grows too hot. But when that does happen, it would not just take us. It would take Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Marilyn Monroe, Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein, Mother Teresa, Buddy Holly, Martin Luther King, William Shakespeare, Neil Armstrong, Carl Sagan, and all of us. All of us will have been for nothing unless we go to the stars. But it is impossible for any kind of spaceflight to be a strictly human endeavor, since all spaceflight depends upon computerized systems. Passenger carrying interstellar vehicles would inevitably also carry the latest in information processing systems. We should continue to push our robotic ambassadors out as far as we can send them, but also continue to develop human colonies on other worlds or habitats. The first will be a rapid process, whereas the latter will likely be slow. But at some point in the future, the human capacity to do things and go places in space will be enhanced by our greater convergence with technology. One possibility for the future is that we can create machine intelligence which surpasses human intelligence. In this case, the humans will not be in control. The decision as to whether to include people will rest with the superhuman intelligence. Proponents of machine intelligence gradually fail to recognize that as mechanized information processing becomes more capable, at the same time, it becomes more intimately tied to human activities and the brain-machine interaction becomes ever closer. It is therefore possible that passenger carrying starships will contain both biological intelligence and manufactured intelligence, um, though in what proportions and in what form is unpredictable at present. If we imagine biological humans will also have electronic computers embedded in our brains and bodies, that may give us a close idea as to what we need at the present. From studies of technology today, there is every reason to believe that human beings will continue to seek technological enhancements of our systems and ourselves. Robots first, but eventually humans too, highly augmented by technology for the long-term survival of our species and cultural heritage. Okay, I'm not going to answer the question so much in who gets to go, uh, but in who helps us design the spaceships. Um, when you look at the projections of when that eclipsing is uh, about to occur, it, it, it hovers around 2045, which is very likely to be sooner than we launch any sort of interstellar probe. Um, and recall, too, that humans have a problem when it comes to unlearning things, that no matter how errant they are. Um, whereas artificial intelligence, if they uh, do indeed being smart enough, can go through more iterations of ideas, uh, more rapidly dismissing bad ideas than we as humans when we kind of cling on to them out of that sense of ownership, where it takes us a while, usually the old generation has to die off before the new ideas can come in. Um, so the possibility of accelerating progress for the design of spaceships and solving the problems of closed-loop life support um, 
I look for that for the artificial intelligence to do. Now, whether or not it's going to be a good thing for humanity, um, well, I can't answer that because in order to predict what an entity that might be smarter than me um, will do, I would have to be smarter than that, which, well, you understand how that breaks down. So um, that I can't do. But if we can nudge them to where we want, yeah, have them help us figure out our problems. You know, let's go back a bit. Why um, are we even asking this question? Why are we even suggesting that AI should go first? It was uh, the minimization of mass issue uh, was mentioned. But I think there's something, um, uh, perhaps an even more grim and unspoken interpretation, um, and that's in some sense that AIs are perhaps um, disposable, uh, kind of canaries in a coal mine, um, or something that Kelvin kind of articulated that perhaps they're they're better suited at it. What you know, first off, if we do create um, artificial intelligence, someone should ask them if they want to go. Yeah. <laughs> I think they need to be treated with respect, with morality, and I think there are a lot of ethical um, issues that we need to address before we even can start suggesting sending artificial intelligence. And I also think it would be a mistake to create AI and, and to use them as that um, disposable canary um, in, a, in a coal mine. You know, it's interesting, I um, reached out to some of the Icarus Interstellar team um, to try and get their, you know, their interpretation of this, uh, their responses, and most of the team were broadly um, supportive of sending AI first. Uh, personally, I believe human beings should undertake interstellar mission. I'm a human being. I don't want to send an octopus or some other entity. I want to send what we are. I want to send everything that humanity is to the stars. Um, I want to do a little thought experiment. Forget for a moment that the technology didn't exist 60 years ago, but I want to do this thought ex experiment. Just assume for a moment that AI existed in the 1960s, and I wanna, want you to imagine that the lunar module uh, uh, landing, the eagle uh, landing, um, and an artificial intelligence jumping out and taking the first steps on the moon and saying the words, this is one small step for AI, one giant leap for mankind. If that bothers you, you appreciate my position. Well, that's great. I actually was going to say that the, um, most of what I was going to contribute now was is very much aligned with what Les said and what Richard said. But just a just a quick thought. Um, um, I mean, if we do, I think if, if we have really reached the point of singularity, and 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 if such uh, you know such powers of art surpa human surpassing human intelligence are actually going to be possible. Um, what we will be able to create with that intelligence, assuming that superhuman intelligence is still serving the human, um, then in that situation, what we will be also be able to create is probably a very comfortable trip for all the humans Richard wants to send. So <coughs> if we are going to get to the superhuman intelligence, assuming it is going to be pro-human, they will help us br build that starship to take us. So, uh, but then again, if they're not pro-human, then w it doesn't matter what we think because they're going to be making the choice. So, this is an old question that's been restated. So I'm going to answer it a few different ways. Uh, some electronics are rad hard or G hard. Some biologicals are like radiodurants, uh, bacterium. Humans are not rad hard. Humans are not G hard. So, yes, we will use probes first, simply for the mass reason. But the question is funny in that it assumes that we have any part in that decision. You know, can, can you say Skynet, right? If, if we really are going to make these intelligences that are vastly more powerful than ours, and if you believe in Moore's law, then we may have very little say in it. Uh, that, that, that's, that's part of my thought on it. Um, but this question is really a much older question. This is the old robot versus astronaut question. And I've always been on the fence on that. Uh, I'm a scientist. I've helped build things that fly. I've helped with things that people have worked on in space. Both have value. Clearly, robots are very good uh, data per dollar for certain types of uh, data collection. Human experience has value. This is the, the ultimate expression of human spirit. I think we're biologically programmed to explore. Uh, human exploration in general with astronauts has a flywheel effect. It catches the public imagination. 
how many people go, well, we're going to spend send the space probe, you know, wow, how cool, or we're going to send a human. There's a flywheel effect for funding, even if you are on the robot side of things. So we're really just re-asking this, this old question, robots versus humans, except it's a little different because of the extreme radiation and the extreme distances. Uh, I would suggest that the easiest way to send a life form is probably going to be a DNA assembling machine that's fairly small uh, that you can put on a solar sail or something like that. And so I, I don't think the two options, human or intelligence we create are necessarily the only options. I think it's very possible. I mean, we're on the verge of things now where we can assemble DNA, we have artificial cells, and very likely we will say, great, don't worry about the radiation, don't worry uh, about the long time, here's a little robot, and then we'll assemble the life once we get there. And I, I think that's possible. What do I want to see? I'm, I'm interested in humans going uh, for the reasons of it, it being a fulfillment of our our real exploration spirit. I don't know if you have any children yet, but would you want your, your kid reassembled in Alpha Centauri? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I feel about like that about some of my experiments sometimes. I think I the, I think the, the way the answer, we answer this uh, w uh, is we shouldn't do anything that we wouldn't want our own children uh, executing or undergoing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Rich. Some people don't want to see uh, artificial life forms that are biologicals either. So I guess I really wish I had more time to develop this answer, but you know, if you take any of us and we strip off our clothes and we try to survive in, in a state park anywhere in North America or anywhere in the world, we're not going to survive long. Uh, we are, we are uh, not adapted uh, in, in terms of our evolutionary development physically to surviving anywhere. We're weak and helpless until we're 17 years old, uh, no offense to any uh, precocious 16 and unders that, that might be listening. Uh, our children are absolutely helpless when they're born. Uh, what sets us apart from an evolutionary point of view, from radio durands to, uh, to, to rad hard this or adapted not, not being G hard is our intelligence and our ability to adapt our environment and adapt ourselves to that environment. And, and personally, I think uh, when we're talking about sending people to space, I'm not worried about the engineering challenges of keeping people alive because I think we will adapt uh, using our brains and our intelligence just like we have adapted to everywhere on the planet. And I think we'll be able to do that uh, when we go. So as much as I think it will be some robots and some humans, I, I really don't ascribe to the idea that we don't send humans because we're too wimpy. Um, I think we're too wimpy where we are if we, dis if we disregard our intellect. That's so, so Jerry, I think you wanted to weigh in on this one. We can get him the mic. Yeah, this is. Uh, I, I think I can. First of all, I'd like to mention that I think we. Uh, there's this quick short answer to this: is for interstellar exploration, absolutely necessary. For human colonization, not. Um, obviously, clearly by then uh, artificial intelligence could be at any state on Starship. But what we're talking about is whether these, this intelligence is truly autonomous or not. Um, Daedalus, that's where uh, we come in. I was on the, pa my responsibility was payload and we decided the only way to go was to have what we called wardens. Very strikingly similar, similar to the things in uh, 2001, you know, eventually the, the, the sort of thing, except w they were with humans, but something that you had to go outside like an MMU to service, repair and, and check things out. And of course the conversation went straight through to what happens when they rebel and decide to change the mission, you know, because they they probably form a union and, and everything else. And, and, uh, and, and quite seriously, Alan Bond uh, absolutely believes that we won't colonize anything, it'll be machines. Uh, he's even adapted a computer with a program which he calls Einstein, isn't it? Which is intelligent, and I, I believe that to be true. Getting on to just the other subject, which is, uh, so for, for probes, I think it's, uh, you can't do it any other way. The, the thing has to be autonomous uh, with communications dis distances and everything. Getting on to colonization, nobody here discuss, has yet discussed properly m motives which will decide. Yeah, of course you can put human genes anywhere in the galaxy pretty quickly. You can't put human culture or civilization 
you've got to be able to bring up your own children. Anyway, my scenario would be, and this is now personal rather than Project Idolus, although Bond and Martin went on to show, do world ships, and there's pictures of them outside. Uh, on this type of world ship, which would be like a colony in the solar system, just moving between the stars instead, what we've really got to discuss is how you finance them, what economies, internal economies they have, and that sort of thing. Of course, they'll have artificial intelligence, but there'll be you know, the motivations. I'd just like to say one of the motivations, if they're sent, ever sent by government, would be just in answer to uh, is, is it, uh, Amen's uh, uh, comments. I think it'll be like a pyramid project, you know, to provide law and order, stability, employment, purpose, unism from the sponsoring government. That is if starships are ever sent by another organization rather than self-motivated. If there, there could be an individual motive, which would be tax avoidance, uh, you know, like uh, building libraries, art collections, things like that, uh, you know, philanthropic tax avoidance. So, um, but getting back to artificial intelligence, I think it defeats the whole p object because what do we want? We're only, everybody here has got a psychological moment, uh, motive, and I include myself completely. You don't do space flight unless you've got some psychological need or lack. And we probably all, lacking a proper religion, want personal immortality anyway. So that's what we're thinking about. And uh, people on st uh, starships want to preserve their own, not just their own genes, but their own cultures and their own ideologies. And when you get destroyed, if I hope nobody does, by a suicide bomber, he is acting, or she, is acting from ideological rather than genetic purposes. So these drivers of, of how organizations work and how people, uh, you know, societies develop are in fact inversely, genes are the least important drivers. Uh, its uh, cultures are the next important. I mean, certain people can starve in the midst of plenty because there's not the right type of food around. So, so let me, so let me thank you with that, yeah. and All let's right. um, let's go to um, Cheryl back there. AI technology so well developed that uh, likely there's also there also will have been significant advances in cybernetics. So I'm proposing a third route that we have, uh, you know. Uh, man-machine merger, cybernetics involved in it. Yeah, Calvin, please. So um, I've got it on this table, an iPhone, which I've rudely got switched on, um, but it's technology enhancement, okay? I can calculate stuff and I can run Fortran code on it. I can connect to anyone in the world. We are already embracing technology. So the question of whether I send myself or this to the stars in the future, initially we want to go. <laughs> But the question of what is human beings, what defines us, is going to become very blurred as we move forward because we are embracing technology now, everybody in this room, whether you like it or not. And so the question, I think it's a kind of human-centric defense survival mechanism that, you know, um, I'm not going to send my kids. Um, it's wonderful, okay? Um, but I'm just saying that in the future, the definition of what it means to be human is going to evolve beyond a predictable level. And that, in fact, is Clark's legacy. It hasn't yet. No, it hasn't yet. Ian? Thank you. Um, assuming that, you know, um, I'll get out of the way of this. Assuming AI and uh, humanity stay distinct when we carry out an interstellar mission and we're sending off this, uh, this colony of humans to another star, um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of. Um, uh, the mind in the culture universe written by Ian M. Banks, who sadly recently died. Um, you've, th you've got these spaceships that can think and do everything for themselves, they're artificial intelligence, you've got human crew and they've just got time to do um, other things apart from having to fly the ship. Um, and it, this interesting debate came up uh, in the 100 year starship from last year. Um, I think it was actually in my track. And they were discussing the need to um, well, over a multi-generational ship to another star, uh, you don't want to have too much technology. You don't want to have the artificial intelligence to run everything because these humans are going to get lazy and these um, 
these uh, skills aren't, aren't going to be passed down through the generations, and eventually you're going to have a very dependent um, generation down the line. When we actually get to our destination, they're not going to have a clue what to do because they've just gotten lazy. Um, do you think that a gen multi -genera multi generational starship would need the human element to be designed? So would it need to be human by design to actually make sure humans have a key role in making that ship work rather than relying on artificial intelligence? Rich, you want to take that one? Um, yeah, great to answer. I'm going to be speaking about uh, stuff like that tomorrow. Uh, I think it's related to her, Persephone. Um, I, I don't know that I have a, a good answer to that. I, I don't know what form a starship is going to take and whether it's going to be autonomous uh, systems that are able to fix it along the way or whether it's going to or whether it's going to require human beings. So I don't have a, a good answer to that. Calvin, I think you want to say I've got, got a very short answer, which is it depends when you go. If we were to try and do it this century, then of course humans have to be included on a very fundamental level. If you were to try and do this in a thousand years or ten thousand years, it goes back to my earlier point about how technology and, and humans are going to evolve together and what it means to be human. Because, I mean, look at Rendezvous of Rama with the uh, vessel, you know, Clark's um, wonderful short science fiction story. Um, that, that gives you an example of what possibly we could become one day. Whether we want to is a, is a choice we have to make. But the, the fact that we are going to continue to merge with technology um, addresses that question. So go, my answer is it depends when you launch. Okay, and I wanted to add, too, that, you know, when talking about colony ships, you're thinking about um, generations of having a meaningful life. So what does it take to give those people a meaningful life? And if operating the ship provides that, or even improving the ship over time, um, maybe that can prevent the stupidity and laziness from happening. But then again, when I think about human nature and, <clears throat> say, our present legislative as an example, I'm not sure we're a good example for evolving up. So we're going to be respectful, even if our legislators, um, in our conversation at all times, please. Um, the gentleman in the back of the room that's got his hand up with the white shirt. Artificial intelligence is a... Uh, interesting topic in and of itself and one that an entire conference should probably be go, go ahead and be had on. My question is, we have virtual intelligence as it stands currently. I mean, I, Google in and of itself has become a virtual intelligence machine and powerhouse. Is there any point to even pursue artificial intelligence in space exploration when we need to rely on virtual intelligence anyway? Because artificial intelligence will already be built upon the principles that we've found, the principles that we've defined by physics and quantum physics and biology and science, religion, autonomy, all of that. Virtual intelligence is simply an extension of ourselves. So the question then becomes is, why not just send ourselves as it is, or send virtual intelligence as it is, to simply report back what they find? Let us determine and interpret the information as we understand the physical world, and as we gain more information, we improve virtual intelligence. Because AI, in, by definition, is a machine that has free will. Virtual intelligence is something that we already have. Virtual intelligence is simulated free will. It's simulated so, so I think we got that. I think we got it. Let's, um, let's turn it to the panel. Three word answer. It's all converging. OK. Uh, anyone else on the panel? I have no issue with uh, early stage um, uh, information gatherers going first, but you know the, the, the evocative nature of this question, when you say AI, you know, I imagine something like the Bishop out of the film Aliens, I imagine this replacement of, of humanity with some advanced intelligence. Uh, I don't know if we're still answering the same question we were on. Uh, I think it, that it's we okay. Are, we, we can evolve. I, I think that we're just very advanced mobile biocomputers ourselves, and and so it's just a degree of complexity. And so, uh, will we make others? And and you know, I I know there's somebody in the audience that I had talked to about getting the Google implant for their cell phone, and they just you know are dying to do this because they're always so connected to it. So I don't know what we will become, but I think it's very clear uh, that there's not a going to be a large distinction between different intelligence, just different mechanisms for making it. So back there in the red, please. I, I think you've already touched on this, but how much resistance has there been to this topic? Because just last week I saw a, a whole thing on Fox News just saying it's the worst thing that's ever happened. 
And just in general, is, would you see it as a lightning rod to kind of inhibit um, development of this? Um, can, so we're not understanding the question. Can one more time? Do you think that it, do you think that um, just to, uh, approaching artificial intelligence? Because would it? Um, do you think it basically would be? Um, have you experienced a lot of resistance against it? Because it is basically a controversial topic. Have you had any experience with that? People not wanting to fund it, people not wanting to, resisting it, thinking it's something that it's not. Uh, no, no, that's, you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> I saw that reaction, come on, <laughs> share. Well, okay, I, yeah, I guess in, in terms of whether we should be developing artificial intelligence, I don't know that we'd be able to stop it if it's possible. Uh, personally, I think if I were the one that was pursuing it, I would be putting all sorts of safeguards in it to avoid the Skynet Terminator syndrome. <laughs> um, but, but I think, you know, given human diversity and the research that's occurring all over the world and the capability of people everywhere, I think if it's possible, I don't think we could stop it. So um, I just think if you're going to try to do it, you should be doing it with all eyes open and, and take the proper precautions like any other kind of, of uh, far-reaching research. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to comment. I, I, I want to comment on that and, and, and speak back to, to, to Richard who said that uh, if uh, that we should ask any interstellar AI we have created whether they want to go, I think that the reality is if we ask it and it said it didn't want to go, we change the software. So Joe, Joe, very quickly. I, I, I have a quick comment, uh, and it relates to my Luddite comment before. So how many people in here have read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? Okay, right. So. I think you get my point already. If, if there's something new and different and scary, let's be technophobes about it. Uh, there are always people who are going to say this and do this. And I'm not saying there aren't risks with some technology, but Frankenstein. Okay. So on that note, we need to move on to our last question of the night. So this is extraterrestrial life. It is possible that in our search for other worlds in, in the solar system or on exoplanets around other stars, we may find evidence of a separate biogenesis event. This could be in the form of bacteria or even higher forms of life. Given the scenario that life is undeniably confirmed on a planet, moon, or any other body, what policy should be adopted regarding exploration and potentially inha inha inhibition? In oh, in okay, I'm stumbling over that one. I'm going to skip it. You can read it. Of that body. <laughs> Specifically, should these worlds be left alone out of respect for the indigenous life, or is this simply a case of survival of the fittest? Jim. The answer is uh, we won't leave them alone. Uh, let me give you an example in real time. There is a lake in Antarctica called Vostok, which is about a mile down in the ice. It's from millions, it's been cut off from this ecosystem for millions of years. And the question is, is there an ecosystem, an ancient ecosystem there? Are we leaving it alone? No. <laughs> the, the Russians have penetrated into it, trying to be careful about not interfering with it, trying to be sterile, and they are exploring it right now. I'm a bit behind on the results, but it appears that they are finding there is an ecosystem there. And that's really interesting. Did it, did, were there protesters trying to stop the drill rig? No. Of course, it was in Antarctica. Uh, so, well, so there's an example of how we treated something in real time, but this is not an abstract question then. We would like to explore alien and uh, ecology extensively to understand if there are any interactions leading to incompatibilities. We would need to establish human research stations to do that because it's a complex problem. It seems unlikely that there will be interference between separately evolved ecologies, especially if we minimize the contamination to wear the appropriate suits and things like that. Now, Paul Davies, in the book on sale out here, our book I edited, Starship Century, makes a good case that there probably won't be interactions between ecologies. And he also makes a case that we may have essentially alien, not our ecology, beings living among us now may have separately evolved even on this planet that are not incompatibly like anaerobes and the um, and that uh, we may not interact with ecologies elsewhere it is a complex question I suggest you read his article about it it's the best one I've ever seen um, and an example of that, uh, of the, it's going to come up in the future, is the exploration of Mars. If we find evidence that there's some level of biological activity underneath the Martian surface, 
which is entirely possible. It will require extensive exploration to ferret out just what is there. This will certainly require humans because it's a very complex problem, and separation between a human ecology on the surface and Martian microbes underneath might not be that hard because uh, the surface, after all, is dominated by peroxide chemistry and it's not, not compatible with uh, our ecology. And uh, I mean, think about hydrogen peroxide. The, uh, so uh, in, in fact, the, the, my brother's book, The Martian Race, is based on this, on this premise that the, the two would not interact and that there's Martian, there's Martian life underneath the surface. So I think that the, the uh, answer is going to be we're going to go exploring and we'll try to do our best not to interfere, but we really don't know if there's going to be interference. Okay. Um, at the Tennessee Valley University Teller Workshop, we talked about this and we, we have came up with three general orders, right, because we're science fiction fans, so you have to have general orders. Um, we, we assert the following as guiding moral principles with regard to any sort of first contact whether it is with bacteria or an extraterrestrial civilization. Number one, learn all you can learn before risk, uh, risking any kind of direct interaction. Number two, if it seems to be alive, leave it alone. And number three, avoid bringing samples to the home world because I'm not 100% convinced we want to bank on it being totally incompatible with our ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, and I uh, live near, we live near Lake Gunnersville in Alabama, which had a non-native species called milfoil introduced into it, which is just about clogged up the lake because there are no, no predators there to, to keep it in check. And so when you, when you transport things across boundaries, un unexpected things happen. However, we also believe, and this is the pragmatist, uh, pragmatic side of us coming through, that a vibrant interstellar civilization will be essentially ungovernable and that observing such guidelines will be strictly left up to each and every first contact team to obey or not at their discretion. Uh, when someone is several light years away from home and they encounter something they've never encountered before, they're going to be making the decisions regardless of what the guiding moral principles might be uh, when they left home. We still do not know today whether we are on an isolated event in the universe in which life has evolved only on a single planet called Earth, or whether in fact we are just one of many inhabited planets in a vast cosmos of worlds. Both of these answers are highly humbling for us and both represent an exciting future for our kind. The discovery of many hundreds of exoplanets around other stars in recent years is at least suggestive that life may exist in the cosmos and exists purely as a function of chemistry. We are yet to find evidence to confirm this hypothesis. In the event that we discover evidence of intelligent life on another world, that will be a social, cultural, and technologically influencing offense in human affairs, which will need to be managed with great care and to ensure that our culture and their culture remains intact and not disrupted by this new knowledge. Plurality and cultural diversity is seen by some as a desirable richness of the universe. In the event that we merely discover bacteria or plant life in another world, with no indication of intelligence, then whether we decided to visit, explore, colonize, or indeed terraform that world will be a, dis a discussion specific to each discovery, and one which will have to involve representation from a global community. If we discover life, be it simple microbial life or complex intelligent life, we must treat it responsibly. With microbes, we have greater latitude. Exploration and exploitation of their world may not necessarily damage the microbes themselves if we are careful, but as life becomes more complex, our options will narrow. However, we should study and explore that life in a non-invasive way if possible. It is important that life is given a chance to become what nature has designed for it, and so a form of prime directive from us may be appropriate. It is likely that finding life, even small plant life, will represent ethical challenges for us, and so we need to find ethical ways to interact with it. For example, should we take this new life form and integrate it into our food chain within a new environment? Alternatively, if this plant life is hostile to our biology, should we destroy it? Who speaks for the alien life? It is also worth noting that in the future, many in our species will be space dwellers and not planet dwellers. And they would not necessarily regard an Earth analog planet as a potential habitation. If this is correct, then the planets will be far more valuable as a, valu as a venue for non-invasive scientific observation than as a venue for ob occupation in the terrestrial sense. In which case, there will be no need for us to draw up such a policy and the people who do face this situation will have their own ideas how best to proceed. 
In this case, it is neither a case of moral respect nor of survival of the fittest, but of the fact that we should have evolved a society which does not need to compete with the surface life of terrestrial planets. Since inter interstellar travelers will be accustomed to living in space for long periods, and since worlds occupied by life will be of great scientific, scientific interest, it is most likely that our descendants will choose to observe such worlds non-invasively, the more so the advanced indigenous life found. Um, the way I kind of see how this is going to play out is that the uh, first most likely uh, whatever goes out there, whether it's AI or human or whatever, uh, will probably have reasonable protocols like the kind that uh, Les mentioned, uh, but eventually the rest of humanity with the rest of their behaviors is going to get there too, and it won't matter what the policies are, um, and things will get all mixed up. Uh, the decisions were made on an individual uh, basis by whatever the level of wisdom is for who's ever out there. And um, when we look at the span of, of uh, human motivations and behaviors, there will certainly be uh, uh, some bad events happen uh, and probably uh, unavoidable. Um, but initially, we'll probably um, do better. And I, I kind of like the protocol that uh, Les mentioned. That's kind of cute. We live at the depths of a, a gravitational um, abyss, you know, more, more specifically in the language of physics, the minimum of a gravitational potential. Um, I'm not convinced that when we have the capabilities to build starship, and I imagine a culture, a civilization that has an abundance of wealth and the ability to harness a magnificent amount, a magnificent amount of power in comparison to today. I'm not convinced that we'll want to go from one gravitational abyss to another gravitational abyss. Uh, I'm not convinced that settling on planets um, or even moons is going to be necessary. Um, I read the works of Gerard K. O'Neill, and I find his, his, his vision um, inspiring. Um, I think that ultimately evades uh, the essence of the question. So, you know, going back to the crux of the question, you know, I want to be quite clear. Um, I'm pro-human being. I'm not pro-spider or monkey um, or giraffe. And while I believe that we should propagate out into the universe um, with some very solid overarching principles, I believe that we should propagate with um, benevolence uh, and we should treat other things that we uh, discover out there um, with compassion. Ultimately, I want what's best for humans. I want what, what's best for us. I think if there is a world that we discover that harbors life, um, then we, sh we should colonize it, that we should feel free to land our, our, our people, our men, our women, uh, and do what we do on that world. Um, the question gets a little more sophisticated, a little more involute, um, if that life also happens to be sentient life, something like what we are, something that has the capacity to develop a, a technological civilization, something that looks like it's going somewhere. Uh, if that's the case, um, I actually would oppose uh, interaction, unless the, sum, the survival of humanity was somehow linked immutably um, to that world. So, you know, just to be, to be clear, I'm pro-human um, in all cases, unless that life is, is sentient. Um, well, I, the, the, the starting point, I think, is, is important to, you know, there's, a, there's this linguistic issue here and a historic issue. Because much of what we understand in our in our psyche when we say colonization, in a, in the context of a political map, um, has been so charged with such specific historic events that colonization means a lot of different things around the planet. So uh, we have to be very careful. Second uh, one, and this the other aspect of it is that um, the survival of the fittest, um, you know. We are on a colonized land. We know what happened in this country. Um, are we going to do the same thing? Is that the question underlying the question? We're going to pretty much wipe out the place and take the take take over. Is that is that the underlying fear or concern? I think we have the the solution to this is a lot simpler, and it's in 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 house. Today there are parts of humanity that are incapable of communication with each other to the point of alien civilizations, to the point of literally wiping each other out on this planet, let alone on another planet. So there's a lot of aliens around here as well. Um, you know, I had to register myself as an alien when I arrived to the UK, you know? I, I 
will. I still have to do in a lot of places I go. Uh, anyway, due to my passport, not because of anything else. Don't worry. Uh, anyway, uh, but but anyway, the, the bottom line to, to conclude, I think it's um, a code of ethics and honor, obviously. But I think it comes down to how we're going. Um, do we trust that this is a beautiful universe? It's an incredible cosmos. Do we really believe that this is an, an amazing <coughs> um, landscape? It's a bed of stars for a reason? Or, or, or what do we think we're going out there to find? And are we going to embrace or are we going to utilize? Is it, are we trying to export our scarcity economics? Or are we trying to enjoy an abundant cosmos? I think that's what it comes down to. Well, the, the, well I think, I think I, I, I'm going to answer that. My answer is that, if I have to put it more directly, Jim, uh, is that it's between doubt and fear and love and hope and trust. As long as we have those fundamental expectations and emotions uh, integrated into a harmoniously negotiated planet here, I'm sure we can export that in that very same way. But in a way, wherever we go, we're going to go ourselves. So whatever we are here, we will export wherever we go. So I think I'm trying to preempt that uh, that argument of whatever we w let's take what we let's let's do our best and also take our best. I have a very short answer. So th the question is, leave the world alone or, or survival of the fittest? And, and I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm going to restate the question. The question is, should we have a prime directive? I, I, know, I know people are going to say that. So I'm going to give you my perspective. Uh, I live on an island, and some people there are concerned about invasive species. And then some people there say, well, it was a rock and everything was invasive. Uh, and people go, yeah, so it's no problem. Let's bring in other species, GMOs, whatever. And, and so I say that, in my opinion, if we're enlightened, we'll leave it alone. Uh, I think we'll sample it, maybe, and then leave it alone. That is what I would like to see. Will humans do that? Probably not. Um, so perhaps we need to ask the AIs or install something so they develop morals. And, and I'm going to give you another analogy where I will differ with uh, my learned colleague and, and friend Rich on the sentient uh, divider. Uh, we have a, a mountain that is considered by many, I'm not Buddhist, but we have a mountain uh, on Maui that is considered by many to be a sacred land. And if you walk off of the trails, you destroy uh, bacteria that are very important in the ecosystem and you end up doing harm. And so, uh, it really depends whether we want to be invasive or not. And, and so there are really two questions. What should we do and what do you think we will do? And I think if we're enlightened, we will try to uh, sample without disturbing. Uh, what will we do is, I think like Les said, is, is probably gonna be quite different from that. Okay, let's throw this one out. Right here in the, uh, right, right there. Okay, on, on, on non-intelligent life, I think first what we got to do is study by sampling, and then and then see if it if if it, if it has any properties that are har harmful for humans. Then I think we should preserve it. But I think we could colonize these planets in a way without trampling it if we have that kind of advanced technology. As far as sentient beings, we could use what we call. Uh, a modified prime directive, meaning that we would leave them alone as far as cultural development. Um, okay. um, I actually have two questions, though one is rhetorical. Um, wasn't avoid bringing things back, it's never bring things back until we have another basket. Right now we just have the one basket. So if you want to go, if we do find life any kind elsewhere in the solar system, that would be an excellent reason to learn how to build habitats where it can be analyzed by human beings who never come home. Are you also opposed to keeping the small smallpox vi virus alive? That's different. That's no, it isn't. That's it's a threat, for sure. No, I agree, <laughs> it's a threat. 
Yeah, or are you a favorite? Well, yes or no? Are you a favor of keeping the smallpox alive or not? That's yes. a that's a controversy that's directly parallel to this. Yeah, but smallpox smallpox is from here, so we yeah, understand right, it better. Yeah, right. It's dangerous for sure. Yeah. Suppose suppose something, uh, and you're just saying maybe there's something else that's dangerous. We should uh, we should uh, quarantine it, uh, but not even bring it here. Only because this is the only basket we know about. Yeah. This is our home, so we should go to extraordinary measures to protect it. So, are yes or no? Are you in favor of smallpox being kept alive? So, so on, on, with, a, with that, uh, with that question being You don't want to answer that, do you? Out, let's, um, no, we're, we're out of time, so I think it's it's fine to just leave that there. Um, let me let me thank the audience for your participation. Let me thank the panel for their participation. I'd like to. I'd like to encourage everyone to go ahead and take a look at, at the um, agenda from w tomorrow, tomorrow's detailed agenda. The questions that we'll cover tomorrow in tomorrow's session are, are listed there. Um, and w we're on our dinner break, but then we reconvene at what time? At 8, back here for the evening's festivities.
You are listening to the next.
by far the best introduction I've ever had. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you so much for having me here. This evening um, is not going to be all about me. I do have a collection of works to uh, share with you this evening. Humanity often expresses bafflement or enamor for the universe, sending out messages into the infinite, creating incredible experiments and technology that might unlock its secrets. For as long as we have seen the stars, we have been seeking to understand not just the impossible infinite that surrounds us in space, but also the space that lies within. This is a statement by an Australian artist called Rani Allen, who's developing technologies for signaling the stars with the hope that she might marry the universe. It sounds extraordinary, but to use the words of roboticist and NASA astronaut uh, Dan Barry, in the not too distant future, our def definition of what it is to be human is going to change. Normal will no longer be enough. Robots are being taught to emote, and we are going to start relating to them. Now, Sebastian Thrun, chief of the secret Google X Lab, says within the next five to 20 years, AI abilities are going to be indistinguishable from those of human abilities. Most jobs may no longer exist, but therefore, he adds, there will be an explosion in art and music. Now, I have come to trust and believe in the old adage that art knows no boundaries. Art is dynamic, and it evolves over time. I'm not sure that we're going to see the literal Big Bang that Thurl suggests of new art and new music in our lifetimes because of some kind of radical singularity or departure from all that we know as a species. But I do propose that our appreciation and relationship says with within the next five to 20 years, and deepen AI abilities as we imagine, to be design, and build new worlds and progress further towards carrying life or life-carrying interstellar spaceflight. I say this because I believe that we are already enmeshed with art as a process. These objects and artifacts that inspire us, evoke us and provoke us, remind us of our cultural heartbeat, our curiosity, and that like our tools and our technologies, it is becoming increasingly difficult to separate the art from the artist. So much so that you might not be fully aware of the evolution. By noticing significant moments and new works of art seeping into every context and cultural fabric of nature, of culture, of politic too, has given me the confidence to recognize that the life of an artist cannot be contained. Rather, it can be like liquid, fluid, powerful, and hydrating. So why not imagine artists working in every corner of the globe and indeed every corner of the galaxy and beyond? Artists willingly or unwillingly sometimes experiment and this is a dynamic process. It creates movement, change, chance and the challenge to the status quo. In a public announcement earlier this week, Cameron Sinclair of the Sea Technology Group described his first reaction to hearing Elon Musk speaking at Capitol Hill and his plans for the super fast travel. So impressed, Sinclair remarked that we could all take a leaf out of Musk's book. We could all start with these bold proposals for the future and work towards them. We know it works, he said. Kennedy announced that we would go to the moon. It not because it was easy, but because it was hard. And the US was led into forward thinking action and they succeeded to reach this goal. They didn't have a plan, they made the plan happen. So too Musk and those like him in history before us are leading with what is potentially an impossible vision. He has proposed something bold, ambitious, and seemingly science fiction our for our future. 
Yet, much like the Ikarari in this room, with visions for a starship that will carry our dreams beyond the world which we know, he is putting it out there and he's getting on with making it happen. For the general public, this, if it's not magic, it's artistry. And indeed, Musk shows many traits of the artist, the poet and the builder. He imagines and creates a blueprint and then he develops the pathways and the technologies for the development of the mission architecture to enable this vision to be realized. Admittedly, his working space is a little bit better resourced than most of the people that I know with studios at home. But the tools and processes are just as creative, just as rigorous and as risky. So let us remember that it doesn't take many people or many resources to make a significant impact. Think of that nameless guy in the Tiananmen Square. Think of Mother Teresa of Calcutta or even Julian Assange. What is important is the idea and the vision that is placed before us, where humanity stands up. Now people with vision and people who are bold enough to follow and create those visions start with experimentation. This experimentation as a process unlocks possibility. It is a live testing process and it is vital for growth. It is vital for the growth of humanity and vital for interstellar spaceflight. It is my great pleasure this evening to introduce you to a range of artists who propose equally poetic and powerful visions for their idea of a, a conceivable future. Combining science, engineering, and creativity, they explore the zone between fact and fiction, between fantasy and technology, between your desires and your fears, your visions and predictions. These artists uniquely create new worlds, test new ideas, and propose ways of celebrating and exploring life. This evening I will be presenting the Moon Goose Project by Agnes Meyer Branders of Germany, the Moon Arts Project with Larry Burgess and collaborators at Carnegie Mellon University, the X Prize and Associate Industries. Uh, space from the European Space Agency topical team for art and science, including artists Bradley Pitts from the United States, Angelo Vermilion from Belgium, Ayako Yono from Japan, Kirsten Johansen from Germany, myself, um, Dr. Rachel Armstrong from the UK, and one or two surprises. So without further ado, um, there will be a little bit of a changeover between the films, but I will commence with uh, a beautiful vision for future start. The Man in the Moon, written by English Bishop Francis Godwin in 1602, describes the journey of Domingo Gonzalez, who flies to the moon in a chariot towed by moon geese. Moon geese are migration birds that annually travel between Earth and moon. What happened to the moon geese in the 21st century? Does this very special species still exist? And if so, do they still know about their migration pattern or have they been stranded? The Mungus colony is dedicated to the raising of a group of young Mungis in order to prepare them for the natural annual migration flights between Earth and Moon. To effectively do so, the geese need to be imprinted. Imprinting describes a psychological and behavioral process that happens through direct contact in the first phase of a young animal's life. Imprinted animals accept the imprinters as their parents. 
Successful imprinters are not only able to teach the goslings where to sleep and to walk, what to eat, but also to fly, where to fly and how to get there. The V. After nine months of strenuous but successful training, we are back to the MGC home base, ready to start the next stage of the experiment. Alexander Smolievsky became the first people, the first men, to walk on the Martian surface. And even though it is a simulation, this is quite an important experiment for space travel. And an analog is a location that simulates extraterrestrial conditions on Earth for training and test purposes. It builds the first essential step to test, train and prepare birds and other species for the daring psychological and physical conditions of space travel. A lunar habitat and landscape containing the experiment is installed and Moongis are now living and working there for the next several months.
It will be a long-term mission. The first unmanned flight to the moon will take place in 2027 and the first manned flight in 2038. You shall see men to fly from place to place in the air. You shall be able, without any moving or traveling of any creature, to send messages in an instant, many miles off, and receive answers again immediately. You shall be able to declare your mind presently unto your friend, being in some private and remote place of a populous city, with a number of such like things, but that which far surpasseth all the rest, you shall have noticed of a new world, of many most rare and incredible secrets of nature that all the philosophers of former ages could never so much as dream of. I think you'll agree it's a stunning piece. <laughs> are driven to thinking what if and into infinity and into eternal kinds of structures. So what happens instantly, when, at least when I look at the sky or when most people do, is I think all our time space frameworks expand and therefore the human imagination expands, taking us into a bigger, deeper set of poetic or artistic ideas. So anytime we cast ourselves upward, we expand ourselves and we bring that expansion back to our life on Earth. The key things about this expedition will be the fact that with 3D HD video coming back, people will be able to experience the lunar frontier and see it with the same clarity as an Apollo astronaut. This is revolutionary. In no previous frontier have people staying at home been able to actually you know, teleport their senses to the, to the frontier and experience it with that fidelity. So to me, the, f the critical move is putting this 3D perception on the moon and suddenly for the first time we're going to see space in three-dimensional terms and that's going to change the whole cognition of space, I think, because our whole brain is keyed to and our whole consciousness is keyed to how we define space and how we see spatially. So as soon as you get a spatialized environment, you're engaging a much bigger pr part of the whole framework of the human mind. He's approaching this with enormous care and uh, conscientiousness and also he's very expansive of course in his thinking about the whole universe and its meaning and how human beings can understand it and grapple with the biggest concepts that we have to deal with, you know, life and death and uh, how we treat each other and um, what things mean. I think that art is a part of life. and. An exploration project shouldn't be any different. Uh, this project, this expedition, will be very significant. Uh, and there needs to be art with it to explore what it means. You know, there's a handful of people in the whole universe that have done work that is um, space-related, or um, how can I put it, S where space or outer space is part and parcel to the artistic expression. Lowry is one of those people and has been for many years. Well, I've done space-related art for about 45 years, and there are many projects. Uh, the most uh, perhaps notorious or famous is, the, is called the Boundless Cubic Lunar Aperture, which was the first non-scientific payload, the first official work of art taken into outer space by NASA in 1989. 
I was told by NASA that that was one of the arguments why they chose the work, because it actually had to go into space to achieve its meaning. The, first of all, the shuttle leaves the Earth much faster than you see on TV. It's just literally like an arrow shooting into outer space. It goes so fast. It ascends so fast. The whole shuttle rides on a bubble of golden light, which does not, can't render in video. So this, there's this uh, shimmering golden ball beneath the shuttle. Well, it doesn't even feel like a machine. It feels like some being, some angelic being, just whoosh, you know, I'm out of here, you know. It's a very mystical thing. And then suddenly these doorways open that, you know, have been thresholds that were really shut to your consciousness and suddenly it opens and you see it. The center of the cube is a little cube which is a vacuum chamber surrounded by holograms of nothing. And that hovers in, or floats, in the outer cube, which is half filled with water, which was the waters gathered all over the world from the big rivers. So the waters contain the every element. So everything from hydrogen to plutonium. So here's a cube that is an everything, nothing, a hypercube, flying free above the world, orbiting 93 times to sort of get everything up and out for a while and then coming back. I think in his very being, his every fiber of his being, he's kind of a peace-loving, loving person. He cares very deeply about people, other people, and their well-being. And almost everything he does is sort of oriented toward expanding that and uh, inviting everyone to uh, participate in that kind of idea. So there's a real reason why we reach out, because as we reach out, we reach in. And I think this push out is going to have big consequences back in terms of how we redefine ourselves on Earth. My hope is that as we do this mission, people will see that they can take part. And they'll see that space exploration is something that they can participate in. And I hope that, that our mission can be another cultural turning point in that we show that it's time for us to rouse ourselves and go back out into the solar system. There were several things about the Moon Arts Project that is, is very distinct. Number one is that any kind of weight, in other words, payload weight, is extremely expensive to send up privately. Uh, so therefore, we were forced immediately into thinking very small, very light, and thinking electromagnetically, so that we're basically broadcasting back and forth between the surface of the Moon and the Earth. Or on the other hand, we could think about things that we would ask the rover to do or the lander to be where we're simply modifying or extending the mission of each in some way with our art's presence. The other thing is that the surface of the moon is extremely enduring. There's no atmosphere. Things will last longer on the surface of the moon than they can on Earth. Just thinking about art in a billion year time frame changes everything we think about art. The structure of the moon arc, or what we call the moon arc reliquary, is to be a gift to the moon that embodies all of life, including death, uh, from the earth to the moon. And so what we're doing with the moon arc is we are sampling all of the world's life, including many, many ashes of the dead, uh, and we're taking them all in an integrated form on the lander to the surface of the moon. So in a way, the moon lander becomes a, a ark, and on the other hand, it becomes a museum in which the ark exists once it lands on the moon. So it's the whole notion of making a true museum, in other words, a place of the muses, you know, all the arts on the moon. For most of us, space travel, outer space is just an idea. It's not something we'll ever really probably have a direct experience of. We can watch it on TV, you know, the launches. We can hear people talk about it. So I think what appeals to me about this is that if I will have some opportunity to feel
feel like I'm there or like I'm influencing it or that I'm having a direct experience that that's pretty amazing and that, and that I think this project offers that possibility for the general public to actually engage that's pretty dramatic space is almost the definition of our future uh, when you see those Apollo shots you think you know that's the future even though it happened 40 years ago uh, it's the great unexplored it's the only really great uh, vast expanse that humanity has left before it I think everyone wonders what's out there what could we learn what could we build there uh, and I think humanity needs a frontier and I think our the spirit of the global civilization will be lifted when people recognize hey there is a frontier it, we do have a place to expand and to learn new things part of whatever it is we are we have this big yearning to explore to reach out go around the corners always <laughs> to go row around the corner see what's there you know climb over the mountain see what's there uh, there are a lot of us that are lunatics in the best sense we are loony we love the moon and the moon is very effective on us. A lot of people are very deeply affected by the moon. Uh, the moon lifts the tides every day and lifts the crust of the earth up and down twice a day. And all of that churning and moving is the very basis of life on the planet. So the moon is the great stirrer of life. It is both that which originates, and in most mythologies in the world, it's that which receives life at the end of life. It is the well of souls, and it's also where souls go when they die. It's also probably one of the most profound objects in all of our thinking, mythology, and imagining on the surface of the Earth. entire showcase of uh, work by the European Space Agency topical team for art and science artists, uh, but I've chosen five to show you this evening. Uh, we'll start with Bradley Pitts. My name is Bradley Pitts and I'm an American artist with two degrees in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. For the past nine years, I've used various media and techniques to explore the slippage between personal experience and objective measures. Singular Oscillations attempts to know the variable gravity space of parabolic flight in its own right, rather than use it to understand its effect on other phenomena. To do this, the entire cabin of the Russian parabolic flight aircraft is cleared, except for one subject who is allowed to float and fall freely with their eyes closed, ears blocked, and naked. While singular oscillations takes place within the context of a scientific facility, the expressed aim of the project is to produce immeasurable subjective experience.
exhibited in the gallery was that infinite, invisible experience that he had that was very personal and internal and wasn't shared. Fast-forwarding, <laughs> but Yoko Ono, I mean, sorry, Ayako Ono from Japan. My name is Ayako Ono. I'm Japanese. My interest is to develop works of art which will act as psychological support for long-term space missions and will stimulate space tourism in the future as well. Since 2010, a Japanese metal sculptor, So Negishi and I developed a pair of space musical instruments suitable for weightlessness and was selected by Japanese space agency, JAXA, to represent the theme of cultural and artistic utilization of the International Space Station. The instruments were played by a NASA astronaut on board on February 10th, 
about the work. Uh, we weren't able to publicly um, display the material of the footage from the Japanese Space Agency where this was actually used in space. The artist is not, is not able to install that, but there is certainly more information about this project online. Another artist, Angelo Vermillion. Uh, some of you, well, he, he has just finished a mission as a, um, the crew commander of the na first NASA High Seas uh, uh, analog expedition in Hawaii, uh, which is only finished a day or so ago. He would have prepared something for us, but uh, he's in recuperation mode for the next few days uh, with his crew. Uh, so he spent 121 days. Uh, in uh, an analog situation there, but th this is prior work, and then we'll uh, play a short clip of uh, short greeting from him as well. I'm Angelo Vermeulen, artist, biologist, and space researcher. I'm originally from Belgium, but right now I'm pretty much living all over the world. I'm interested in interfacing social systems, biological systems, and technological systems. Biomod is an art project in which we integrate living biological ecosystems into computer sculptures. The project has been carried out with many different people all over the world. It's precisely the interfacing of biology and technology that led me to collaborating with the MELISA research program of the European Space Agency, and ultimately to create art inspired by space exploration.
Christian My Johansen. name is Kirsten Johansen. I'm a media artist based in Berlin. I would like to introduce you to my artwork, The Nomadic Nature Kit. This work was the practical component of my dissertation in which I looked for the benefits of an artwork implemented into the habitat of the future space farer. So I found out a set of principles that are suitable for the design of an effective artwork in order to create a virtual connection between the space farer and his place of origin. So let's have a look what I found out. The Nomadic Nature Kit is an artwork designed for the future Mars Explorer. I started from the idea that an individual's home is one of the most valuable places in the life of a human. Its unique meaning lays the path for the evaluation and perception of all other places. However, my idea of home is not restricted to one particular or predefined place. My notion is reflected in the creation of parallel localities, each one equipped with the props from a person's individual concept of happiness and safe place. With the help of these significant objects, a home can be re-established and experienced anew in many places. According to my understanding, these objects enable at homeness at any time and any place. In the beginning of my research and work, I was invited to ESTEC as an artist in residence doing research on site. During this time, I conducted several interviews with astronauts, scientists and engineers. I then modified, in collaboration with the Erasmus User Center, my very first draft into a technical concept that turned the artwork into a scientific experiment, suitable for long-term astronauts and their psychological needs. For this purpose, I developed a concept of a portable garden. Its design is made of two hemispheres that are connected to each other. Miniature biotopes are mounted on the bottom surface of each half. The round body is transparent on all sides and can be used by the astronaut while floating in microgravity. Three years later, I presented this early concept of the Nomadic Nature Kit within an art and science exhibition at HEAD in Switzerland. For the earthly presentation, I designed a so-called breadboard model and used it as demonstrator object from which problems could be identified and modification could get started. During the follow-up discussions, I became a context provider who moderated between earthly and non-earthly living conditions. It became obvious that I had researched humans in extreme environments, but now my research turned into a voyage about human existence and what artists could do for the individual in such a setting. My name is Dr. Sarah Jane Pell. I'm a contemporary performance artist, a commercial diver, and a researcher based in Australia. I'm completely fascinated by the techniques of interaction between performance, technology, and science. I bring you hydrophilia. This is one of my favorite works. It unites both the concepts of training, technology, and teamwork required for life in extreme spaces, whether it be underwater where I'm most familiar, or out of space, which is a place I long to be. Um, and in doing so, it starts to talk about some of these 
understandings of techno-cultural shifts that have articulated new interactions from architecture to experience and that therefore exploring new encounters of the contemporary body and that very fragile embodiment of life support system, atmosphere and portable life support that we take with us into new frontiers. In one way it's an analogue, in another way it's kind of a futuristic concept of what it's like to live and breathe in both the aquatic and the world of space. different chain of pace, chain in pace. Are you enjoying it? Is it something a little different? Yeah. Yes?
body technologist, an artist looking at the future of the human body. by our very own Dr. Rachel Armstrong. So I'd like to briefly introduce my work uh, a little slower and to give it some context uh, and to perhaps look at some of the issues, the challenges and possibilities that arrive from this intersection when artists in fact get to play in different territories, when artists intersect with science, with engineering and they let their curiosity drive the types of tools and technologies, the collaborations and uh, the engagements that they, they encounter and that they sometimes drive and create. So when I tell people that I'm an artist, an, ast oh, an aquanaut, I nearly said astronaut, but that was wishful thinking, um, a commercial diver and a researcher, people get a little baffled. And I don't have a snazzy title like Lucy to be able to say I'm a body architect. I haven't quite worked that out, but I can describe the types of things that keep me interested and occupied. And this is a great way of uh, being able to describe that. So yes, I'm an artist and an, a kind of a futurist in the way that I perceive the world to be. I'm interested in human factors, but most particular, particularly I'm interested in human movement and human performance behaviors. So my interest comes from a, an artistic and a choreographic interest. I'm also an ADAS commercial diver, and that, that does mean that I work on both scuba and surface applied diving uh, equipment. I've worked for 10, 12 years as a commercial diver, um, with a good five to six years working full time as a diver, often or usually in remote places in blackwater harbors. So the idea of literally imagining that, that I was in space was in fact my, my way of escaping uh, the rigors of the day-to-day -day work. So yes, I am interested in life in space, and I haven't experienced it so directly yet, but I guess we all exist in space, don't we, in some way. But the type of space that I'm imagining is something else. I'm also interested in human computing interactions, human technology, that biotech fusion between the body and its life support, or the interactions that enable um, a greater or a more interesting quality of life. And most particularly that HCI or human computer interaction and the aquatic environment. It, it is a domain that's uh, particularly researched uh, for offshore oil and gas industries, for space and defense sectors, for maritime and uh, marine sectors, but not so much about uh, human performance and certainly not human creative performance in these environments although I'm not discounting a, an enormously rich and vibrant um, filmic and underwater performance history. So to describe some of the projects that I've been involved in, I haven't yet built a starship, but I have thought about a lifeboat. 
And in 2004, I worked with a group of artists um, and we established what was essentially a mo mobile bio biotech laboratory. And in our lifeboat, we looked at the idea of a lifeboat as a living system, as a living state, and what it might mean to inhabit a small confined lifeboat system. So we invited an audience to come and join us, and we made people make application to the lifeboat state. They uh, filled in forms, gave us their DNA, their personal details, we gave them passports. Uh, we took, uh, we asked them to be involved in uh, tissue engineering uh, experiments that were conducted on board, and we let them know that everything that they did had some kind of ethical consequence. In addition to that, we had modified a psychological profiling questionnaire, and we asked them really provocative questions to get a sense of their their answers or how they would respond in really extreme situations. Um, the outcomes of this profile were linked to a musical score. So they were in fact given a CD of the outcome that they took home with them and a little vial that contained the biological um, metadata that had been created in this kind of DNA soup that we had created from all the participants and they got to wear that with their, their little musical DNA and they were of course given their passports back. We, uh, this p particular performance was um, sailed through the Baltic on the back of the cruise ship liner Opera and also tested in the harbour of uh, Helsinki and Oslo from memory. So there are no distinct um, tools, I guess, and trades. There are no limits to the kind of work that we do, but we are driven by the curiosities and, of, and the integrity of the ideas themselves and that sort of determines where we go. So when I start to engage with audiences or even groups and other artists as well, we have to step into each other's shoes. We have to ask what it is that you do, what do you do in your day-to-day -day life? And it's probably not that dissimilar from what you do, but we have a different language. We have a different lexicon for that. So the other idea is, you know, to use another analogy, is uh, can we create situations where we get inside each other's head just for a bit? If we can understand your motivations and your intentions, then perhaps we can work out the detail. If we're going to collaborate, uh, we can understand the certain terms and phrases. Obviously, where I come from, even the words art has a different meaning. So to understand art and architecture in a space-related context has a very different meaning for me. So I didn't, when people were talking about mission architecture, I had something completely different in mind until I learned the difference. And you learn to slip in and out of these uh, types of l use of language in different contexts, but that takes time, of course. But where did this all begin? It began when I was a little girl imagining, or, or not even imagining, just preparing myself for a future where we would live underwater and of course our beach house would be in space and my grandparents would be joining me and it was just a natural progression of where we were headed. It was, these were the kinds of influences that I had around me indicated that this was the future that was ahead for all of us. And I was interested in what that meant for us as a life form and I started taking a deeper look at not only my own tissue and how we relate to other forms of life, whether they're semi-living, living or partially living or otherwise. And I imagined there was some reflection between that kind of state of being and that kind of science and that kind of manipulation and that kind of curiosity with, our, with a more broader cultural interest. So I, placed, I used performance, I used my own body as a way to critique these kinds of uh, situations or, or to ask questions both of myself and my kind of societal context. So in this particular performance, I myself become the specimen in the Petri dish, the human-sized Petri dish. And don't worry, I do have a, a small snorkel to the surface, but this is in fact uh, a gel medium that sets, and so my body was set in this gel medium, just like a tissue culture. And I worked with a sound artist called Lawrence English, and he was able to put in hydrophones so that we, the audience could hear the breathing and the somatic cadence of the body as it was petrified in that state. I didn't think it through entirely. 
I had medical standby, I can assure you. I did all of those kinds of things right. Uh, there was even a, a sort of a crystallized sachet that got uh, poured in that dissolved the gel somewhat and um, I was able to remove my body. But I didn't think about all of the kind of cavities that the gel went into, like my ear canal. And as you can imagine, it was very, very, very difficult to get out. But I am interested in what it, what it means to inhabit spaces, confined spaces, big spaces, outer spaces, and what, what we design and how we construct them. As you know, I'm, I'm also a commercial diver, and I'm interested in that, that different space that we inhabit when we're at depth, when we're underwater. It is otherworldly. We do behave differently. We have a different sense and different perception of ourselves in relation to the world. In some sense, it's silent. But in other senses, it's really, really noisy. You're really aware of your, your own bubbles, your own breath, your own heartbeat, the gadgets but also the environmental noise. So I started to develop a series of performances. I tried to look at how I could br bring that experience to a land-based audience. Now, very few gallery directors or mu museum directors were interested in huge aquatic installations in their museums not just because of the weight-bearing issue on the floor, but the humidity in the environment was um, not appreciated. So I found a, it's hard to describe, but it was actually a fishing lure demonstration tank. And it was a 17,000 litre tank on the back of a semi truck that would roll up. And it was this long catwalk type facility and it had heating. <laughs> Very important. But interestingly, during these performances, it was uh, there was a certain kind of lim limitation and frustration. I mean, this wasn't the big ocean that I was used to working in. It wasn't, I wasn't able to perform and move in the same kind of way. And the audience treated me like a caged animal. All of these people who would normally come to my performances were tapping on the glass, hoping that I would do a trick, like the fish in their goldfish bowl, and then turning their backs to have a chat with their other friends. I mean, the whole relationship between the performer and the audience and that kind of different staging was really interesting. So I took it to another level and I looked and I confined the space even further and I internalized the experience even further. This, the first incarnation of this work was along a 2.4 meter, uh, kilometer jetty, and I don't really know what that would equate to in miles, um, but it's the largest wooden structure in the southern hemisphere at the Busselton Jetty in, the, in a harbour in, uh, on the south coast of Western Australia. So this particular harbour has a train track that goes along out to a brand new underwater observatory. So my idea was to make the journey in my little bubble to the underwater, to the refreshing underwater uh, observatory at the end. So this was also a performance that I could bring into a gallery situation. It was a performance that enabled me to have that conch-like, a conch shell-like effect and this closed space environment. So I amplified it for an audience. They could hear my breathing, just like a diver would underwater. They could hear the internal space as much as they could see the contortion of the body as it was confined and literally under pressure. This particular work was toured uh, through, through many countries. Um, it became one of my favorite works. Um, and it, was, it set up a really interesting dialogue because the audience didn't quite know whether they were implicated in some way, whether they needed to be, like it kind of called up all these interesting questions about duty of care. What kind of care did they need to have for me as a performer? Obviously in this space, my dome, once I started to respire and breathe and so on, it started to suction cup to the floor. So it was a limited air pocket. And in this limited air pocket, it started to heat up. So after time, my body became saturated and I could slip and slide 
and move around. Even though I look contorted at the beginning, by the end of it, I could slip and slide around. And it gives, obviously, a very womb-like appearance. And I was much freer once I got to that state. But at the same time, I had limited oxygen. So the performance concluded with a prearranged signal with a technician who would dim the lights. I cannot tell you how many times the technician just got carried away and lost with time. Um, there was no incident, but it was a really interesting kind of performance. And people would, I would have an hour and a half, two hours of observation and oxygen on standby and so on at the end of the performance. And it would surprise me, at the, I would come out into a, out of the foyer, into a green room or wherever, and an, the audience would wait for me to see if I was all right. And they had to touch me. It was most peculiar. But I looked at other ways of ooh, being able to translate the experience of of diving in these spaces, what it is like to work with crew members, what it is like to work with uh, different forms of communication systems, uh, strict protocols and so on. So even though I was preparing and inverting the process, filling my helmet with saline solution and moving through the air rather than the other way around, we could move through the operations and the processes of a dive live for an audience and really ex explore what that meant. Now, often adult audiences were quite confronted by some of this. It brought up certain claustrophobic fears. For children, children were great. They would run in the room and run around with the sharks that they could see. I mean, they thought it was marvelous. So I think it, it um, can be confrontational in the way that our body is confronted when we have a limited breathing space. It is confronted when we are reliant on an external air supply. It is confronted when our, our internal experience is separate to that of the relationship that we have with the natural world. Now I've also been developing experimental prototype life support systems and in this case it was a, a rebreather system that was shaped in relation to the biological components of the function of the object. So I had, uh, uh, the heart was actually a little scrubber with a soda sorb taking out all of the carbon dioxide and it turned bright purple eventually when it became saturated. And the bellows, of course, were the lungs and they would respire. The trachea was a little bit too long, to be honest. And my uh, hood became a little compromised. So this system, I, in a sense, I call a scarf rather than any kind of surface applied breathing apparatus. It really was a self-contained above water rebreather failure as far as I was concerned. But it did inspire me to look at different types of systems. So I looked at a dual rebreather with another person. What could we do in a survival situation if we needed to rebreathe with someone else? We do this underwater all the time. Could we do this on land? And what does that say? in broader terms about the politics of sharing air. It's, in a sense, this became an, an environmental work and a political work. So we worked together with um, a, an, another Australian who's actually moved to the US, um, Jason van der Schmidt, and we created a f almost a figure of eight loop here so that we could rebreathe of a single system. So if one person took too much air, there was none for the other. The other had to wait. And now if you also look closely, there's nothing blocking the nasal cavity. And yet the other performer, which is Martin Coots here, who's a, who's a dancer and not a diver, for him he was so in, immersed and engaged with the system that at some times he would panic and when and his lungs were much bigger than mine and when he panicked he would draw in more air and more air and more air and we would have to use signals or uh, use our eyes to kind of calm him down and uh, not once did he think I can actually breathe through my nose at any point but it was an interesting process so we tested that for 12 hours but as a concept, it has some beautiful uh, possibilities for more serious design considerations. 
and we can prove you know, limited but uh, reasonable effectiveness in a lifeboat type situation. Now, how did all of these interactions begin? Well, in, after I finished my PhD uh, exploring human performance behaviors and limits underwater, um, I then went off to the International Space University as, I guess, their first artist, which was rather exciting. I couldn't have thought of a better place to be. So our first project, or my first space project, whoop, oh, dear, dear, dear. I'm hoping the video works. I'll come back to the video because I have a separate file of it. But the first project was um, Lunar Gaia, a closed loop habitat system. So de designing a system for the moon. Exploring all of these types of issues, are obviously on a much larger time scale, much larger um, system requirements than I had been used to. But it was a fabulous experience and it opened my eyes to the possibility and also new networks of people to start collaborating with. This project is available online and I will show you the video in a moment. I was then invited to start to do some projects with the Japanese Space Agency working with um, to, to to contribute to a space art project that was actually curated by Ayako Yono, who you saw earlier. Now this was linked to a Sprite satellite. So the pro project was a micro etching of 20 international artists and a number of um, uh, other invited um, artists from around the world. So there were 40 pieces uh, that were micro etched on this tiny little plaque that was then put at the top of the Sprite satellite antenna, it was, which is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it was launched in 2000, January of 2007. And it's still, and this is a video as well, I haven't embedded them very well, um, and it's still in orbit today. So this ex exhibition not only exists in space, but it also exists online, and people can interact Every time uh, the antenna registers a little sprite sat, uh, a sprite that the satellite um, links back to Earth, explains the data, and also explains a relationship to one of the artists who have been um, contributing to to the artwork in space. So since then, I've been uh, fascinated by you know, how how can I become an artist as astronaut in training? I mean, seriously. So I've played with everything that I could possibly play with. I've looked at virtual reality systems, but that only got me so far. So I've worked with virtual simulation systems and virtual motion systems um, and been able to um, have some great fun in some of the VMS facilities at NASA Ames. And also looked at other types of exponential technologies. I then went off to Singularity University and uh, looked at all types of um, I guess, strategies and possibilities for using exponential technologies in novel and in innovative ways. Asking the questions, well, how can, we, how can we mash up this technology and that technology to create something new? How can we do something different with what's before us, but also think ahead and propose something new? I then began working uh, in 2011 with the European Space Agency to develop an art ESA arts initiative. And we, do, we have continued this work under the ESA uh, topical team for art and science with a number of projects and publications. So as you can see, the notion of the artist is changing somewhat. The evolution of it is I guess, towards the idea of an artist as a researcher, an artist explorer, an artist innovator, an artist inventor, and all sorts of things, by an artist technician. So in my particular case, I don't quite have the perfect word for it yet, but artist explorer, artist researcher seems fine. So in 2006, I was invited to join 
uh, the Aquanaut crew for the Atlantica expeditions, which still hasn't gone ahead. We're still working towards mission success. So this will be a 90-day undersea habitat uh, mission, but also a long duration uh, as a, a study for a longer duration habitat. So these habitats are being built concurrently in Florida at the moment, uh, rather than one after the other. So the systems testing is be occurring um, across the facilities, which we hope will be installed for much longer than uh, the duration of our mission. I've also started playing with um, the idea of, um, I guess, astronaut training underwater and what it is like to use neutral buoyancy facilities um, to prepare uh, graduate students, in this case, uh, this was at the International Space University Southern Hemisphere program, uh, setting up workshops um, and setting up underwater workshops with these live feeds for emission control on the surface. So these types of experiences, while these are not necessarily commercial dive experiences or creative experiences, were really interesting uh, applications of uh, these types of interests. And from that, I'm just leading to a new project at the moment. From all of these experiences, I've started to look at how can I build some tools and technologies to help explain and lead and build some sort of system to enable human performance behaviours underwater um, to be improved, to be more enjoyable, to be more understood, to be more visible. Do we need that? I'm not sure, but I'd really like to see something. We know how to map the body in other spaces, um, but we have limited data on the body underwater. And it's a great analog for other spaces. So I looked at a little kind of play system. The most basic play toy that we have is usually a ball. Can I start with a ball? And what can I, what could I do with a ball? It's like a bubble, it's like an orb, it's like a sphere. It can work in multiple spaces. So I, as a process, just to sh show you insight, you know, what can a ball do? How can it relate? What, what can I design for it? And I looked for a, a pre-existing system that I could hack. I found a Sphero, which is a really cheap little robot which had beautiful capabilities, but it was reliant on a little, um, it was reliant on an iOS or a, a, a kind of a, a smart system to drive these little bro robots. So I had to do a little bit of hacking. But I explored its capabilities and thought, you know, it was enough for prototype demonstration testing. Now these little balls change colour, they vibrate, they move, you can direct their motion, they have two little um, engines, they, can, they have multi-axial uh, motion. The downside is they're reliant on Bluetooth. But we can get accelerometer data and gyroscope data. We could perceivably um, put other things inside them. But how is it going to work in the water? So no one had come up with this system yet. So I thought about my own experience and the types of things that I see underwater in a seal working well. And I came up with a system that was a cross between an, an anemone, I can't even say that, I never have, um, the beautiful little creatures there, and the sea urchin. Um, so I needed something that had a tentacle that was omnidirectional that was ball-like, but it had um, some sort of structure to enable propulsion. I didn't want to go down the track of building kind of a propeller or a propellant of some kind, because then you end up with a really limited flow of direction. And the body doesn't do that. So here is my beautiful little explorer fish. This is a homage to Frank White. Um, these are high density polycarbonate case, as you can see, lithium battery. Um, they're induction charged when they're out of the water. They have their little free style motors and wheels, the LED package and so on, and this beautiful little swimsuit that I created. Now their swimsuits are pretty special. You can't use, <laughs> they need the little kink in them to work. Okay. So if they were straight, if they were longer, if they were shorter, there's lots of testing to, that went on. But this seems to be a perfect kind of medium for at least a, a shallow water or a surface, um, uh, I guess, robot. So then I had to look at the way that they would relate to each other and built a little, um, well, I actually got someone to code 
this for me, Robin Asberg Garin, who l was able to write a little code for me so that we could hack one of them to become a mother fish, to become a parent to the others and to start to become the controller. So that our interactions with this mother fish would then determine an equal response with the others. But we also played around with the idea that the mother fish might be different, that the mother fish might have a different shape if it's going to be a handheld device rather than the ball, perhaps that we would need a bigger surface area, et cetera, et cetera. But we, went, we, went, um, we left that behind for all number of reasons. It just became too cumbersome for one, too buoyant for another. And chose one of the explorer fish themselves to be the parent. And so we ended up with this relationship where the pink um, explorer fish became the parent and the others became the child. So if we moved one little explorer fish here, the others would move in exactly the same way. You put them in an aquatic environment and obviously that motion changes somewhat because there's no, at this stage, there's no intelligence to decide where that zero point of axis is and it's always being affected by, by the water surrounding it. So the first this is the first demonstration of that in a quite a simple setup so that people could see that there was a response and a connectivity between the systems and that people had lots of fun playing with, surprisingly, I mean it's quite a simple interaction, they had a lot of fun playing with this gooey tactile type of object that moved and vibrated and they could see that it was creating this kind of dance for them in front of their eyes. Um, so they almost played it like an instrument and they were thrilled to see that their interaction was causing some kind of response. If they tried to drown it, <laughs> all of the baby fish would just spin hysterically on the spot. If they <laughs> took it out of the water, the, the little... Uh, baby fish would just stop as if mum has gone, there's nothing to do. Um, and when you wake up the sparrow, the sparrow lights and wakes up and takes a little bit of time to wake up. So there's this anthropomorphic kind of relationship with, um, with the player where they had to kind of wake it up to get it to work and then put it in. Oh, it's alive, they thought. So I wasn't, okay, I wasn't so good on the embedding the video. So we needed to take it from, I guess, an unmanned maritime surface system or vehicle and look a little deeper. So I engaged a, a local ballet company to come and play with me in the pool and they were more than happy. And it was, this only happened last week, so it was a load of fun. Um, and we got them to take it down and to work, work with the frustrating limitations of the fact that I haven't yet put a pr pressure release valve in any of these, so that we have some buoyancy issues. But we asked the dancers to play with them, to move with them, and for the other dancers to try and follow the movement that was being uh, dictated, I guess, by the baby fish. So my question to you today, because now you're, now you're all up with it, you're, you know, you're soon to be artists and you're soon to be collaborators on an arts project. How do we move from uh, uh, this kind of unmanned maritime surface vehicle system into something a little deeper, a little bit more progressive, where we can take it down to an ROV, to an AUV, so we can look at deep sea exploration, where we're using the shape and form to mimic the human body. And I'll explain the rationale for that. So as I said, I'm interested in this notion of performing underwater, and I call it aquabatics. But it, my challenge is translating that, translating that not only for the performer, for the diver, or for the audience, but uh, having some visual system of mapping that. Also, I'm interested in supporting commercial diving applications. Uh, commercial divers or divers of any kind are going to be experiencing a, a lot of physiological and even psychological changes as a response to the various pressure changes at depth. Uh, simple things like an arcosis, whether that's oxygen or nitrogen, um, can have a, a great deal of impact on even the ability to be able to perceive um, and to sense and feel at certain depths. So obviously I'm not working in those types of extreme territories but for the very reason that we can't kind of operate there. However, perhaps we could have an envoy that could. So how can we improve performance 
in commercial diving and contemporary arts. How can we articulate and transfer some of this performance language in a new and vital way? We already know that we can map human motion in many ways uh, in altered gravity kind of stressful, exertive situations. But what else can we do with it? So I've started working with an exertion games lab at RMIT University as a visiting fellow. And they have these fantastic X-Zen suits, which are a kind of a wireless human motion capture suit. So we don't need to be networked. We don't need cameras to map our body. We can dance around the space. So I got the dancers in the suit last week, as you would. And um, now my challenge is to waterproof this system or perhaps design an equally uh, effective system at depth. We know how to map a swimmer's body. We use two or three camera, camera axes in a shallow water system. But we don't know how to map. We only know how to track a body at depth. So how could we develop an underwater play suit that understood and communicated something of this movement motion? And would it have any benefits and translation in other areas? Here are some of the dancers doing some of their exercises. Not the best shot, but... Okay. That's so true, so true. Okay. So yes, we have the big tick. We, can, we have this unmanned marine surface vehicle, but how do we take that down to more incremental depths? I, in terms of my licensing, I can work to 30 meters. For the most of the onshore industry, that is our limit for working limit. We can certainly, for recreational purposes, go deeper. But obviously there are other activities, there's other exploration at deeper depths. What could we do? Could we develop artificial intelligence? Could we get them to school together, use swarming and flocking technology underwater to get explorer fish to school? I found some deep sea remote sensing spheres that would be kind of purposefully Okay. Well, they'd be great to hack, I think. <laughs> we'll see if they let me. But they actually have a little bit more um, movement capability. Instead of the two motors, they have three. They have a pr pressure capability. They have um, beautiful um, environmental sensors on the outside, too. So what would it take to develop a, a flocking technology and artificial intelligence for, say, these blue spheres underwater? And could they become a companion to either diving or deep diving? Could we map our body in these spaces in beautiful ways? And could they be our envoys if we can't go any deeper? Could they, in fact, go on our behalf? What would it mean for creative performance for filmmakers? And how could they translate that into other altered gravity environments from zero G to 6G to whatever it needs to be? So we had a look at some of the systems that exist. OK, so the sphere sats, they use boosters, and they have little, little jets that fire off and all those sorts of things. Uh, it's great, but it's not going to work underwater. So what could we do? And if I wanted to take this from blue sky thinking to black sky thinking, that's an enormous leap, and I'm going to need your help. So if even we were to look at to a lunar surface, I mean, there are these types of systems, like the hedgehog, which comes out of a NA I see on Nike, uh, NASA project at the moment. Um, this is for, um, I think it's, I think it's Alpha Centauri. It's, I don't, yes, it was a proposal. But this particular um, hedgehog jumps. It has the capability of not only rolling but jumping to further itself. Perhaps I need a, a, a solar sail. I'm not sure. Perhaps we were talking about propulsion and going really, really fast, and I s asked the question, I mean, do we need to protect the body with water if we're, in fact, going to be propelled further and further into the future? Is something like that a ridiculous or a perhaps a possible strategy for overcoming all of these ex-risk factors that we have been talking about? And perhaps are we going to be um, uploading our minds to these systems and sending them off as our envoys? I'm not sure. But could our exploration fish actually become interstellar explorers? And if so, are we going to have the discussion about beam powered phasing or not? I know there's about six routes that we've talked about over the last few days, and um, there was preference for a mother fish, so I can see that we're on the right track. 
I'm not sure about warp drive, I need further advice. But I guess this is a conundrum and it fits here well within this particular warp drive well. But it is a creative possibility. It is a provocation. It is, uh, I guess, what do you say? It's sort of 80% um, fact and 20% fiction. And by fiction, I mean that it's um, you know, a possibility. I have a curiosity for this. Could, we, could I take it further? Could we take it further? And what are the potential outcomes? This is how I appro approach these type of questions. And this is how I start to create an investigation and see where it goes. Thank you so much. You. I'm that bit shorter than you. Sorry. Okay. So, provocative, distressing, frivolous, disturbing, intense, playful, charming, memorable. These works and videos by Sarah Jane and other artists dealing with the human aspects of advanced technologies and life in extreme habitats help us experience extreme terrains by proxy through the eyes of the artist and bodies. For why would we risk anything at all without connecting with emotion or meaning? I hope you've enjoyed this evening's program and would like you to help me thank Sarah Jane Pell for an absolutely spellbinding program and taking us on a magical journey that we may take long uh, with us um, way after we have left this room. And I think as well, after we've thanked her, that there'll be room for a few questions. Thank you. I'm sorry, Jane. So are there any questions from the floor? There's one there straight, straight ahead. Are there, is there a microphone at all that we could? Uh... Okay, I, I don't know. We've yeah. got one. Yeah, that's on. We're just waiting for the microphone. Okay. But please, can you go there? I can talk to this lady. <laughs> yeah. Are we good? Do we have a microphone? Or? Yeah, all right. Okay, sweet. Well, it was very, very interesting. The only one thing I would like to ask you. Yeah. Are you aware that geese are the most exploited animals by men? Okay. Are you aware of that? No, I'm Because not. They are force fed with certain equipment to enlarge their liver. And in California, mm. that's not outlawed. Yeah. So that is my concern because what is the fate of this geese in that case, okay, that is not up in my opinion, but, but that was not your opinion, okay? No, I, know, I do know that Agnes went through a, um, quite an intense um, ethical clearance for the work and she's very considerate of their, um, the quality of life and I know a lot of the components of the work are not public and there is no interaction with them that they do have their own privacy, they are, do have all of the, the needs that they would, uh, would, would you would normally expect for them. So they're certainly not um, battery operated, if, if that's the right term. But I understand your concern, yes. And it raises some really interesting questions. Yes. Look, in broad terms, yes. But uh, I, I also understand that these, it raises really interesting ethical questions. For us, we use animals in uh, science. We use animals um, as our envoys um, for learning, and um, it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you for your observation. Are there other questions? There's, there's one at the front here. Okay, so uh, something that has uh, intrigued me about this is, um, is uh, especially when you show the, the, uh, the body suite that allows you to interact your movement 
and to a computer interface. So, is is there a way? And uh, and I understand this has uh, a lot of ethical implications. Uh, but is there a way we can use that kind of uh, of suite to interact to get additional feedback from animal intelligent mammals like the dolphins for, for instance for communication Sh sure yes they, there are those types of sensors but uh, obviously they don't need a swimsuit uh, they would be placed directly on the animal or mm, in oh. the space is that what you mean no okay so the idea is that um, uh, how can I put this? So, um, if, if if imagine you put a, a menu of options uh, or, or an application, imagine you want uh, an app for an app for a dolphin. You you cannot give him an iPad because the nose is not going to be optimal for 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 a, for a surface. So you need something that makes up for the for the touch. Uh, tactile t surface, mm -hmm. so you need wha how how could be a possible replacement for that interface. Now now that you you have a lot of uh, connection with the with the with the water and the the sea, maybe you can offer some insight on on that. A little, I guess my my focus has been on this the kind of human interaction um, and. I know certainly that throughout my own research, I didn't involve marine life, and I didn't perform with marine life, and I never stepped into a, an aquarium with other marine life. Um, I guess for some of the reasons that were mentioned before. But, so it has been very much about um, recognizing that there is a gap in the understanding of human movement. And I think there's great fascination. I mean, who doesn't love a dolphin? I mean, there, there are beautiful studies about the motion of people, uh, creatures that naturally inhabit these spaces and we learn so much from them. Uh, but my focus in my, my research has been on the, the human response and how we adapt to these kind of, um, the neutral buoyancy um, to just pressure and depth change and how, how we relate and how I imagine um, that some of that learning can translate as we as a species move into more increasingly um, altered gravity conditions. They are. So I haven't exactly answered your question, but it's not my field of expertise. Um, but it's a lovely, yeah, it's a lovely possibility. There's a question um, a few rows back there. Yeah, uh, well first I'd just like to say I really enjoyed the evening and, and thank you for that. Um, so, you know, it wasn't until the last Apollo mission that a geologist went and seven of the eight astronauts for NASA this year were in the military. Uh, but you mentioned as an artist your desire to go to space and there have been some teachers but there hasn't been a journalist in space, there hasn't been an artist in the space. Well, you know, I wonder, maybe since you work for ESA and, and have maybe a window into, you know, some of this, I is there, or, or when will we get to a point uh, when it's not just the pilots and the PhDs, but it's um, society going to space? I don't know. I think a l there are a lot of opportunities opened up by the um, private space sector. So, uh, I mean, that, that's a, an enormous opening there and I know because of that there are spin-off applications for um, other spacefaring nations and they are reconsidering and considering um, the kinds of crews that they're going to need for more long duration missions and different type of application in space so I think everything is uh, you know, driven by the kinds of requirements for the work that's being undertaken particularly at the ISS but as more recreational activities occur then um, more you know tourist activities occur then those possibilities will increase exponentially, I guess. Um, but also I should point out that technically I think we have had an artist in space, one or two, and um, I guess Guy Liberté from uh, Cirque du Soleil was a private space um, tourist um, who was able to conduct a global uh, space performance from the International Space University, uh, space, 
the station with the support of Cirque du Soleil and very, uh, very many nations involved in, on, on Earth with this, it was almost a 12 hour performance um, to raise awareness about the One Drop Foundation. And other astronauts are obviously musicians, they're performing, so I can't claim that, but I still like to go. I'm looking for another couple of questions and then we'll call it an evening. So there's one over here. And I think there's one down the back there when you're done. Okay. Sarah, um, I wanted to thank you and also Icarus International for making this possible. It, it seems to me that if we don't bring our culture with us into space, then the exploration will not only be hollow, it will be pointless and inhuman and will not really represent us. And so I think that moving forward, we should not just be looking for technological advance, but every other advance that represents our civilization and our humanity. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and the question at the back there. Um, sort of as a follow-up to the other two questions that were just asked. Um, I'm kind of curious, with regards to artists in space, um, right now, uh, you showed the, the, the pieces from the Japanese artists that were in sort of a zero gra or microgravity condition. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of curious, um, have there been any other uh, pieces of art that have actually been carried out in space? And, uh, and are there any plans for uh, those kinds of activities to kind of continue? Uh, yes, um, there's probably, I mean, if you look realistically, there's about a 50-year space, his, space art history, certainly um, from the type of work which ranges from, say, artists illustrating space, that artists that have been commissioned to uh, produce works, artists that have produced works for the space environment, for space analog and field work, um, work that has flown, work that uh, becomes part of the experiments or, or uh, testing situations on Earth, and yes, indeed, work that has translated and that goes out and beyond. Um, interestingly, I think um, the Mars Curiosity rover raised a lot of awareness um, for an artwork that was produced when we had um, the, the first song coming back, beaming back to us from art uh, from Mars. Um, it raised, you know, it, it connected with the general public in a way that. Um, NASA hadn't anticipated, and um, it opened up new pathways. So it was only in March of this year that NASA, for the first time, put their their 50-year art collection online as um, an accessible form for people to look at. Um, it also had some spin-off um, with other nations, so the Canadian Space Agency. Um, it, it certainly supported the work that we are trying to implement with the European Space Agency. Um, and these types of activities and this type, um, you know, particularly popular culture um, type of interactions and events or outreach um, are really helpful for raising awareness. But the work has been there. There's a huge um, a community of people working in this area, but um, uh, it's not often a mission priority, it's up to the artist to work tactically in a way to be able to have the same type of access to space assets and the same sort of access to opportunities for um, exploring ideas in a space-related domain. And in fact, Lowry Burg Burgess, who uh, you saw was the, the second artist shown this evening, he, I mean, he was the first artist to have the a non um, scientific payload flown, but he was also one of the members who fought for uh, um, the space art manifesto back in the early nineties and lobbied governments to at least acknowledge um, open access possibilities um, without uh, discrimination um, to uh, to space agencies for access and support, just like everyone else which is sort of one step forward, yes? I know it's been a long day and an exciting day, but I'm just wondering, do you guys have energy for one last short uplifting video? <laughs> do you, would you like Sarah Jane to play you one more video? Just Three minutes, uh, three minutes. okay. <laughs> Take it away, SJ.
getting there. She's also a VJ. <laughs> Give it another little while. Yeah, we, we got excited there for a second. <laughs> Is there anything we can do? Okay, sweet, we're off. You know, with the advent of the commercial space revolution, with the fact that human beings are finally going to domesticate space travel, it's worth celebrating for once why we want to explore the heavens to begin with. And Marina Benjamin perhaps has the best line. She says, when we dream of space, we dream of transcendence. We dream of what we might become the exploratory journey, that desire to break through boundaries, to probe the perimeters of possibility, to explore the adjacent possible, that is what it means to be human. We didn't stay in the caves, says Kurzweil. We didn't stay on the planet. With biotechnology, we won't stay with the limitations of biology. In fact, today, by leveraging exponentially emerging technologies, we're going to have computers trillions of times more powerful navigating spaceships that are millions of times cheaper taking us to space. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic is going to take artists into space. What's going to happen when poets and artists look down upon the Earth? What new reflections that will uplift the human spirit, that will thrust human consciousness towards the numinous might transform Fire. When we keep pushing beyond all limits, when we get to Kubrick's Beyond the Infinite, the place where dreams are born through the wormhole, down the rabbit hole, it's glorious. It's what Neil deGrasse Tyson says, doing what's never been done before is intellectually seductive, whether or not we deem it practical. It's what we do. It's what makes us cosmic heroes, cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance a natural order that kills everyone. So let us go forth. Once again, big up for Sarah Jane Pearl. Uh, just a very quick uh, reflection, folks. So we often hear this phrase, this term, the interstellar community, uh, but very often the interstellar community consists of physicists, mathematicians, uh, and engineers. And I think tonight uh, was a wonderful example about how this community um, is enriched when we uh, engage with, with artists. So I want to welcome Dr. Sarah Jane Pell to the interstellar community. So let's thank our speaker again tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning, folks, uh, coffee will be served at 8.30, 8.45. We'll start with a quick kickoff, a description of day three. And then at 9 o'clock in the morning, Dr. Sunny White will be talking about warp field physics and update. Thank you very much. <laughs>